saying? Good morning, everybody. My name is Eric Lemieux. I'm a mining analyst based in Quebec, Canada. I want to help welcome everybody to the Swiss Mining Institute, the final day of our conferences here after a four-day trek that started in Zurich, and now we're finishing in Geneva. I want to thank the Bally's for organizing this um, event. We've had a slew of over, I shouldn't say over, but almost over 36 companies. And we've also had um, six emeritus keynote speakers. And I have the pleasure today to co-chair with my friend Laurent Eustache of CIDEX in Montreal to introduce um, three keynote speakers this morning. Daniel Schreck of Equinox, David Finch from Paris, and not but least, Claude Beget. So Claude will uh, present us a conference that what it, a difference a year makes. I have to do not much introductions because Claude has been a stout supporter of the Swiss Mining Institute and has given, I believe, on a biannual basis, uh, his assessment of the industry, the mineral industry. Um, I always appreciate Claude's insight because if there's one man that does his due diligence very well, it's Claude Beget. And so Claude, the stage is yours. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Swiss Mining Institute. So the topic is very simple. What a difference a year makes. Last year, we had quantitative tightening, higher rates, a strong dollar, and the gold stocks went down 30%. And here we were standing together. It was a bit depressing. <coughs> um, it was a pretty big hit. Because when an index is down 30%, it means some of your stocks in your portfolio can be down 50% or more. And I had a little video with a song, well, I'm so tired, tired of waiting, tired of waiting for gold to shine. And you know markets, it's when, we, when we're tired that uh, things turn. This year we have quantitative easing, lower rates, and gold broke out of this huge basing formation. The longer the base, the more dramatic the rise. <clears throat> this, I think, is historical. We're going much, much higher. Those who were brave enough to buy the dips or to take a position like last year in these gold mines are up more than 40%. So what's next? Markets are never easy. Every time we've had good markets in gold, we had another devastating correction. So I'm going to try and go through a few elements to try and answer this question. Is there a new market leadership in the world? Are the fundamentals still bullish on gold? What about sentiment? Is it time to buy the dips, or is this correction going to go much further? New market leadership. There's a rule in technical analysis. Don't think, look. First of all, Ray Dalio, one of the best and biggest hedge funds in the world, has talked about a paradigm shift. He said in May 2018, if you don't own gold, you know neither history nor economy. That's a good start. So look, let's look at what's happening. Real estate is weakening in most countries. Even in Switzerland, we've had uh, house prices go down in the recent years. There's nothing to gain in bonds. You know all the negative rates hanging around. The 10-year U.S. bond is at around 2% yield, and the Greek bond's about the same. Does that mean that the Greeks are now just as good at this, as the U.S.? Or does that mean that the U.S. is just as good as Greece? 
Since last year, stock markets, much ado for not much. The S&P was up 5.2%, but the broader index, the Russell 2000, is down 7.4%. Netflix is down 19%. The marijuana stocks collapse. Russell flat, marijuana down, gold up. So where do you want to be? In the markets that are doing nothing or in the markets that are more dynamic? Gold is up to all-time highs in some currencies, like the Canadian dollar or the Australian dollar. Be your cell phone okay. Thank you. Gold and other currencies, like the Swiss franc, are near their all-time highs. And those who were brave enough to buy in November 2018 have been nicely rewarded. So what's next? Are the fundamentals still bullish? I think the fundamentals have never been as bullish for gold. The Fed has been tightening for a year and a half, reducing the liquidity by $50 billion a month. These are huge amounts, and that's probably why the stock markets fell in the fourth quarter last year. But since September 9th, everything has changed. The, fa the Fed is back to money printing. In the week ending September 19th, they printed 23 billion. The week after, 58 billion, 83 billion, 17 billion, 03 billion, 23 billion, 32 billion. This is a very, very important change. This will help us, with, this will get the gold price continuing to rise. World, money, world monetary aggregates, M2, have risen 180 times faster than world gold production since the 1900s. If you want to cover the U.S. monetary base, you need $12,600. So gold is not as expensive as, expensive as many think. Debt is piling up everywhere. No ceiling to debt? What does that mean? That means no ceiling to gold. U.S. debt, 106% GDP. China increased its debt by 26% in one year. This means that high real interest rates are today impossible. And as you know, if you have low real interest rates, that's a very big positive for gold. So basically, the world is going the way, in terms of currencies, the way the Assignat did during the French Re Revolution, rather more down than up. Recessions are unavoidable. Today, no economist predicts a recession within the next three years. They are, don't have a very good track record of predicting recessions. Politics are deteriorating everywhere. You have Trump impeachment, you have trade war, social unrest, populism on the rise. What does that mean? This will lead to less fiscal, def less fiscal discipline. The U.S. budget deficit is now nearing $1 trillion. On a very positive note, central banks are still huge gold buyers. Last year, they bought 657 tons, and this year, the World Gold Council estimates they will be buying 700 tons. This is huge because the gold market is 4,345 tons per year. So central banks have been seller for all these years, and they're now in a buying mode. Gold holdings are also going up. They're at all-time highs in the ETFs. Conclusion. Money, pre money printing creates excess liquidity in the financial system. That means that the stock markets can continue to go up, but it's very, very positive for gold. Gold is anti-fragile, as Taleb would say. Gold stocks are cheap, and it's a good diversifier. When we had a big correction in the stock market last year, stock markets were down some 20%, but gold was up 
8.1%, and gold stocks up 13.7%. So people who say that if the stock market goes down, gold stocks necessarily go down because they're stock, this is not always the case. Another great chart here to show that when you have big accident in the stock market, gold is a good hedge. This is a chart of inc incrementum. They always have fantastic research. It's free, it's quality. I encourage you to uh, look at their website regularly. So sentiment. It feels like the real bull market, the wall of worry. Gold is up a lot, but we're not feeling that good. Commodities versus the stock market are all-time low. But gold stocks are cheap, price to cash flow around 10 times. But very often, these stocks can trade at 15 times, 20 times. Enterprise value per ounce of resource in the ground, very, very cheap. Most important for the companies are, which are here uh, is that these smaller gold companies are trading at big discount to larger companies. So th that is where you have the best opportunities for outsized gains. Since 2000, there has been 1,492 mergers and acquisitions. That will continue. A very important element is after having seen costs rise dramatically till 2012, the industry has improved tremendously and costs have stabilized. What does that mean? That means if you buy a gold stock, a producer, and gold goes up, you will have a huge leverage as you should. And usually, as you know, gold stocks go up three times more than gold. And now you have the earnings coming in. With $1,500 gold, gold producers are, re are reporting great earnings. People will have to notice, and not only computers. Smart Money is buying, and they're more vocal. Eric Sprott, Ross Beatty, Ray Dalio, Pierre Lassonde in Denver in the summer pr predicted gold could hit $30,000. But we don't need that, don't worry. So with all, this, all, this, all these charts going up on gold and gold mines, why is there such a lack of interest? Well, you know behavioral analysis. Uh, we are always impressed in market by the most recent experience. And what is our most recent experience? Is that in 2016, after a nice bull run, we had a 41% correction. Last year, 30%. So now we're in a correction. So we're all influenced by what happened here, and we're expecting the worst. On top of that, you, can have, you will have talked in some small caps tax loss selling. So the question I, as a per private investor, is asking myself, and I'm, I suppose you're doing the same, is has this current correction run its course? Well, I've looked at the history of the corrections during the 2009-2000 bull market. We've had five corrections. On average, they lasted six to eight weeks. We're now above two months. On average, gold was down 10% and gold stocks 20%. As we speak today, we're down about 15%. So as you can see, we're sort of nearing the, the average correction in a normal bull phase. Silver has corrected a Fibonacci 50%, so I believe that, I believe and I hope that uh, this bottom will hold, that we've seen the low. Same thing for silver stocks. If you look at the chart of gold, it's a mellow correction. It's a sign of strength. The gold stocks, same thing. We're correcting, so this is a buying opportunity. We are in a bull market, so even if we don't hit 
the bottom of the correction by buying at the low, which we usually don't achieve. It doesn't really matter because we'll be bailed out of our mistakes. So, buy the dips. What do you buy? Well, the foundation, of course, is physical gold and some physical silver. And as you know, silver always goes up more than gold. Gold funds, you have great funds here in Switzerland. Uh, Erich Meyer did a fantastic presentation. He showed in his, uh, in his presentation that his fund was loaded with stocks which were much cheaper than the average. So he will do, I believe, much better than the index. An interesting situation is the Golden Prospect Precious Metal Fund. It's run out of London by CQS. They have a good track record. They're solid analysts. They buy uh, low cash flow single assets. And they're trading at a 28% discount to NAV. Producing company, as we saw, since they are not increasing their cost of production, the leverage will be enormous. And last but not least, of course, more speculative, but that's where the real value is, is the people who have huge resources in the ground and the small caps who are trading at significantly lower valuation than the big caps. Last year, I recommended Equinox Gold because the chairman is Ross Beatty. He's a serial winner. The stock has doubled. It still will go much higher. Same idea. Let Rob McEwen run your portfolio with McEwen Mining. The stock is starting to move, but as you can see, there is a long way up to go. These stocks are the ultimate call options on gold. To buddy, to, today, nobody is interested in them. It might be a bit early to buy them, but they have huge resources. Here you have the number of ounces in million. Seabridge has 63 million ounces of gold. The price of the valuation in the market of these ounces are very, very low. It's difficult to compare one to the other, so you should buy a basket of those you particularly like. Um, Vista Gold will certainly be a mine, Western Copper and Gold also. But in a bull market, people will want the leverage and will go to these stocks. You know I've always liked these silver stocks. Here you have Max Silver presenting, great company. They still have huge exploration upside. Fresnillo, the best producer in the silver space, will bring him into production. Exelon, huge leverage to silver. Fortuna Silver. Pan American Silver, this is a big cap. And there are plenty of reasons for which this stock could go much higher. Today, the quality of the companies here are outstanding. And if you buy the companies you like here, I think you will do really well. Why is that? Because small caps are still very, very undervalued. Today, you're at the beginning of the bull market, so only the better gold companies can travel abroad. Why? Because they have cash and they have a dynamic management. And most importantly, we're at the early phases of the bull market for small caps. Some stocks that are here that I own, Orion, market cap $130 million. They have a major discovery in Finland. And most importantly, Dave Lowton, who is here, is the chairman. The stock is owned by Eric uh, Sprott. It's owned by Ross Beattie. 
If these guys own this stock, we can too. Sun Metal, major discovery. It's 60% uh, copper, 40% gold, so you have to be bullish copper. They have great exploration in British Columbia, in Canada, safe jurisdiction. The stock has been uh, correcting quite a lot. It might be a good entry point. Fiore, market cap $40 million. They have huge production growth coming, huge exploration company, great management. I doubt if this stock doesn't go up some 10 times. So here we are together. 2019 is uh, still a stock picker's paradise. So enjoy your conference, do your due diligence, and buy the dips. Good luck on your investing. Thank you very much. So I have the pleasure, pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Mr. Jean-Marc Lacoste, President and CEO of Marnock Gold. Jean-Marc is a fellow countryman, um, graduate of McGill University in Montreal, uh, worked in the finance industry for National Bank and Merrill Lynch, and since 2004 has gravitated in the mineral industry. And he has assembled with Marnock Gold an inter interesting portfolio of gold projects in Quebec, as an ex-regular, I'm not supposed to add the inferred to the indicated, but uh, in this particular case, I might be selling your point de force. They've got over 4.4 million ounces of gold in the province of Quebec, and Quebec, in theory, is a good jurisdiction. So, Jean-Marc, I'm going to welcome you on the podium. Bon matin. Bon matin. Mon nom est Jean-Marc Lacoste, président de Monarch Gold. I will be doing the presentation in English, of course, and uh, I'll be able, uh, I know you don't do questions, but if you want have questions after, I can do it in a boat language, of course. Monarch Gold, it's fun to be presenting this company right after the speech you got from Claude, because I think that's exactly what we built in the last seven years. We took the opportunity of uh, probably one of the worst bear market in gold to build a tremendous uh, portfolio on one of the best place in Canada for gold, which is the Cadillac Fault. So basically, when you look at Monarch, you ask yourself, why should I invest in Monarch? Well, our goal is to become a hundred to 200,000 ounces a year gold producer. And we have a main focus for that. We have the main asset called Wasamac Gold uh, Project that released a feasibility in December 2018. And next week, we'll be uh, announcing the launch of the permitting process. Wasamac uh, published a 24% uh, IRR feasibility study a year ago. Just to give you an idea of leverage, we're now sitting at $2,000 gold or close to in Canada. And this IRR is now sitting around 33%. The NPV, same thing. It's at 522 out of the gate when the feasibility came out in December last year. We are sitting at $800 million NPV on the project. Just that project alone, $800 million, doesn't you know, barely reflect the current $60 million market cap of the company. Uh, the feasibility of Wasamac will produce 140,000 ounces a year of gold at a low cost of $550 US per ounce underground. And it, all this was based on a $1,300 gold in the U.S. As we know, we're flirting around uh, $1,500 as we speak. We continue adding uh, valuation to the company. So we spend the last seven years building the portfolio, which I'm going to show you in a minute in a map. But it took us seven years to go from nothing to one of the biggest land package on the Cadillac break. And I'll show that in a second. But we did that to continuous valuation creation Acquisition and the laces, which is Fayal Deposit, we acquired that this summer. The main reason is very simple. It's an open pitable 6 gram material, 75,000 ounces, and we got the mill right next to it. 
So why we did that? Because that could easily bring in 50 to 60 million, sorry. Do we have a technical problem? I guess so. <clears throat> Is there a techie in the room? Yeah, there's two. <laughs> so as we wait for the slide to come back, I'll explain because I know my slide by heart. So we bought this pit because this pit itself could generate close to 50 to 60 million dollars of profit in a year and a half. So we already launched a feasibility on that project uh, because it's one of the steps that has to be done uh, in order to advance the project. And we expect to be in uh, full permitting uh, uh, in the spring with uh, permits delivered in 2021. As long as you restart the 15 minutes, we're good. Uh, we have time, so no, no issues. We're, we're <laughs> all right. It's just the connection is. Uh... <clears throat> okay, perfect. That was quick. We also uh, were able to do a share swap in uh, Unigold. It's a project in Dominican Republic, 2 million ounces. There was an opportunity for us to grab, uh, at that time, close to 15%. We were basically getting a stake in a company at $2 per ounce on the ground. Um, we are drilling on different properties, the McKenzie. We sold some uh, royalties that we had on other properties. We were able to create a lot of value by making strategic transaction and making sure we stay strong uh, with a solid financial position. We have $8.7 million, 8 .7 million in the bank, basically... Uh, we have cash, short-term investment, including the position in Unigold. We have two working mills, six advanced projects. Our major partners are Alamos Gold, Rob McEwen, Ecla Mining, Agnico, Greg Shemendi, past chairman of Richemont, which was close to the story from the beginning. So we offer an attractive valuation of $16 per ounce on the ground. And this is Canadian dollar. And earlier when Mr. Beget was talking about buying gold or buying good valuation, when he talks about the small cap, what I like to think is you could buy gold at $2,000. You could buy, uh, you know, different mechanism. But when the market's going to go, you want to go and buy it cheap because this is where all the leverage is. So we're trading at a very low discount uh, to some of our peers, probably similar to some of the names he showed in the slide earlier. Wish I would have seen my name there, but that's okay. <laughs> so the market cap of the company closing in to $60 million. And this is my favorite one. I could spend an hour on this slide, which is not much, but it's a beautiful map of the Cadillac break in Quebec. You go from the right Valdor city right there by uh, Louvico, all the way to the left to Winohanda. And basically this is a map of one of the most prolific Canadian place to produce gold in the last century. That, that uh, Cadillac fall produced 125 million ounces of gold. So in the U.S., we have a say about real estate, location, location, location. Those are the three things you need. We got one of the biggest land package in one of the best place to find gold in Canada. So this portfolio that you see right now, seven years ago, we had none of this. So now we have 300 square kilometers in yellow, and in the middle you got two blue squares. What are those? Those are the two last custom milling mills in the region. We bought those over a period of about three years at garage sales price because some people were moving on and the market was too harsh, and we were able to grab these assets for nothing. Basically combined probably less than $10 million. If you take those mills today and you try to rebuild, repermit, and restructure those mills to be productive, it would take you three to five year minimum, and it would cost you close to $60 million. Guess what? They're fully functional, they're fully permitted, and they're exactly the same price of the market cap of Monarch right now. So basically, if you buy a share of Monarch right now, let's not talk about the ounces, you're just buying the infrastructure for the price where the stock is trading. Now, if you look at ounces, because this is where we're here to talk about, and one last note before I finish on that, one of the mills we finished cleaning last week. What does it mean, clean a mill? You know, the dust, everything that was left for the last 30 years on the mill. 
We've collected. That was the best mining we ever did in the last 90 days on the Camflow mill. We had eight guys with a broom, and we got 2,500 ounces, $5 million worth of gold. So you're talking about those two mills that were, that were paid for for a cheap price. Not only they were cheap. I'm doing something wrong, yeah, obviously. So we got, we got these two mills for, you know, less than $10 million, and we got $5 million out of gold out of it just by cleaning up. Bear with me. Weak spot over here, so okay, it's not your fault, John. You mean like if I touch it, I didn't touch uh, it. I, didn't. I don't know. Maybe it's moving the table or something. But it's, it's uh, as we say, it's uh, <coughs> it's a fib. You can see the duct tape, huh? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, like duct tape to fix things. Yeah. I think that's the issue. Okay, we got it. We got it. Take that Excuse me. What? Okay, so just to end on the map, we talked about the mills that we bought. We talked about the land package. That is probably one of the best location. If you look at the yellow spot that you see on the screen, the ounces underground under these prime real estate uh, properties, we have a total combine of 4.4 million ounces. And I'm going to break it down. It's 3.2 MNI and 1.1 inferred. So total... 4.4 million ounces plus two fully uh, functional and permitted mills. That's why I love that map so much. We could start talking about project individually. I can point the project. Everything is available online at our website. Uh, we have, uh, you know, description of every one of the categories. The 4.4 million ounces we talked about is all 43101. It's all been rubber stamped by third party. Uh, uh, firms so we have some, a portfolio that's really solid but the mother load of all the properties that we have sits on the left uh, of your screen right now and it's called Wasamac Gold it's a 2.6 million ounces gold deposit and it's the only multi-million ounces deposit on the Cadillac break at feasibility stage so a lot of people sometimes talk about properties and exploration, we are at feasibility stage. This is the closest thing you could be right now to production, and that's what you want when the market turns around. So we got 2.6 beautiful ounces ready to be milled at a mill nearby on the main project, Wasamac. Again, what's Wasamac? You could see on the right-hand side, pictures are always good to look at. This is the ore body with the mining plan. You got a 3D uh, generated a mill that sits right there by the Trans Canada Highway, and it's literally 50 meters from the train track. So it's got some of the best infrastructure in the world, so does a lot of projects on the Cadillac Break, but this is why it's so important to be at the right place uh, for this market. High return 24%, as I said, it sits around 32, 33 as we speak. The NPV 522 million, it's more like 800 million. The payback. This mine will operate for 11 years minimum, and the payback is 3.6. Those are all great numbers that people want to hear when they talk about a mega project. Low cost, 550 US, all in sustaining, 630. This is the type of rate you would get on an under, on a open pitable uh, mine. This is an underground, underground, very bulk mining uh, on one of the best spots. The CapEx, 464 million Canadian probably 350 US, we could shave 230 million or 50% of that amount just by putting on a train and bringing it to Newmont next door in Ontario or Glencore or Agnico, Yamana, I Am Gold, Eldorado. Those are all the big names with big mills that will need the feed. So we have one of the best project feasibility stage where we could save 50% of our capex just by putting the ore on a train which literally passes 50 meters from the ramp. This is something that you got to keep in, in the back of your mind. We compare ourselves to the Goldex Agnico Eagle and the Young and Davidson, which concurrently is one of our biggest shareholder, 18%. Monarch Wasamac project has the same stats and sits in a comfortable uh, conservative numbers compared to the two others that are already mining these bulk structure in Quebec and Ontario. Um, 
This is the railway system. You can zoom in when you go online. It basically shows you Quebec and Ontario, the railway system, which concurrently was built because of the gold rush of the early 1900s. So it's very simple to say that the railroad follows the Cadillac break all the way to Ontario. And we know this is something very good for us, especially at the, the rate of 6,000 tons per day that we want to produce. A train can easily take it somewhere else. You wouldn't be able to do the same with trucks that have limited amount of tonnage. This is a longitudinal section of the Wasamac project, give you some ideas of what bulk means. 6.4 grams over 52 meters, 7 grams over 31 meters. Very vast uh, zones of gold. Uh, no offense, you don't need a geologist behind uh, the workings all the time. They can give a vague instruction. The, the system is very big, very wide. So that's what we like about this system. This is the life of mine. It gives you an idea of the 11 years, how uh, you could see uh, how the project evolves. Again, this is all something you could see by yourself online. The valuation at 1500 US, 800 million of value. Uh, NPV, uh, sorry, the IRR around 31%. These are numbers people like to hear. The rest of the asset, and I mentioned at the beginning, you see some picture, top one, Cam Flow Mill, and Beacon Gold Mill, Camp Flow is the one that we were able to recuperate 2,500 ounces of uh, dust. Same thing with the Beacon Gold Mill. Look at those mills. I mean, this infrastructure will be worth so much money when this market turns around because there's no other place on the Cadillac break where you can go and do custom milling the way we do it. Everything else are the big guys, and they're all full. So all these mines that you hear about coming up in EBCB, they will knock at our door, they already do, for bulk sampling and try to find out what they're going to do. So we have five advanced projects other than Wasamac. The Quanar Gold, it's a fully permitted mine, ready to go. We need 30 million, looking for partnership. Fayel, I mentioned the pit. Mackenzie, we're drilling. We'll have results next week, testing high-grade gold below. Swanson, open, build, open pitable resource. And finally, Beaufort, which is something we didn't talk about, which is very important, which is a fully operating mine, ready to go. We could bring an ounce to the mill within weeks. Uh, we put it on care maintenance in June, just before the rally in gold. We had a few repairs and a few things to do, including uh, cleaning up the mill. <clears throat> Quanar uh, Gold, which is a, a secondary project of ours. Have a look, it's online, it's available. Uh, Beaufort Mine, that's the one uh, that's been producing more than 1.2 million ounces over the last 25 years. It's still sitting at 800 meters, which is nothing, nothing in the region. We go down to 3.2 kilometers in ABCB on some of the mines. And finally, but not least, the corporate structure of the company. We got 260 million shares outstanding. We trade at, like I said, $16, $18 per shares uh, per ounces uh, underground. Our biggest shareholder, Alamos Gold, most of the Quebec funds are in, pension fund, government. Uh, they're a big shareholder. We got Agnico, of course, uh, ECLA, and Rob McEwen and Shemendi, who came in together as partners to help Monarch uh, spend its wings. Uh, and uh, the rest are annexes that are available on the presentation. You can grab some at my desk. Again, you can download it on the website. But it gives you a better understanding of where we sit compared to our peers. And like uh, Claude said earlier, I think this is uh, one of the uh, company you want to look for in the coming bull market. Because uh, this is probably one of the one that will be flying uh, way up uh, when the market turns. Thank you so much. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Well, I'm sorry about that. I'm not <laughs> No, no, I, uh, you know, I didn't want to bother you more, and you were on time, no problem. I, I think uh, probably the movement of your arms over here, arm waving your passion, just moved a little bit the connection over here. We'll see. So thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marc. No, I don't want to do that like that. So, après le Québec, 
We're going to go to West Africa for the next presentation, more precisely La Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, where SAMA Resources, symbol SME on a venture. Oh, excuse me. I can talk about BC if you want to. No, it's excuse me. Marc Antoine, I, uh, I don't know what happened there, but. Excuse me. Uh, Marc Antoine Odette is the CEO of SAMA Resources. He's a geologist with over 30 years of experience, uh, particularly with uh, Falcon Bridge and um, Extrata Nickel. He is a nickel specialist. He will be talking about uh, the SAMA Plo nickel copper project. And so, Marc Antoine, merci. merci. And the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. So welcome, and thank you to be here this morning. So we'll take you to West Africa. It's a new play. It's a nickel copper uh, sulfides new discoveries, discoveries that we made in 2010. Uh, it's a new ground. It's uh, in 2010 what we discovered. We thought it was kind of a limited element, but we realized very quickly that we are dealing with a district size area where we have multiple zones of nickel copper sulfides at surface but also at depth and what we are doing presently is to look at the sources of these nickel copper sulfide that we have identified at surface but we are looking for the sur uh, source at depth so i will show that to you in a minute we are here in cote d'ivoire this is the, the project area. Uh, I will show you in a, in, in a slide that we are next to Guinea and Liberia as well. And it's a new, it's a new camp in the coming up. I will pass on this. Just a quick, quick overview on the company, on a f uh, financial point of view. We are, uh, we are fully financed at this moment, and we also have a, a partner that came with us last year. Mr. Robert Fridlin, with his company H Power, I Power uh, uh, Exploration (HPX), and is committed to invest 30 million dollars in the company and in the project. He has uh, uh, invested seven million dollars so far, and is an additional 23 million dollars that will come on a cash call basis for exploring the project and to find these model load of uh, massive sulfide material that we, we all believe is in the project. So Eric, if, you, if I may ask you, sure. could you please show the audience here these samples that we have? And you will see these samples is massive sulfide material that we have intersected near surface and also semi-massive material that we have uh, discovered lately, early this year, at the zone called Yeple. So the massive sulfide that you see there, this is 4% nickel, 4% copper, 3 to 4 grams of palladium, and it's got also rhodium, platinum, gold, and silver in this type of material. And this is exactly what we are looking for. We have these intersect near surface, but we believe that the, uh, there is accumulation of this type of material at depth, like any of the big camp of nickel, uh, nickel, nickel mineralization around the world. That's how it works. We have vein and stringers, and you do have massive sulfide accumulation at depth. So in the next four or five years, we will have access to almost $40 million uh, uh, as a potential financial uh, to the company without having to issue one additional shares. And how we can do that is the $23 million coming from HPX here. Plus, we also have a holding in SRG mining that currently sits about $15 million more or less that we have access at some point. So we are quite uh, financially sound, and we will proceed with all our exploration. We have a very good board management. Uh, many of you know Mr. 
Benoit Lassalle is with us, is our chairman of Samar, uh, Samar Resources. He built four gold mines in West Africa. And we, as you can see, we have very, very good uh, uh, people with us with great experience worldwide for building this project. Again, we are in West Africa here. This is our land package, 1,000 square kilometers of land package next to the border with Guinea, and this is Liberia. Uh, HPX just lately acquired the, the property here called Monimba. It's the highest uh, iron ore deposit in the world. And so we are uh, all in this, this zone, and, and basically we have a very large holding uh, ground on the, pro uh, on the area. This is the location of the first discovery in 2010. This is the material, the massive sulfide that you have in your hands. And we also have sulfide at surface here. And this Yeplu, 25 kilometers away from Samaplu, is the first occurrence in 2013 of nickel copper sulfides outcropping at surface in West Africa. There's no other uh, uh, evidence of uh, nickel copper sulfides like this and we have a front of almost three kilometers long with uh, outcropping nickel copper sulfides. And I will show you the importance of all of this in a minute. So I have a, a small video here. It's, it lasts about uh, just three minutes. If we, oh, no, it uh, didn't work. Let me try again. Okay, doesn't, ma doesn't matter. We, uh, you can find this video on our website, and it's also on YouTube. And it, it, I will take the summary here of, uh, of what you will see in the video. Our target here is to find a massive sulfide at depth like this example in Norisk in Russia, where near surface you have strings of massive sulfide with disseminated sulfide near surface, and they took about 30 years in the mid-1930s mid uh, before finding the huge model load here. So technically, we're a little bit on the same situation where we are sitting here and we are looking for a similar situation here. This is Eagle, where you have accumulation of massive sulfides in traps and embayment. So all of these sectors around the world have similar characteristic of what we have at Samaplu. And, but the difference, we are the start at Samaplu. It's a new area, and we are sitting at surface, and we're looking at depth. This is uh, the, the model that we want to apply, that we, we have set since 2013, uh, 2010 and 2013. This is the, this is the vent of a large magma system that came from the, the mantle that came up right to surface but stopped about 25 kilometers in the cross and generate a huge magma chamber here assimilating all the country rock and precipitating sulfur like this. Disseminated sulfur with vein and stringers but also accumulation at depth in embayment of massive sulfides. And that's exactly our targets. This is what we are looking at. Currently sitting at Samaplu, we're here from surface to about 150 meters. We have a string years of uh, massive sulfide, exactly the material that you have in your hands. And that's, this is what we are looking at now for the accumulation of massive sulfide. Samaplu, 25 kilometers away, we, just, we intersected at 550 meters at depth the semi-massive material that you have in your hand, and that we intersected that early this year. And this, we, this should lead us to the large accumulation at depth, still to be discovered. So this is the type of material we have. Massive sulfide, as, as you can see here, sharp contact with the country rock. Here we have an intersect near surface of eight meter, meters of a massive sulfide grading 4% nickel and 2.4% copper. So beautiful material, pristine like if it was in place yesterday. But this is two billion years old and is exactly the same age as the Bushveld system in South Africa. 
Again, this is our land package, the 1,000 square kilometers. In 2013, we flew an airborne EM survey that actually gave us an indication of the, the conductivity of the ground in that area. As you can see, we have all these warm color mean that all these zones have potential for nickel copper sulfides. The summer pleur is only this one. This is a small one. This is the, the area we, we, we just, we, we had our first discovery. We worked out uh, resources there, and there's a, an open pit potential resources, and we are working on the, uh, P, uh, the, the PEA, the Preliminary Economic Assessment, and it should be out in the next few weeks, one month. So the conclusion of that. So this is the Samapleu open pit, but all of these other areas have all the same potential as this one. And look at the Yeplu sector here. From the airborne survey, you can see this is a 24 square kilometer area where we have nickel copper sulfide at surface. And this is where at 50, 550 meters at depth around here, we intersected the material that you have in your hand. So there is a large potential here. And this is the area of the vent. Actually, that's where the hot spot is for the magma chambers. And Bunta, it's another interesting zone. We just completed the, the, uh, the geophysical at surface. And this is a zone where we have lenses of massive sulfides as well, at surface, up to 2% nickel. Just a zoom on some targets that we have that we decide to work with uh, Mr. Robert Friedland Technology, the EM technology. EM is electromagnetic geophysical uh, techniques in order to see at depth for these accumulation. The beauty of this instrument is we can see much deeper than any other EM technology that exists currently. Uh, usually, you can see down to 400 meters. With this technology, we are able to see right down past 1,000 meters, and in the best situation, maybe up down to 2 kilometers. So we are using this technology, and we use that technology here at Samapleu. We also use a technology to an area that we call Grata, over a, pr a primitive, uh, very prospective ground here, and we discovered and we have a very good anomaly for follow-up with drilling. And this is the anomaly himself. In 2016, we were drilling the, ano the airborne EM anomaly that gave us a kind of a rounded tunnel like this. So we aim for the middle, but actually the real anomaly based on Mr. Friedland technology that we just completed is actually sitting just below the two holes that we drill. So this is a proposed hole that we're going to do in the next few weeks, a month. And we, we expect to intersect the mineralization over these two, two sectors there. Another zone that we have completed with this technology is at Samapleu. We, 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 we found an, a very good conductor plate here at 700 meters from surface below our open pit potential zone here. So this also would be part of the next phase of drilling. Another zone, very interesting, is Yeplu. I just discussed this zone. This is the 24 square kilometers area. And we did some very interesting, uh, we have very interesting results over there. Very sharp contact here from a previous work, and we need to refine this sector here in order to figure out where exactly is the anomaly. And this is a trend that we can see over several kilometers from a borehole that we drilled there earlier this year. Very strong of all anomaly associated with this trend. So this is, we are doing this as we speak on site currently. That's a, again, it's a Yeplu sector. You can see the, the zone that we have identified from the airborne EM survey. And now we are focusing on these zones in order to figure out what is at depth on that very large uh, piping system. Again, this is uh, one of the, the zones at Yeplu, some of the intersect here, 
Very, very good uh, intersect here, but it's 550 meters from surface. We expect this to be the edge of what we really look for at depth with the massive sulfides. Some of the material here. Uh, so this is the next catalyst for the, for the company. We're going to complete the feasibility, feasibility next year, but now uh, the preliminary economic assessment on Saint-Mapleu open pit. This should be out uh, in the next uh, four or five weeks. And we continue with, uh, with, some, uh, with HPX on the exploration. They are investing $30 million in the project. The drilling program will be to test the Grata, the Saint-Mapleu, the Yepleu, and also the Bunta, and just to, we're very proud of this, we receive in October 26, from the hands of the, Mr. the uh, Prime Minister of Côte d'Ivoire, the award of uh, one of the best managed company in Côte d'Ivoire in, in the area where we are. So we were extremely pleased with this, this uh, award. Again, two ministers came to visit the site. Lenses of massive sulfide near surface. This is 2% nickel here in the Gaboric environment, right at surface. This is Grata. This is the discovery outcrop at Yeplu, where we have 2-3% copper and also nickel. And this zone run for 3 kilometers right at surface. Here are the representative of HPX on site. So this is where we where we are with O project, the next 12 months is basically execution. We have access to the technology, we have access to the drilling, we, have, we are fully founded, and now the next 12 months is to go cover all the zones that uh, I showed on, this, on the presentation with the technology, with the EM uh, Typhoon system, and then to follow up with drilling. So we, we have a good 12 months ahead of us. Thank you very much. Merci Jean-Marc. Marc-Antoine. Marc-Antoine. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. So I have the pleasure now of introducing our second keynote speaker of the day, Mr. David Finch, CEO of Ixios Asset Management. David is head of portfolio management and has a long and recognized track record. I'm pleased to have him as my keynote speaker, so I'll keep it short. Cheers. 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 Thanks very much. Welcome. Thanks very much, Eric. <coughs> so, uh, thanks for coming today. Um, last day of a long series of, 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 of meetings. Um, so, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, the title of this presentation is What is Wrong with the Gold Mining Industry? Um, it's not a very popular presentation at a gold mining conference. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand what can go wrong in gold mining. Um, to try and better pick stocks which are, which are capable of, uh, of outperforming and avoiding some of the errors which, are, which have been made in the past. So uh, here's the horrible truth. Uh, most of us buy gold mining shares uh, to outperform uh, the price of gold to get some kind of leverage. Uh, if we look over the past uh, 25 years, uh, you can see that the price of gold has risen in US dollars by about 250%. Uh, the total return on the GDX has been 20%, uh, and the total return on, on some of the majors, and I've, I've put Barrick there, um, dividends reinvested over 25 years, the total return has been minus 5%. So clearly something's going wrong here, 
Uh, mining stocks are supposed to give us a leverage effect on the commodity that they produce, and, and, and that's not been the case for gold mining. <clears throat> Just a quick example um, to show that really the problem uh, is a very specific gold one in, in, in other subsectors in the mining industry, people mining other commodities. Um, they succeed in creating this leverage effect. Here's a chart of Antofagasta versus the copper price over the past 25 years. And you can see uh, copper's up um, just under 100%. And Antofagasta, which is a mid-tier pure copper miner, uh, has given a total return of about 410%. So clearly, the leverage effect is there uh, in other types of commodity. So why has gold mining serially underperformed the price of gold? <clears throat> I think there are two main explanations, and I think that they're, they're connected. Um, and the first one's a, a, a geological reality. There's not a great deal anybody can do about it. Uh, we find gold in relatively small quantities. That's why it's precious. That's why it's valuable. Uh, but it does mean that the mines tend to be much smaller, and therefore they have much shorter mine lives. Uh, and there you can see, I mean, the average life of a gold mine today in the world is about seven years. Uh, the average life of a copper mine is 35 years. And that means that you've got a very short period to get a return on your initial capital investment. <clears throat> and if, um, with a bit of bad luck, those seven years happen to be poor years for the gold price, well, you never get your initial capital back, uh, let alone uh, a return on that capital. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think the second thing which has destroyed a lot of value in the gold mining industry is the fact that uh, it, well, is the management reaction uh, to, to, to that uh, structural problem in the industry. And their reaction is an instinctive one, a natural one. Uh, every time the mine produces any cash, they reinvest it back into the business to try and prolong the mine lives. Because when you've only got seven years of job in front of you, uh, your, your, your tendency is, is to try and do everything to prolong that period. Um, and that might not be a bad strategy, but for the fact that um, because gold miners have relatively high costs, uh, they only really have money to invest when the gold price is high. And that means that they tend to make most of their investments uh, when the gold price is high at the top of the market. And when the gold price is low and asset prices are cheap, they don't have any money, or they may even, if they've got too much debt, be forced to sell at the bottom of the market. And there you've got a little chart of barracks capital investment uh, versus the gold price. And as you can see, as, as the gold price uh, rose, whoops, oh, it seems to have turned it off. <laughs> no, there's a, definitely a connection error somewhere there. Sorry about that. Got the baby seal back? Yeah, I got that back. Secret code. It was secret. <laughs> it's not mine, but uh, thank God it's simple enough. There, sorry Great, about that. thanks very much. So, um, yeah, this is just Barrick's capital investment versus, versus the, the, the gold price over the past uh, decade or so. And you can see um, that. Uh, that's the year-end gold price in red. You can see as, as the gold price rose, cap the capital expenditure budget of Barrick exploded. Uh, and as the gold price fell, uh, well, they, 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 they were obliged to rapidly cut their capital expenditure budget and, and even start to sell assets. So the maximum of investment was made at the absolute peak of the gold price with the, with the consequences that, that we all know. I think um, the other thing which has, has, has destroyed a lot of value for uh, shareholders in gold mining companies o over time has been um, a kind of uniquely poor uh, corporate governance which has prevailed in the sector. And I'm not quite sure why this has been allowed to happen by shareholders, but it, but it certainly has. <clears throat> I've taken the example of Gold Corp and Newmont here, um, which is a particularly egregious one. Um, and so the, 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 the last CEO of, uh, of Goldcorp uh, joined the company 
in 2016. Uh, he had a fixed salary of 10 million uh, Canadian dollars um, per year. Uh, during the three years that he managed the company, um, he destroyed about $3.7 billion US dollars of capital value, uh, and the stock underperformed uh, <coughs> the GDX um, by a little bit over 40%. Um, so he took 10 million per year for three years, and when he sold uh, the company to Newmont at the, pretty much at an historic low for the share price, uh, he took another $15 million uh, for compensation for loss of office. So $45 million for him, uh, minus $3.7 billion for the shareholders. The second aspect to that transaction, I think, which is, which is interesting, is um, why the hell did Newmont buy Gold Corp? And I think that uh, there again, it, it's an illustration of the, of the poor incentives in the industry. Um, the only th reason I can think that Newmont wanted to buy Gold Corp is because Barrick had merged with Rangold, and that put them in the number two position uh, in terms of production in the world, uh, and they didn't really like that very much, so they had to buy something quickly, and Gold Corp happened to be for sale. Uh, <clears throat> and you've seen in the disappointing earnings that Newmont's had uh, since the transaction um, that the source of the disappointment was almost exclusively uh, the assets that they acquired uh, from Gold Corp without having done sufficient due diligence. So um, that's for the large cap sector. Well, it seems to have blown up again. Sorry. We need the secret code again. So I'll, I'll, while Eric does that, I'll just carry on because time, time, is, time is short. Um, so the, um, the next slide, when it comes up, you'll see is, is, is just a, a short slide about the, uh, about the, s the smaller companies sector. Um, which uh, has been uh, quite a poor performer, uh, as, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, over, the past, uh, over the past few years. Um, and I think that there are, there are some structural uh, problems there. Well, we're going to have a bit of technical help here. Okay, so what I put here is a chart of the performance of, a, of uh, six um, uh, sm smaller uh, companies in the gold mining sector. They're not bad companies at all. I've, I've held some of these in, in, in the past and hold some of them still today. Um, but you can see since, uh, uh, so over the past two years, uh, these stocks have seen absolutely swinging declines in their, in their, in their value. Um, here, I think we have a structural problem as well. Um, there's over 2,500 mining companies quoted in the world with market caps under 500 million, and 2,000 of those 2,500 are, are precious metals companies. So there's a huge dispersion of the effort and the capital in the sector. Um, and having so many small companies means that they're in massive competition with each other for capital. Um, because their shares are illiquid, um, and they're often single asset companies. Uh, they have a very high cost of capital. So many of these companies trade at 0.2 or 0.3 times net asset value. And when they need to raise equity capital, they raise it at a discount to that already hugely discounted valuation. And if ever they try uh, and uh, use, use debt to finance themselves, uh, then they pay absolutely uh, <coughs> Uh, unbelievable interest rates on, on, on that debt, which destroys even more value. Um, and I think the fact of having so many uh, companies trying to do the same thing means that there's, there's kind of a shortage of skills in the industry. I think, um, you know, are there really 2,000 teams of top-notch uh, precious metal geologists in the world? Well, probably not. So... Uh, the, the, the pool of talent in the mining industry is spread far too thinly uh, in the smaller companies sector. Um, they're largely irrelevant to institutions because they're too small and too illiquid. Um, many, many of these companies have no analyst coverage, so there's, there's no really reassuring or efficient or impartial distribution of information about them. Um, and I think that the only solution really for this is, is a wave of consolidation. 
uh, you put 10 smaller companies together and they have um, <coughs> between them a massive saving in costs because um, instead of having 10 CFOs, you've only got one. Instead of having uh, 10 boards, each with five or six people on, you've only got one. Um, and by merging, they become larger entities which start to have access to institutional capital, um, and so they have a, lower, uh, a much lower cost of capital when they're making developments. I think that, uh, uh, is this going to happen anytime soon? Um, well, I've talked to lots of sm smaller mining company CEOs. They kind of all agree with the diagnosis of the problem, um, but none of them want to give up their jobs and merge with somebody else. So uh, I'm not wildly optimistic about this. <clears throat> Doesn't mean that there aren't some companies that'll, that'll, that'll do an excellent job and, and perform, but I think the smaller company's sector as a whole uh, is, is probably going to have a difficult time um, until some of these structural problems are resolved. So uh, that's all pretty pe pessimistic, pretty, uh, pretty bearish. Uh, <laughs> Um, and yet we're here to find out about uh, which gold companies to invest in. So, uh, you know, I do think there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think that um, for the large cap companies, for the majors, the, the, the kind of behavior that we've seen in the past, where as soon as they've got any cash, they start investing, I think that's starting to change. I think for many companies, um, you know, the... Ex the near-death experience between 2011 and 2015 in that uh, bear market, I think, is, uh, has left its marks on, on, on people's behavior. Um, and I think Q3, <clears throat> you know, although some people thought it was a mediocre quarter, I, th I thought it was reassuring in that it was the first quarter which showed uh, the effects of a higher gold price on, on free cash flow generation for the major companies. And, and I think what was good news was that, you know, few companies are plowing all this money back into uh, more capital expenditure. Uh, the priorities for, the, for, for this uh, perhaps unexpected bonus in terms of cash that's come from the higher gold price, the priorities for the use of that cash for most people have been to pay down debt if they've got any. And, um, and, and many of the large companies have started to think about uh, finally returning some of this cash to shareholders. Um, and, I, <coughs> you know, there were a number of large companies, uh, Evolution, Agnico, Northern Star, Kirkland, Barrick, uh, who all um, surprised us by increasing their dividends uh, fairly significantly. And I think that's a positive message. I think the other uh, positive thing which has happened over the past couple of years is that we have seen the beginning of some activism from, um, from shareholders. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, the Paulson... Uh, funds in, in New York uh, fought a proxy fight with the board of Detour and, and re removed the whole of the board and replaced them uh, <coughs> with perhaps more competent people. And uh, since then, the Detour share um, has more than doubled. Um, and I think that that was a positive, um, that was a positive indicator that managements won't, won't uh, I'm done here, all right, that's okay. Um, I think that was a positive indicator that managements won't be allowed to get away um, with uh, not optimizing the performance of the assets that are under their control. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much, well, really, everybody. Really sorry no that problem that. at all. Thank Don't worry. Thanks very much. It was yeah. really interesting. Because he didn't touch anything.
problème technique. Je suppose un informaticien et puis bon, euh, très dommage. Um, Claude Beget mentioned uh, Orion Resources and mentioned David Lowton. David is effectively the chairman. I am honored to um, have him come to the podium. Uh, David is a veteran portfolio manager. I believe he also uh, he um, um, did the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. I met him a few years when I was an analyst way back, uh, uh, and I think he was managing a, a, a portfolio uh, that started to get interested into the, uh, the mining industry or the mineral exploration industry. And so I believe he's very passionate, um, he's very intelligent, and so like I said, I'm very honored to have him on the podium and present Orion Resources, um, ticker AU in the Toronto Venture, and he uh, will present stuff in Finland. So, sir? I'll make some forward-looking. I'll, I'll make some forward-looking statements today. So, David just got off the stage. I followed him in Zurich as well, and I I like to follow David because uh, the last point he makes is all about corporate governance, or the second last point, anyways. And uh, it's important uh, when we talk about and when we assess investments to think about whether or not management is aligned with shareholders. We've got about 83 million shares outstanding at Orion, about $18 million in the bank, and management is the largest ownership block. I personally own about 9.5% of the stock. I joined the board uh, because the company was run by a geologist. It had some success uh, and no experienced executives to deal with it, so I serve as a volunteer taking no compensation, no stock options, nothing other shareholders don't get in order to ensure that shareholders will distinguish us as a company uh, that is run to make the stock go up. I add to that within the boundaries of ethics, no, no, letter, no paid letter writers, no email blasts, nothing like that. But who cares? We're well governed, that's great. I'll also point out our biggest shareholder, uh, just slightly bigger than me, is Kinross. Uh, next, to, uh, next to them, me, next to me, Eric Sprott, Ross Beatty, both owning 5%, and Gold Corp having bought uh, 5% of the company in the market, uh, but then getting a little busy uh, being taken over uh, is, uh, is probably our next largest shareholder. Again, uh, all that stuff is interesting, but that's the financial engineering. What's the value proposition here? We're a pure discovery company, uh, and uh, we are at least uh, uh, thought by Cormark to be in the early part of discovery, uh, where you're uh, right in front of the parabolic move. May they be right, uh, but you can see uh, that uh, that discovery uh, exploration companies can yield stunning returns, uh, a really into forty dollars, Great Bear from fifty cents to nine dollars this year. Diamet uh, way back, way way back in, in the nineteen nineties, uh, on the slave craton going to seventy dollars a share at one point, uh, and all with satisfying conclusions for investors. Our goal as well. Now, uh, the opportunity, of course, is generated by all the things that David talked about. Cycle after cycle, large extractive companies and natural resources uh, engage in, in, in uh, gigantic acquisitions at the end of the cycle, take on a lot of debt often to do so. Inevitably, commodity prices turn, and the first thing to go is expiration and investment in sustaining capital. So uh, these charts have been seen before. I love this. I love this comment by Ian Telfer uh, that uh, all the great gold deposits have already been discovered. Uh, that's why we're in the business that we're in. Uh, it's incredible. We go from dynamic environments with lots of trading and uh, predators stalking prey to a turgid swamp with pythons digesting many pigs. Uh, and then the cycle begins anew. So not to worry. The prospectors continue to be at work down here in the junior markets. And really, uh, this is how discoveries are made. Uh, that's, uh, that's one of our prospectors. They're all bald, actually, which is, is, is quite interesting. And they're all brothers, too. So um, we're in Finland, and we staked about 125, sorry, we staked uh, about 80 kilometers of 125 kilometer long fault line, where the state mining company found gold about 40 times and put it in a box and archived it. 
Udo Kampa was, had no interest in gold in, in Finland, and so this belt has been virtually unexplored. This looks just like the Destro Porcupine Fault or just like the Cadillac Larder Lake Break, and those fault lines uh, are the prominent feature of two of Canada's greatest gold camps, Timmins, 70 million ounces, and Kirkland Lake, 40 million ounces. What does it look like? Well, in 2016, we started finding these massive quartz boulders on surface. You can see them here, and you can see them on the cover of the presentation. I like that shot a little bit better. They're a little more revealed there. So to date, we found about 1,200 of these things uh, at, our, at our initial discovery on Marusco, and they average 25 grams per ton. That's over a kilometer and a half by a kilometer. I've been investing in mining companies for probably 20 years now, uh, maybe owned 400, maybe looked at 1,000, and I've never seen a surface expression like this in my career. The footprint of mineralization is over 15 kilometers, and it would comfortably fit Kirkland Lake or Timmins into it. But again, who cares? It's all on surface, but you've got to find it in the ground. Uh, it took a little while. We drilled into the boulders. It wasn't there. We figured out that probably they were a remnant of mass wasting and scarper cheats. So this rugged hill that you see in this slide was probably uh, twice as tall and twice as fat, and it's just worn down over the years. And those big boulders were over your head millions of years ago, not under the ground and frost heaved up. So we, uh, we hit it finally last year. The first, ex or the first dis true discovery hole was three meters of 800 grams, followed up by four meters of 40, about five meters of 24, uh, and uh, 12 and a half meters of, uh, or sorry, 12 and a half grams over five meters. And then uh, to start the season, we moved our drills over to the other side of the boulder field, which you see on the left side of the slide. And our first two holes this year were uh, 31 meters of three and a half grams and 28 meters of nine and a half grams uh, with gold in the quartz, gold in the sediments. And in fact, we've encountered gold in almost every kind of rock uh, that, that we have here. We've got gabbro sediments, volcanics, and of course, lots and lots of high-grade quartz veins. You can see that beautiful wire gold wrapped around uh, part of the discovery hole, and you don't see that even in many of the great gold camps on Earth. So why is this here? I mean, big, giant fragments of quartz uh, lying around like that anywhere, uh, even in darkest Africa, uh, soon attract thousands of artisanal miners. But this is up at the Arctic Circle. Uh, Finland only has 5 million people living in it. Most of them live down in the south, close to Helsinki. And mining was in the hands of the state in Finland until 1995. Udo Kampo, the state mining company, was only interested in GDP-related minerals, copper, nickel, iron ore. They're a publicly traded steel company today. And so they would find gold, as we mentioned earlier, uh, and archive it, put it in the public databases, free for everyone to see. Uh, but... Uh, but um, never followed up. So they joined the European Union in 1995, and by stipulation of the treaty, had to begin making Finland more hospitable to foreign investment. Of course, BRIEX happened two years later, and there was very little capital available for the juniors who do most of the exploration work in this business. And uh, in the tiny window between 2002 and the financial crisis, uh, a high-grade vein discovered by a construction, a road construction crew, uh, went to Ritter Hitten, a little Swedish company. They drilled it out to 2 million ounces, uh, and it is now Europe's largest gold mine being operated by Agnico Eagle. You can see it in the bottom histogram there, and the central Lapland greenstone belt is the gold one. No coincidence. And if this was any other greenstone belt, the Abitibi or the Norseman, for instance, what you'd see is this sort of smooth, log-normal distribution of gold deposits where you have a couple of really big ones, five or six pretty big ones, seven or eight big ones, and then the frequency will, will increase as the ounces go down. So why is there just one eight million ounce gold deposit in Lapland and, and just a few small ones? Well, it's not true. Uh, I think we've demonstrated already that there's going to be a lot more gold found there, and we're only in the incipient stages of it. So there's another interesting reason. Uh, the uh, the Canadian markets, the Australian markets, are very efficient. They don't give capital uh, to, to capital-intensive exploration programs. And if you were at this latitude in Canada, uh, you can see in the lower picture there, that's uh, Committee Bay. Uh, it's, uh, 
It's just pure tundra. There's no trees. Uh, it's a four-month expiration season. You need a fly-in, fly-out camp. You've got to position diesel fuel. And just to get people there and keep them alive costs about $6 million a year. And then additional expenses, millions of dollars often in aviation expenses. So we uh, are, uh, thanks to the Gulf Stream, in a much better place. Same latitude in Canada, but we fly commercial to Helsinki. We fly commercial to Kitala. You drive on this paved road to within eight kilometers of the Discovery, and you drive on that logging road right to the Discovery. The underlying landowner is Metzaholtis, the state forestry company. They've blitzed the property with logging roads, clear-cut it in many places, and scarified the ground, turning the soil up and effectively trenching for us, at least shallowly. It's really extraordinary. You might still wish that we were in the Abitibi or in Nevada. Those are extremely perspective uh, places still, uh, but what I would say is every square inch of Nevada is, is, has been staked probably for a hundred years now, uh, held by families generation after generation, rented out to the junior sector, uh, cycle after cycle, often returned with only rents paid and very little expiration done. So uh, our property is 100% staked and, uh, and uh, has a 0.15% royalty to Metzaholtis, the state forestry company on it. Again, really without precedent to find all this gold on surface, to be able to stake 80 kilometers of a major fault line to find physical gold, sorry, <laughs> to find, to find high-grade gold in quartz lying all over the surface and to have it without a royalty in an area where exploration is extremely economical. Now, with a land package like this, you'd expect more discoveries. And indeed, down there in the bottom right hand of the screen with, the, with that gold star, we've got another one. Leone is much easier to work than Amorusco and most notably because the gold is in outcrop, not in boulders. You don't have to find the source. It's right there. That was the discovery outcrop. We've since taken 1,000 samples over 5 kilometers on Leone, and, and they've averaged 8 grams. Again, without precedent uh, in, in modern, well, in, in the last few decades of exploration, quite frankly. So what's also important about investing in these highly dangerous companies is market timing. <laughs> We went into a five-year bear market uh, in, in mining uh, from 2010, really the end of 2010 to early 2016, uh, and had a fantastic 100% move in the venture from uh, uh, January of 2016 to the middle of 2017, from 470, which was a 50-year low, to, uh, to about 940. Uh, we've given it all back. We're almost right back at the lows. Capital is even harder to raise today than, uh, than it was probably in, in 2015. Uh, not a problem for us. We've raised eight, $17 million this year at a blended cost of, a bit, of about $1.30. So dollars, I mean, raising capital at dollars, not pennies, which is essential for junior companies and not giving warrants away. Inevitably, the cycle that uh, we talked about at the beginning of the pres presentation uh, begins again. These companies run their reserves down. Uh, they fire their exploration teams so that the C-suite can continue to work. They divest of assets to pay debt off, and eventually they have to rebuild. All of these great gold companies were built by buying small companies that made great discoveries, and we hope will be the next one. Thank you. So we did not have any screen problems. It appears to me, my hypothesis is that, oh, I was afraid that something happened there. When we're too long on one same slide, it just seems to go to sleep. So I don't know if the IT guys have a solution to that. So having said that, hopefully we won't have these recurrent problems. So I'm gonna go now present our next speaker, Mr. Gabriel Pindar who is the CEO of Neolithium Corp, NLC on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So this is a PDF, control down. So Gabrielle is an experienced, uh, I would say, um, developer 
I appreciate his experience in the lithium industry. He's very knowledgeable, but also is aware of the cost of, uh, or the estimations of cost and the cost of building um, world-class operations or even mines. So I believe his acumen and his, uh, his insight is most interesting. So he's going to present us uh, the Cuadra Ras lithium project in Argentina. So Gabriel, hopefully everything will go right. <clears throat> Any advice? I shouldn't touch something here. I think uh, if don't move this because this is the sensitive part. Okay, excellent. Well, good morning. Um, I, I'm, I always listen with a lot of interest um, gold projects, and, and, and I find it interesting um, how people want to invest in gold, and they, they want to find an angle, and they want to find uh, gold projects that are uh, better grade and everything. But sometimes they miss out other opportunities that are providing better returns. So I'm here to present you one of them. Um, this is our Tres Quebradas project uh, in Argentina. It's a lithium project. Um, just to, to go quickly, I mean, you probably heard, and I mean, lithium is uh, was a one of the preferred commodities a year and a half, two years ago. Not the preferred commodity today. Um, li lithium price has come down because there is quite a bit of supply on the market, which is great. Um, that's exactly what the market wants. Uh, they want cheap lithium so you can have actually a cheap battery, so you can have a cheap electric car and not a $100,000 or $200,000 car. So that's exactly what our company is all about. So we want to bring um, world-class asset. Um, uh, we have a resource that is at least 35 years. Um, it, it's still growing because we haven't finished defining it. Um, so the reserves that we have identified today are 35 years. The resource is probably good for 100 years. Um, we, we are at the, what we think is very, very close to the bottom end of the curve in terms of cost. And despite that, um, we have an internal rate of return of 50%, um, payback less than two years. So with an investment of $300 million that, that we are very close to uh, closing, um, the NPV of the company will be 1.1 billion. And I'm talking at the lowest valuation that you have for lithium today. So there is, this is very difficult to match by any, any other commodity. Uh, so I'll just go quickly. I've, I've been here twice or three times, and uh, some of you have already seen the presentation, so I'll just remind people a couple of things. Um, uh, our project is in Argentina. Uh, the brine projects of the world are in this region, in between Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia. Um, and what is the key importance of brine projects? They're large-scale, low cost. They're the lowest cost producers of lithium in the world. So you can put rock projects from Australia, Canada quickly into production, but they're not going to be the lowest cost producers if you have to produce lithium carbonate. Um, we know Argentina very well. We have done several projects in Argentina. In a, we, we own 100% of the, of the property. Um, we are fully permitted, so we have uh, complied with almost all the requirements from the government so far. The last part the government is asking is for us to complete financing before they grant us the final permits. They don't like approving things without you having uh, final financing. In terms of where is the project um, compared to the peers, um, we put a couple of graphs to simplify to people. Um, we have a very large resource, um, so we're going to utilize the northern part of the resource first. Um, that allows us to be in production for 35 years, um, providing the second highest grade in the world. So this is very important. So you have one uh, big area that is the Atacama Desert that hosts uh, two big producers, SQM and Albermale. And they're big because they have good grade and they have a lot of uh, resources. And if you look at our information in our chart and what we have found, um, this is the largest uh, below, be, um, after them and with the, highest, the second highest grade in the world. Um, it is very important to understand grade because grade means that you will invest less capex to start operations. So if you start from a higher grade, you have to evaporate less so your pond surface is less. So ju and just to simplify to people trying to do the analysis, we put graphs like this showing the surface, the evaporation surface of the ponds that uh, companies like SQM and Albermail have to build in order to get to production. Um, the ponds that we will build 
and the ponds that our competitors will have to build to get into production too. So that, that shows a distinct advantage and hence the, the internal rate of return of the project. The other part, uh, the other most important part is the chemistry. So you want to have very low contaminants. Um, the majority of your operating cost will be in relation to canceling your contaminants. So if you have a lot of sulfate, you have to add lime. Um, if you have magnesium, unfortunately, there aren't many things you can do. Um, chances are when you try to cancel magnesium, you will lose lithium. So you need to start from very high grade. So projects that are high grade like this can afford to have a little bit of magnesium. Regardless of that, um, you can see in that chart uh, where we're placed in relation to our peers and in relation to the companies that are in production. And that's why we're forecasting to be the lowest cost producer in the world. Just, just a picture of the uh, resource itself. Um, of course, we're talking not only about a geological resource, but a hydrogeological resource. So we're extracting water. Um, lithium is soluble, so it's a salt, and it's uh, dissolving water. So we take the water, we concentrate it, and then we extract the salts from that. In terms of enterprise value, um, I also make people aware uh, of the value. When you, when you go and do an investment, um, have a look at the size of the resource, not, not only um, the marketing campaign on when are they going to be in production and things like that, because some of these resources are very, very small. So when you invest in those companies, uh, you're already investing at a very high price. Your entry level is very high. So have a look at the relationship between uh, your resource and the cost of the company today. For the geologists in the group, um, we publish all of the information of the first uh, uh, 35 years um, and how the grade goes down uh, during that period. As I said, we, you're mining water. Uh, it is important to understand that when you are pumping water out of a system, you need two permits. You need the lithium permit, but you also need a water permit. So make sure that most of the companies that uh, you review in this sector uh, have both, uh, because in some cases you may be able to extract lithium, but not necessarily uh, water in the area. So, but if you do have permits for water, then you're also in a, in a good zone. This is our salar. Those uh, are the drill holes that we have uh, done. Uh, very few companies in the world have spent the amount of money we have spent um, in researching our asset. We don't want any mistakes. We want to bring it to production in a responsible way. Uh, we have spent so far $45 million. Um, we're very well funded. We still have another $40 million in the bank. Um, so uh, this will see us all the way to production, um, subject to, of course, final financing. Just a picture of the area. This is not fresh water. This is brine. So. If you just imagine you're looking at a, at a brine surface, so, so this is salt water, um, has a pH of 4, it doesn't have any value, so you, you cannot drink it, no animal can drink it, you will not see a plant, you will not see anything. This is acidic water, um, uh, very, very uh, high in all kinds of salts. It has a lot of potash also. Um, we're also going to look at uh, potassium chloride as a, as a sub-product of lithium in our site just the work that we have done lately. So you're extracting water, so you want to prove that you can extract water at the right rate, so you can keep your ponds full and you can keep the evaporation rates. Um, so that, that's what we have achieved. Um, you need to pilot your ponds. You need to understand how quickly they evaporate in that region, um, how fast the salts precipitate. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex process. Some of the companies have not done a very good job at piloting. Um, we have spent two longer than two years now piloting our ponds. Uh, these are big ponds, so uh, this is 360 meters by 100 meters, more or less, uh, each of them. Um, we, we believe that we have mastered now this. We are producing our own concentrate. Um, these, are, these are just some pictures so you can see the salts precipitating. Um, we have produced our own concentrate from our own brine. And we have also produced our own uh, lithium carbonate from our own piloting plant. So that this was very important uh, achievement. Um, we published it a, a few weeks ago. Uh, our first batch was so pure um, that we published all the results, so 99.1%. Um, to achieve that, that is already technical grade. If you want to achieve battery grade, it needs to be at 99.5%. 
and we believe within the next three, four weeks we'll be able to announce that too. Um, very, very important is for us the relationship that we have with the local community. Uh, Catamarca in this area of Argentina hasn't received a lot of mining uh, presence uh, in, the, in the last 20 years, 30 years. So the communities are starving for work. That's the majority of the requests that we receive is for employment. Um, we have committed to the local communities that 70% of our personnel will come from that region. They're very well qualified. So far, it has been uh, an excellent reception from them. We already got the permits where the plant is going to be, and we're going to locate ourselves probably three, four kilometers away from the main uh, town of Fiambala. So as we said, very impressive numbers. Um, very, very low capital entry because of their high grade and very good chemistry, so $320 million. Internal rate of return of 50% almost, 1.1 um, billion MPV at today's price, so at the lowest part of that curve. Uh, if you start putting prices from a year ago, that goes very quickly to $2 billion. So this is what I was talking about being the lower cost producer. So we are forecasting to be the lowest cost in the world uh, today. Um, and you can see the brine uh, projects being in the lowest quartile and the rock projects being in the highest quartile. So what we, have, what we have achieved so far, um, we have completed our pre-feasibilities, we have established the reserves, we have done three drilling campaigns, we have more than 35 years of resources, so we're not looking at five years or 10 years. Um, this is already a reserve of 35 years, and we believe it's going to be a lot larger in the future. Uh, the resource is, is, like I said, for almost 100 years. Um, our next step is to achieve financing. Um, we are in the final steps of that. Of that. Uh, we will JV with a, with a company that has similar objectives to us. Uh, we, we don't really prefer uh, customers. Um, we would prefer to partner up with a mining company or a chemical company um, that, that is more aligned to our objectives, and that's what we have been pursuing. So what can investors uh, expect? There are two companies in the market that have achieved what we're about to achieve. Um, one is Oro Cobre that has already started production, and the other one is Lithium Americas, that is going to start production next year. Um, these are the only two brine companies in the world um, that have achieved that. And you can see the multiples on the moment they started, um, riding the lithium market price, and from the moment they achieved financing. So usually these, these companies get really appreciation once you um, announce that you are fully financed to construction. So that's, that's what we can expect in the next few months. Um, we have very good and patient institutional shareholders. Um, BlackRock and JP Morgan have been there all the way through. Um, we have um, RB McKenzie's brought as, as other uh, key uh, investors into our group. Um, our management team still holds 16% of the company. Uh, we don't want to dilute ourselves, um, so we're protecting shareholders' interests. And as I said, we're expecting financing at um, JV level, so not through capital raising. Um, history and timeline. I think our team is, is, is quite experienced uh, in many ways. Um, Waldo Perez was the creator and founder of uh, Lithium Americas initially. Um, myself, I have been working in the, in the mining industry for the last 27 years. Um, I work for engineering companies like Bechtel and Fluor and Hatch, uh, and then I work for owners' team like BHP Billiton and ArcelorMittal. Um, what we have found is really a world-class asset, and that's why we are working to develop it. So that's the team. Um, Constantine, our chairman, is very, very uh, well known in the market. Uh, he was the creator and CEO of Molycorp, um, very well connected in China. Uh, those are key connections if you want to develop this project to the future. So, uh, in summary, um, I, I know most of you would probably prefer uh, gold, uh, but this is a quite interesting commodity. I think if you get in at this stage, you are getting in at the bottom, so you can only see the upside uh, going into the future. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to see you. I'm out in the booth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel. It worked. Thank you very much. Cheers.
So our next speaker would be Mr. Brendan Cowhill, President and CEO of Exelon Resources. Is Brendan here? No, I believe. Right. I keep it. Sir? Thank you. Welcome. Good to be here. I'll let you introduce. Good morning, everybody. Unfortunately, Brendan cannot be with you, so you're stuck with me. I'm uh, Ben Pullinger, Exelon's uh, Senior Vice President of Geology, and I'd like to take you guys through um, the story of Exelon today, Mexico's highest silver producer, and also looking uh, at many other exciting things. This, in a nutshell, is really what, we, uh, what the story is about. The people who have delivered in the past, a team that has delivered on all fronts, permitting, exploration, construction, uh, asset base that we can grow with, and realizing where we are in the sector, and realizing that you know there's been a, a bunch of people up this morning talking about the access to capital, capital markets, and how difficult that is, and how important it is to be resilient, and to be in the right place, um, and be positioned well for when markets return. Um, this is our board of directors and management. I'll point out a few key members um, you know, on our board in terms of governance and strength. Daniela Dimitrov on the board of Nexa, partner at Sprout Capital Management. Uh, Laurie Curtis, a geologist, the founder of Intrepid Min Minerals, sold that, went on to become an analyst and basically seen every like, exploration stage and production asset in all the world. And then on the management side, Brendan, our CEO, uh, former M&A lawyer from Davies Ward, boutique firm in, uh, in Toronto, lots of big mining deals. And uh, the, last, the last and probably most recognizable one um, at Palangio, he was there when we spun out uh, the Detour Lake asset and turned that into Detour Gold, which then went on to become Canada's biggest gold mine. Um, also, a new addition to the team, Annalad Kruger, joined us uh, from Trevally recently. Trevally from a, she was at Trevally from a $50 million market cap all the way through to a billion dollar deal with, uh, with Glencore. Uh, myself, I joined the team from Rocks Gold where I was part of taking the, uh, the Yeramoko asset from a rough and furred resource all the way through to commercial production uh, in four years. Uh, Craig Ford, another very important member of our team, he was at Enmet basically from the beginning, inception of Enmet, all the way through to their, uh, th them getting taken up by First Quantum, and is really one of the key stakeholders in getting Cobre Panama permitted, um, getting a uh, intractable community situation um, resolved, and Cobre Panama went into production this, way, th this, uh, this year on the back of that. Uh, we currently have three assets, two in Mexico and one which I'm excited to talk about as well at the end of this, later on in the presentation, our Silver City asset in, um, in Germany. Really we're positioned on basically the three best gold belts that you can be on. The CRD superhighway uh, that runs all the way through the spine of Mexico, the Northern Fresno trend which needs no introduction, and now uh, the Freiburg trend which is literally the economic and mining engine of, uh, of Europe back in the 1880s. Our, um, our keystone asset, the Platosa mine, uh, it's produced over 800,000 uh, 800, tons. It's been in production since 2005. Uh, it is high, Mexico's highest grade um, resource at the moment. We produce it about 1,000 grams per ton silver equivalent, 500 grams silver, and the rest is made up of base metals. Um, Torreon, where, we, where we're based out of, a um, city of over 1.1 million people. It's quite spectacular. You can stay at any hotel you want to. You can fly in on regular daily flights. You can take an Uber to the mine and pick up Starbucks from key locations along the way. Um, very, very good place to work. Uh, historically, this mine ha has had some, uh, some, some water challenges that some of you might have heard about. Um, it, since 2017, we've been producing under dry conditions. But what you can see, what that's allowed us to do, we have to pump a lot of water to get there. And if you look in the, on the horizon there, you see all these green fields of alfalfa. We have a very strong relationship with our community, and we irrigate 3,500 hectares of land, um, growing alfalfa, uh, supporting the, uh, the local community around the mine. This is the resource that we, we're based off, um, as I was talking about, that super high Platosa, 1,000 plus gram per ton silver equivalent resource. Uh, you know, this is, has a small resource and has always had a small resource. Every year we continue to grow it, push it out, replace what we found and uh, it continues to you know, slowly grow and maintain that grade. What's important here though is in terms of like the, the spectrum of CRD systems, Platosa is now sitting at around 1.2, 1.3 million tons 
mined and defined. This puts it on very much the small end of the spectrum when you look at other CRDs, and I'll touch more on that and what we believe will happen to this asset as it goes on later on. Uh, on the, uh, the cost and production side, really uh, a story of uh, you know, stabilizing the operation. You know, as I said, in Q, Q2 2017, we dried out the mine. We started realizing very good, co very good costs. Uh, Q3 to 2018, we had a, uh, a couple of things that went against us. And really, if you look at Q4 2018 to, to, through to Q4 2019, the unfortunate thing is the delta between that and the, what you see on the left-hand side of the slide is really about treatment charges and electricity costs. The electricity costs haven't doubled in Mexico, and treatment charges, especially on zinc, haven't gone up by 10x. Um, we believe that we can get these costs back down to sub-$15, and that's where we see the company going uh, into next year. In terms of our assets, I already talked about the, uh, the CRD superhighway, as Peter McGoy likes to call it, but that really is the belt. That's the, uh, you look at the size and the scale of these operations, they're primarily owned by Peñoles and uh, Grupo Mexico. These are assets that are legacy assets. They produce for a very long time, they continue to grow, and Plutosa is, as I said earlier, you know, very much in its infancy. No one was here before us. This is a discovery made by the company in, 2000, sorry, in 1999 put into production in 2005. You know, there was no uh, Grupo here, there was, no, uh, there was no Spanish here before us. This is our, um, this is our baby, and as I said, at 1.3 million tons mined and defined, very much in its infancy. And really, you know, uh, Dave Lotan was talking about earlier, what happens when you, cut, when you don't do exploration is you really like cut your throat as a company. And our goal is to look at exploration, view exploration is just part of the business, it's our R&D, right? If you don't have exploration, if you're not looking at your next product, if you're not developing, if you're not growing, um, you don't have a future. And with that, our, our philosophy is very simple. Grow what we have, find more on the projects that we have. We have those three you know, projects on those three silver belts. And then really what we want to do and what we're, we're built to do is to try and find a world-class discovery either in uh, that CRD superhighway, the Fresno trend, or in, uh, in Freiburg in Germany. Plutosa, um, we, we continue to add resources as we drill and define more mineralization out ahead of us from underground. You can see some of those results there on the left-hand side. Spectacular grades, spectacular widths, 11.1 .1 meters at 2,200 gram per ton silver equivalent. Um, those, two are, those two purple circles you see in the middle there, those are areas that we're currently putting in dedicated drill infrastructure, and we'll be drilling from there on the northern one by the end of the year and the southern one into next year. Continue to define, continue to add resources, continue to uh, delineate new ounces. And more importantly as well, if you look on the right-hand side of that slide, you see that cluster of purple dots. That is where the resource remains open. And earlier this year, we were drilling out there, announcing grades and, and widths of 5 meters at 2,300 gram per ton silver equivalent. Really that spectacular Plutosa grade continuing and still open ahead of us. Our regional land package, to give you some context, is 21,000 hectares. The whole of Plutosa, all of our resources to date, sit on just 56 of that 21,000 hectares. With that in mind, <coughs> exploration on this project has been a constant, uh, constant challenge for us, and we continue to define new targets, continue to get boots on the ground, continue to work with our crews to find places to drill. Uh, most recently, we've got two priority targets that you can see on this slide. have on CO in the top left-hand corner there. This is an area we've just finished up drilling some holes, uh, proving up that there is a giant, big alteration zone, huge breaches, pirate filled. We're in the system. If this is, uh, if you're going through your CRD checklist to find out that you are, make sure that you're in the right place for looking at this, we're nine out of 10 on that list. The last thing missing there is an economic discovery. So we will persist, like the environment is correct, the geology is right. The amount of alteration in those limestones is, is pretty significant. Um, later this year, we plan to be drilling at a place called PDN. PDN is a SCAN target linked to what we see there at Rincon del Cairo, where the company was drilling in 2012, intersecting high-grade copper and, and, and lead, sorry, high-grade gold and copper, as well as base metals as well as part of that SCAN mineralization. Um, this is something that we're hoping to put some drill, drill holes into before the end of this year and see what we get coming in the new year. If we uh, jump in our cars or our trucks and we take a drive, 200 k's down the highway, we get to our Megalauza, or our Evolucion project, where we have a commanding land position, position of 45,000 hectares in the middle of the northern Fresno trend. Uh, the Fresno trend needs no introduction. Five billion ounces mined to the south, you know, basically from San Luis Potosi all the way up to, to Fresno. Uh, what's very interesting, though, is once you get to the north of Fresno, this belt disappears into cover. 
it uh, pops up at a couple places and you can see a few windows there and where it pops up out of cover they are generally projects um, where we are in the land package that we have and what we're seeing around us is mainly exploration under cover and a really good example of the, the riches and what you can find in this part of the world is the uh, the story of San Sebastian San Sebastian was is a heckler mine um, heckler put into production it has been their top cash flowing asset and uh, it was found a 10 kilo per ton silver vein under one meter of soil in a farmer's field. This is the riches and this is what we're, taught, we're looking for in this part of the world and this is why we have that, pa that land package there. As well on top of that we have a, a former producer, a 30 million ounce uh, resource that we're busy working on growing and we have our mill there and uh, I'll touch on that and this, the significance and the strategy, strategic uh, value of our mill later on in this presentation. Um, to the end of last year and early this year we started exploring around that historical resource. So that historical resource there came into the company in 2009 where Exelon took over Silver Eagle who had just uh, started to build the Calvario vein or Calvario mine. Um, they ran out of money. Exelon acquired them for, uh, for, for $4 million of stock, got a brand new $15 mill, a whole bunch of losses carried forward in that $30 million ounce resource. We've gone back and been exploring in that area and the result of that is we've started to intersect a very large bulk tonnage zone of mineralization seen stuff of consistent mineralization like 153 meters at 1.2 grams gold equivalent or 1 101 grams silver equivalent with higher grade within that. We've currently got this zone defined to in excess of 800 meters long strike and in excess of 800 meters um, at depth. Just to give you though a bit, of, a bit more context, if you look at that historical resource, that's 30 million ounces. Um, that section across from the top of that to the top of those drill holes is 1.2 kilometers. This is a very big system and we're busy testing to see how big it is with the intention of hopefully being able to take it up to resource where we believe it will underpin a, uh, a very big silver equivalent resource um, that is currently not reflected in our share price. Miguel Alza is this is a, a picture of our mill. This is the mill that we acquired from Silver Eagles, uh, Silver Eagle in 2009. We've done a fair bit of work on it over the years, but it's a very strategic asset as it is the only mill in that part of, uh, of the Fresnier Belt. Uh, we currently have a toll milling agreement with, uh, with San Sebastian as they ramp up and develop their underground, their sulfide ore. Um, we are taking uh, delivery of that, toll milling it for them. We're currently in a bulk, uh, bulk sample stage and hopefully rolling that into a full commercial agreement with them next year, which will be about 3 to $5 million U.S. Um, attribu attributable to us uh, as part of that deal. Uh, last but certainly not least, um, I'm going to pause here and just uh, sometimes remind myself this, is there's not a lot of places in the world that you can go and find a 164 square kilometer uh, intact gold system and pick it up with nobody else around you as we have done here. Um, Saxony, um, probably very little known, but very mining friendly jurisdiction. Um, the dots that you see there, those are all mining projects and various commodities between private and, and junior companies. Uh, it's a place where, um, you know, the, the, where basically the Saxon Empire was funded with the, uh, the development of the gold, uh, silver mines over 750 years in the 1200s all the way through to 1881, where, uh, where they shut down after Germany went off the silver standard. Uh, and changed over to a gold standard. Coincidentally, and I, very interestingly, a lot of these guys left Freiburg where they were mining, uh, headed over to North America and Mexico and actually ended up modernizing and industrializing the, uh, the Mexican silver mining industry. But this is where they came from. These mines have been um, in production for hundreds of years, produced over 400 million um, ounces of silver, and they're very, very far from done. Um, a lot of them shut down with the, uh, the decline in the silver price due to water pumping, and just lack of economics, but these things only went down you know, 80, 100, 200 meters at depth. And what's very important and very, very cool about this project is the amount of information that we have in it. The University of Freiburg is located five kilometers away from this project, and it's been, it is the world's oldest mining technology institute and university. Um, for hundreds of years, they were collecting samples from each, of each one of these mines, keeping them on archive, and we have, we have access to those samples, so we know what the veins look like, we know what the mineralization looks like, we know what the mineralogy looks like. You know, the University of Freiburg has done petrographic and fluid inclusion studies on this, so the amount of information that we have before we go and put our first drill hole into this is already well ahead of the game and, and pretty staggering. Um, you know, we have t lots of records as well from these mines, knowing that they produced anywhere from a half meter at you know, 3,500 3, gram per ton silver, not, being, not assaying for gold or zinc back in those days, 
um, up to some, some areas where they shut down in uh, 10 meters of 1,000 grams per ton silver. This is a spectacular silver district and uh, it fits very well into our portfolio. We're hoping to be, uh, we're in the process of putting a, a work plan together and look forward to drilling here, uh, hopefully by the end of Q1 Q2, or into Q2 next year. Again, just can't talk more about the, uh, can't talk enough about the, uh, the support and the infrastructure in this area. In addition to the University of Freiburg, there's also the Helmholtz Institute of Freiburg, which is a higher technology institute funded by Brussels and Berlin with the purpose of bringing investment into technology and investment into mining into Saxony. Uh, this, is, this institute is uh, located like, very, pretty much next door to the university, the, the Freiburg University. They share resources, they share students, and uh, you know, th this is a mining city, this is a mining town, very proud of its mining heritage. Just to wrap it up, this is our, uh, our capital structure. Our market cap is sitting around $100 million at the moment. Um, it, in uh, August of this year, we closed an $11.5 million um, deal. We have about $9 million at the end of the quarter in working capital and very well supported by strong shareholders. Um, about 35% of our floats is out of Europe. And then Eric Sprott, who is our major shareholder, owns 20% of, uh, of the company. Um, good, good, uh, good volumes, good liquidity as well, and good coverage out of Cantor, Cormark, and PI Financial. And with that, I'll leave you on this final slide. This is really what it's all about for Exelon when it comes down to it. Our vision and what we want to do in life is create wealth for our shareholders, for our management, for the people that work for us, for the stakeholders, for anybody that comes interact in, into interaction or interacts with Exelon. This is what the, uh, the ultimate goal is. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to the story, Exelon. Yeah, and Ed, uh, indeed, uh, Ben, I find the Silver City asset most interesting. And to me, the message I get from there is that, you know, this is a past producing district, historical, in the heart of Europe. Um, I appreciate the fact that perhaps this will be something that people will realize that um, proximity to the market, um, maybe silver is not necessarily used in every <laughs> use in, in Europe per se, but uh, it's importance of having this idea of when we have the sustainable development that perhaps it'd probably be nice to have um, mines being produced near the end users. And here I make a reflection uh, to the fact that people are not cognizant when they use their cell phones where the material come from. And, uh, you know, they expect that we, they say no to mining close to their home, not in my backyard. And uh, the idea here is that, you know, if we can produce it closer to home, we don't have to have the transportation uh, and all the facets of that. And I give an example, and I think people are not aware of that, but in Norway, um, they're opening a copper mine up in one of the northern fjords, and uh, the idea here is that uh, they're putting the tailings into the fjord, and uh, the Minister of Environment said, look, it, uh, we want to develop um, a sustainable economy with electrical vehicles, and part of the electrical vehicles are made with copper, and why can't we produce copper in our country? And instead of having it being produced in Africa, they said, look, we made the whole balance of, of the equation and we should be able to produce here copper closer to where we are using it. So I found that reflection interesting. And so for Silver City, I think it's something that if we can start seeing that more and more where um, Europeans and North Americans uh, are willing to accept that it can be in their backyard and then we have certain control on how it's done. And I think the mining industry can do things very well. So having said that, I have the pleasure now of introducing our next speaker. There has been a change uh, of the schedule. Um, Integra Resources were supposed to produce, uh, pr pr present, but unfortunately uh, they were not make, able to make it over here. So I have now the honor of pre pre presenting our next speaker, Mr. Sean Kunkum, who's the CEO of Strike Point Gold. Sean is a young, dynamic entrepreneur. He's got 15 years of experience. I just want to make sure this isn't getting this right. In the um, mining industry, he's passionate. Am I getting this right? Excellent. Based out of Vancouver, and StrikePoint has assets in the uh, Golden Triangle of northwestern BC and also in the Yukon. So, Sean? The floor is yours. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining me today uh, to learn about StrikePoint. Um, so as Eric said, uh, we, are, we are focused in, uh, in northwestern BC, in Canada, and we've also got uh, large holdings in the Yukon. Uh, so our primary listing is on the TSX. Uh, we trade under symbol SKP. Uh, just a cautionary uh, forward-looking statement. Um, so the Golden Triangle, uh, this is where Strike Point is focused. We have two advanced exploration assets in the Triangle. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Triangle, it's a very well-endowed uh, part of the world. It's, uh, it's seen about 130 million ounces of gold discovered. Um, and uh, just in the last 30 years alone, half of those discoveries have been made. So there's uh, a few factors that are impacting um, the opportunity in the Triangle. One of the things is uh, ice recession, glacier retreat. Uh, we've also got a tremendous increase in infrastructure. There's been about $700 million of, uh, of power lines that have brought power into the Golden Triangle in recent years. Uh, we've also got a tremendous amount of road systems that have come in. So the Triangle is, a, is an area known for large copper and gold deposits. Uh, Strike Point is at the bottom, it's at the southern tip of the Triangle. Uh, close to the town of Stewart, which has an ocean port. Um, in terms of the management team, um, we've got a, a really strong, diverse group, uh, highly technical. Um, the one common characteristic amongst the management team here is it's a group of geologists, uh, mining engineers, capital markets professionals who have uh, successfully acquired, explored, discovered, and sold companies to, uh, to larger companies. So for example, uh, Adrian Fleming, one of our lead directors, was part of a, uh, a takeover last year. Uh, Coor Mining bought Northern Empire. <clears throat> uh, previous to that, both Adrian and Rob, um, founders of uh, Underworld Resources up in the Yukon, sold to Kinross for $140 million. And uh, Ian Harris, who is a mining engineer, uh, was instrumental in the sale of Corriente. So we've got a track record of, br of bringing uh, value to shareholders, and uh, that's what we're, we're trying to do here with StrikePoint. Um, very, uh, very strong capital structure. Um, we're, we're, a, we're probably one of the smaller companies here at the Swiss Mining Institute. Um, we've got a $6 million market cap. However, you're going to see the same types of renowned precious metal shareholders, despite it being a smaller company. So we have two corporate shareholders. These are two um, companies that are focused in the triangle, Ascot and Skeena. Uh, Eric Sprott uh, rounds out as one of the top shareholders, uh, strong institutional shareholders, uh, including a Swiss uh, shareholder in Gold 2000, and uh, well, uh, well held in, uh, in North America as well. Um, management has significant skin in the game. We've got about a plus 10% position. Uh, the stock trades with very good liquidity, uh, particularly when we're operating uh, exploration programs. We, we traded about 40 million shares throughout the summer months, uh, bringing in about a million dollars of liquidity a day. Um, what I've done here is I've taken uh, a five-year gold chart, and um, you know my strategy with StrikePoint back in 2016, as, as gold was bottoming around uh, $1,030 US an ounce. I thought it was a good time uh, to start acquiring gold and silver assets in safe jurisdictions. I chose uh, Northwestern BC and the Yukon because my technical team has had a lot of success there. They know the service providers, they're familiar with the rocks. Um, so we set upon a strategy, um, you know, due to the fact that the majors were not replenishing their ounces, they were not putting money into exploration. So what we've done here in the last three years is we've acquired 25 gold and silver properties. If you take the total market cap of the companies of the, that had the properties, uh, it was close to half a billion dollar, dollars worth of gold properties. Our, our acquisition costs were eight million. So we paid uh, you know, about a penny on the dollar. And we were, we were very aggressive um, you know, up until April acquiring properties. And now the focus is gonna, focus is going to shift to exploration, divestment, joint ventures. Um, we've successfully raised $14 million in the last three years and spent $10 million on exploration. 
So the focus here is our largest shareholder, Ascot, is reactivating one of the richest gold mines in the world, the Premier Mine. And they've been growing through taking over other companies in the area, so uh, the neighboring properties, the neighboring mines. So Ascot has spent $70 million acquiring our neighbors. And again, in the context of Strike Point, who's got a $6 million market cap. Um, so Ascot's a large shareholder. Uh, their CFO, Carol Lee, is, sits on my board of directors. And um, they've recently acquired Red Mountain. Why that's significant to us is our Willoughby property is four miles from Red Mountain. It's set in the same rocks. And um, we are very lucky to have the, the team that proved up 800,000 ounces at Red Mountain and successfully sold the company to Ascot, now working on uh, exploring, developing, and building resources at Willoughby. So Rob McLeod, who is the CD CEO of IDM Mining, is a technical advisor of Strike Point, and we've got uh, the entire uh, IDM technical team working on exploration of the property. We've also got a high-grade uh, silver resource stage property, uh, Porter Silverado, which is on the left-hand side of the page, uh, which currently has about a 12 million ounce uh, resource. So the, the opportunity at Willoughby, um, we've, we've inherited a tremendous amount of historical work. There's been about 120 drill holes on the property and a tremendous amount of success in the past. Uh, there's an adit that runs into the side of the mountain as well. And uh, what, who you see pictured here is the CEO of Sabina Gold and Silver, Bruce McLeod, who uh, him and his father, Don McLeod, were the last explorers on the property back in the mid-1990s. Um, just a little bit about the, the geology of the area. Um, the big copper and gold deposits in the triangle sit am amongst what's known as the red line. So it's, um, it's where two rock types meet. And basically what I'm illustrating here is that um, the mineralization that has been found in the past and that we confirmed this summer falls within that two kilometer window. We've got two zones of mineralization that have been identified that have a 1.5 kilometer strike length. This is what uh, really encouraged Strike Point to acquire the property. As you can see here, there's some extraordinarily high grades. Uh, the Golden Triangle is home to some of the largest, richest gold deposits and silver in the world. And as you can see here with some of the grades we've highlighted in multiple zones, 120 grams of gold, uh, 2,500 grams of silver, over mineable widths. Um, the question mark and the reason for the low valuation in Strike Point is does it hold together? And that's what we're going to be looking to try to prove. Um, with our maiden drill program this year on the property, we drilled 2,000 meters focused on uh, two areas on the property. As you can see, this is rugged, steep terrain. Um, we've got some of the best exploration nips that are built for, for projects um, that, uh, that have these types of challenges. And this is quite common in the triangle, looking at uh, successful operations like Bruce Jack, uh, some of the other uh, very successful projects, they, the, you know, very, very similar uh, types of terrain. Now this is just a drone image here, um, just giving you a look here at uh, drill pad. Um, let's see here. Oh, going back here. Okay, so this is what we accomplished this summer. So if you can see here in the center of the page, a lot of the historical work was in the center. Uh, we validated the historic grades that were hit 25 years ago. But more importantly, if you look at the right-hand side of your page, we stepped out 100 meters and hit 26 grams of gold, 95 grams of silver, over four meters. So we're successfully, you know, with just a, a very small drill program, um, successfully expanding the known area. Uh, we've also got um, three holes to report from the phase one drilling. So we've only reported 50% of our drill results. And the second phase, again, we're finding gold in every hole, ranging from one gram to 100 gram gold. Uh, and we've got another three holes to report from the second phase. In addition to the drilling, we did a tremendous amount of surface work, understanding some of the controls of the property. Uh, the, surface, um, the surface program was focused on the margins of where the ice is melting and receding. Uh, we're finding, you know, we're the first humans to walk these areas that are newly exposed. 
We're finding gold values and silver values up to 70 gram gold, up to 300 gram silver. And um, what we have pending is we have some, we took a rock saw into the property and we've got some channels that are pending. In addition to Willoughby, we've got uh, the Porter Project, which is two past producing silver mines. It overlooks the town of Stewart. It's two kilometers from Stewart. Exceptional high grades. Uh, the opportunity here is this sat in a private company from 1978 to 2016. We acquired the property from Skeena Resources in 2018 as they're focused on SK Creek. And the opportunity here is you had two independent groups that were producing from either side of Mount Rainey. Um, it, this project was never looked at as one continuous structure. And so last summer we got onto the property. We had a lot of exploration success. We found new veins outside of the existing resource area and we're finding grades that are elevated from the average grade in the, in the 43101. Um, lastly, in addition to the advanced stage exploration assets in the triangle, uh, we've got a very, very famous portfolio of properties. Uh, this, pro uh, this portfolio was put together by famed prospector Sean Ryan. Uh, Sean Ryan uh, was the prospector behind uh, uh, the Golden Saddle deposit, which was acquired for $140 million, um, behind Coffee, which was acquired for half a billion dollars. Um, what this portfolio represents is 22 of Sean Ryan's properties that have seen about $32 million worth of exploration grooming. So we are truly in elephant country here. Um, if you look at some of these projects, they're, you know, 80 kilometer by 20 kilometer trends. Um, on the Golden Ollie package, we've identified eight intrusion related gold systems. So what this gives strike point is it gives us optionality, it gives us opportunities to joint venture, divest. We've got large holdings around where Victoria has recently taken a mine into production. Uh, we've got large holdings south of the White Gold District. And the nice thing about this portfolio um, and being in Canada, um, it's in good standing for the next 10 years based on the amount of work that was done in the past. So we don't have to spend any money keeping this in good standing. And then last slide, uh, we, you know, we truly have uh, a commitment to the local communities, the First Nations, uh, the town of Stewart. Um, uh, you know, we've got a, a very, very, very strong ties with the uh, local workforce. So I, again, just in closing, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And I just want to stress the fact that, you know, in, in, my, in my history, in my opinion, in a normal market, um, you know, I know a lot of the companies here are undervalued, but... If you look at just the acquisitions we made, we're trading below those acquisition costs. Uh, we've got cash in the treasury, um, and uh, you know, just I, th I think it, it, the the current share price, the current valuation is uh, just tremendous opportunity. So, thank you, Eric. Well, thank you, Sean. So I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our next speaker, Mr. Tim Williams, Chief Operating Officer at uh, Rio2 Limited, ticker RIO on the venture. Uh, this is the, I guess, uh, the Rio Alto 2.0, so I guess that's where the Rio2 comes from. And so Tim is an experienced uh, uh, mine developer. I should He's got 20 years of experience, particularly in Australia and Peru and in Africa, so very experienced. And uh, this is in the operations uh, sector. So, Tim, the floor is yours. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the, uh, attending the presentation. Um, Rio 2 are sitting on a project in Chile, uh, advanced, explored, resource, reserve. Uh, we're in a permitting phase, ready for uh, anticipating construction. Um, 
approvals in uh, 2021, mid to late 2021. So uh, a little bit different from strike point. So the team is uh, situated in Canada, Peru and Chile. Uh, main office is in, in Peru, where, uh, where we uh, have got the same guys that we'd used in, um, in Rio Alto. It's a strong cohesive team, worked together successfully for the last uh, 12 years. The project in Chile is, uh, is in the Atacama, just east of uh, Copiapur. We have a small team doing geological work and uh, preparation work. Uh, our main core shack is, is down there in Copiapur. And, uh, and uh, the team there are sort of preparing for this summer's activities. Well, there we go. So, um, so the argument for Rio 2, I guess we like to center it around the, uh, the oxide gold resource we have, one of the largest in the world, five million ounces in resource, uh, relatively uh, comfortable location. It is at altitude, but the terrain is very workable. Uh, compared to our experience in much steeper, uh, much more vegetation, much wetter locations in Peru. Here we have uh, this location. Here is our uh, leach pad, a large leach pad project. The mining uh, mineralized zone up in the top of this hill. Uh, it's a volcanic uh, breccia and crushing station conveying to leach pad. The, the construction will be cheap. The construction will be quick and very simple. To that end, uh, we've proposed a fast track. Um, our recently um, published PFS study has a reserve of 1.8 million ounces of the resource of 5 million. Um, we, we've kept that reserve at that number so that we can fast track permitting primarily. Being in the Atacama, water is a major uh, um, bottleneck or an issue to, uh, to develop mining projects. Uh, we have a, a solution to that that uh, hasn't involved any uh, environmental permit requirements. Uh, our PFS, typically we're, uh, we're mining engineers, we don't like to be wrong. We've been uh, fairly conservative in our PFS. We've used cost structure probably uh, significantly higher than what it will be, uh, certainly at the high end of all of our estimates. We've used the recovery values, uh, middle of the road for all of the metallurgical test work we've done. And uh, uh, we think our PFS is probably in the low end of what our outcomes might be. Platform for further growth, we're ambitious. We, we're actively in the M&A space. And we're also very, uh, very conscious of changing the, uh, the large resource more of it into, into the reserve category and, and putting it through the process one day. We want to be a consolidator in the uh, precious metal space and, uh, and we have the capital markets credibility with our uh, history at, at uh, Rio Alto. Batteries might be fading on me. Maybe if I try this one. Oh, there we go. Oh, too many. So the team, um, our board of directors, Alex Black, led Rio Alto, very successful story, um, acquired a project La Rena from Cambio, uh, from Iron Gold, sorry, and uh, I constructed that project in 2009-2010. Uh, uh, we sold that company for 1.1 billion to uh, Tahoe in 2015. Uh, Klaus, our chairman, <coughs> Albrecht, been working in Chile most of his career. He was a CEO of Atacama Pacific, who Rio 2 acquired the, uh, the property from. Uh, the property was named at that time uh, Cerro Maracunga. We've rebranded to, um, to distinguish ourselves from the many other Maracunga projects in the, in the region. Uh, Drago Kisic, um, an economist uh, based in Peru, in Lima. Uh, Sydney in uh, Toronto, lawyer. Ram in Toronto also, um, governance, um, was chief of uh, Ontario Tax Commission and um, 
Dave Thomas, mining engineer. A good spread, good diversity in our board. Um, a lot of history together with this team. Uh, all of us the same group that built the uh, Lorena and Show Window projects in Rio Alto. Capital structure. Um, 180 million shares on issue, fully diluted 240 million, 19% with uh, management and insiders. Um, the usual suspects, Eric Sprott and Van Eck are supporting us. And then we have a 60% other um, trading about 250,000 per day, reasonable liquidity. So the project in Peru and the company in Peru is, uh, is Fenex Gold, uh, renamed from the uh, Cerro Maracunga project. Situated about 140 kilometres east of Copiapor. Copiapor is a significant mining town, about 150,000 people. All of the suppliers are there, uh, all the equipment suppliers, uh, reagents uh, and people resource. Uh, a lot of mining in the area. The, uh, the famous 33 trapped miners, uh, that, that location was only about 40 kilometres from Copiapur. So we, we think we're in a very resource rich area to, uh, to build a mining project. The access up the hill to, uh, to our project is on a, a National Highway 31, which uh, goes through right through to Argentina. Um, paved road, good access all year round. There's a 20 kilometre site access road coming in through this corridor. And then the project is this dark green area in the middle here. So uh, couldn't really ask for a, a, a better location in terms of resources, people, suppliers, and uh, we have power nearby, water being the question mark. We've solved the water issue. I'll give you some more detail on that in further slides. Just a little on the neighbourhood. So uh, our biggest neighbour would be these guys down here, Caspici, Sarah Casale, Barrack, Newmont Joint Venture, over 15 million ounces. Uh, we've got uh, Kinross here in La Coipa, Loba Mate and Refugio, or Maracunga was the name of this project also. Um, uh, Refugio's on current maintenance. La Coipa's in process to uh, start up again for a phase seven. These are all sulphide gold mineralizations. Uh, Vulcan La Pepa also, Yamana and uh, Hochschilds. All sulphide mineralizations, Refugio also. We stand out a little bit in that we're a, uh, uh, a pure oxide deposit, uh, very high in the, uh, in the sulfidation profile. Uh, very little sulfur, no copper, no mercury. Very clean for cheap leach processing and also environmental uh, impact of waste dumps. No acid drainage or, or mercury issues uh, to speak of in this deposit. Got a 16,000 hectare land position, key infrastructure I've highlighted. The water agreement we have, so we're treating water like any other consumable. We're trucking it to site like any other consumable uh, and purchasing it from a supplier fully licensed so we don't have any environmental exposure to our water consumption or our water access. Um, the place is well drilled out. The, uh, the Phoenix deposit's well drilled out. Coming f to our block model, there's, uh, like the previous slide said, 100, 115,000 metres of drilling. Um, our project to date, our reserve project right now, is this blue line, this blue pit. Uh, there we have 1.8 million ounces um, in uh, conventional open pit mining methods. And important here to note, we've got grade, good grades from surface. So when we do start mining and, uh, and leaching, we'll have grades from day one. Uh, no pre-strip, uh, no capital put into uh, bulk waste movement. This black line is our uh, resource outline. We've constrained the resource to a $1,500 gold price. Uh, this is our opportunity and a lot of our work in the next few years as we push this project through permitting uh, and to a construction decision, we'll be working on 
on uh, developing this opportunity as well. In plan view, wide mining areas, conventional open pit mining, big equipment, and uh, little dilution. So again, back to the opportunity moving forward. Measured and indicated category resource, 5 million ounces. Proven and probable in our, our most recent PFS, 1.8 million ounces. There was a previous PFS, which I'll highlight the differences on the next slide. Uh, so we see, uh, we see a lot of potential here uh, to improve on the economics that we've presented uh, in the recent uh, PFS. Mineralized to a great depth, uh, finely disseminated gold hosted breaches. There's no visible gold here. Uh, it's all fine grained in, uh, in laminated black quartz veins. The advantage of fine grained is it's amenable to leaching. Uh, the leach kinetics are, are very good. 100% oxides, no copper, no sulfur, uh, very clean. Uh, a little bit on the geology for those that, uh, that understand uh, the language. So that's what it's all about. There's uh, all those ounces are contained in very narrow veins in a, in a breccia, uh, volcanic hosted breccia, um, low sulfidation horizon, again, negligible copper, sulfur, mercury, very clean and no transitional material. So at depths down to 600 metres, we don't see any uh, transition to sulphur, any reduction in recoveries. Uh, it, the 75% uh, recovery that we've used in our model um, is, is good right through the full depth of the, uh, of the pit that we've identified and the resource we've identified to the deeper 1500 pit. A little bit on the... Uh, on the engineering to date, um, this is a, obviously a constant work in progress, uh, aiming to make improvements. The pits here, stockpiles, leach pad. So we've developed a mine plan. It's uh, got 16 years life. That's 12 years mining and four years stockpiles. Um, the uh, initial grades uh, are a little slightly elevated because we're low grade, uh, putting low grade onto a stockpile. We uh, plan to produce about seven years, over 100,000 ounces. Uh, after that, the average comes to uh, about 85,000 ounces to the life of project. Um, it's unique in the Maracunga. Those other projects all have com complex metallurgy, sulfides, uh, tails dams, these sort of things. We're, uh, we're unique in that it's clean, simple, 100% leach for life of mine, no transition material. No tailings. Uh, we're, we're able to bootstrap this uh, startup. So our uh, initial capex, we're looking at around 100 million, actually 110 million, to uh, to get into production uh, around um, Q1 2022 is our plan. Um, and then uh, our solution for water is uh, bringing it to site like any other consumable, um, and. Uh, and having a cycle, uh, a fleet of truck, trucks coming up from Copiapore where we're uh, just purchasing water like, uh, like a, a consumable. The, um, well, I'll, get, I'll get into some of the benefits or some of the upside work that we've been doing to, uh, to improve on these numbers. But So historically, uh, 2014, there was a PFS. Uh, a large project was identified, 300 million tonnes with a 400 million capex producing about uh, 230 million, uh, 230,000 ounces per year. That had a, uh, a large demand for water supply and a large capex. We wanted to sort of uh, see if we could come up with a, a, a mine plan and a project development plan that was uh, much more in our ballpark of a, something we could finance as a junior company and uh, something that would be a good foundation for us to uh, further develop here and then also give us a good position for, uh, for further M&A or uh, exploration work. So our project has uh, recently published 115 million tonnes higher grade from 0.4 to 0.49 overall. Lower strip ratio, uh, 0.81 uh, compared to a 1.7, much less waste much uh, more economic mining, and a significantly lower capex. We're down to 110 million down here. 
Um, so we think we can get this going uh, in uh, early 22 uh, for first production. Um, and that's, that's sort of the highlights from that slide, I think. We've done all this work at, uh, at 1300. Um, so fairly robust there as well. We're consistent with our theme of staying conservative in our numbers. And uh, we, we want to achieve what we say and uh, we say what we're going to achieve and we achieve it historically. Yeah. We We've been having some screen problems. So yeah, okay. Maybe I moved it. Right at the best bit. Yeah, it's really a screen connection because I can see the stuff over here. Yeah, I think you, I don't know, oh. touch that. I think it was cool. No, I did, yeah. I think yeah. That's what it was. So I definitely think this is the, uh, the issue. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. Thank you. All righty. So you might. So on the back of this uh, 2019 PFS, some of the sensitivities sensitive to gold price, we, we used a 1300. Looking up at 1,400, we go from a 27% IRR to a 36% IRR, um, adding about 60 million to the NPV. Not so sensitive to capital. Um, an increase in 10% of 10% in capital costs. We go from a 27% IRR down to a 24% IRR. Still fairly robust. Uh, quite sensitive to operating cost. All in total operating is about 1.2 billion. 10% uh, reduction, we go from a, again a 27% IRR up to a 35% IRR. So uh, quite good incentives there in, uh, in our uh, project improvement plan. Um, just remember that uh, 1.2 billion all in cost. So our water solution is trucking water 140 kilometres from Kopiapur. Uh, we have a fleet of 25 trucks doing three trips a day to achieve the volume we need of around 25 litres per second on the project. We've um, identified other sites closer to us where we can truck water from. We've also, in conversations with our neighbours on their projects, the ones that are uh, starting up or considering starting up, uh, particularly that uh, Norte Abierto where they're uh, a 15 million ounce deposit, they're considering uh, uh, syndicating with guys with uh, desalination plants and constructing a pipeline. Those, all those things will reduce our water cost or make available much greater volume of water at a good price that, uh, that will assist us in, um, in developing our project and developing our reserve adding a bit more of that resource into the reserve category. Uh, we're also in process of reducing costs in power with discussions with our neighbours that have existing substations available to connect to the grid. The numbers you saw in our PFS are all based on diesel generator power. Low risk, not requiring deals, not requiring third parties to, to, uh, to participate, but expensive. Um, we think by the time we get to construction, we'll have alternate operations, uh, and so we hope to pre present uh, um, upgraded cost model PFS level um, over the next six months. So, back to just to, to wrap things up, what we've done on site since acquiring the project in the last 12 months, we've re-logged, we've drilled 7,000 metres last 
summer. That's the, the Southern Hemisphere summer. We've revised resource estimates and we've upgraded PFS for a new reserve. We're in process of uh, improving our, uh, our water options. We've completed our baseline study and we've prepared, we're in process of preparing the environmental documents for submission in February 20, uh, 2020. We anticipate a 15 to 18 month approval process there. Uh, this summer we're also doing some geotech work and uh, a little bit more metallurgical testing. Uh, all of that goes towards CAPEX, OPEX optimization, um, improving the operating cost, uh, uh, reducing CAPEX at the startup. We think we have some opportunities there, significant opportunities. <laughs> Project finance options will start in uh, late next year into 21 um, on construction finance options. We'll start uh, strategizing and, uh, and seeing how we'll do that and also who wants to be involved with us. Permanent activities, permitting activities are always ongoing. Um, so far we, we think we've got a fairly straightforward project, easy for the authorities to understand, very conventional open pit. Chile's a mining country. Uh, we've had preliminary meetings with authorities in the, uh, in the local province and at the national level. Um, and all the indications are very positive. So I think, thank you very much. Well, Any questions? Very much, <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, cheers. So ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the uh, morning session. So it's the coffee break and we'll reconvene at 11.15. So thank you for your attention.
One, two, one, two, one, two, test, test, one, two. My name is Eric Lemieux, one, two, one, two, test, test. One, two, one, two, one, two, test. Is the sound good, ladies and gentlemen? Ha, ha, there's a pass for us. <laughs> Mag Silver, making promotion for you. Good stock to buy, I guess. Um, but it's really in the back. I really want to make sure, is the sound good? Excellent. Should it be a little bit louder or? Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, that was Danielle Schreck, partner at Equinox, uh, a hedge fund portfolio manager from New York City. Uh, Danielle has been here before. I always appreciate his insight. I'll keep it very brief in terms of his bio because I'm running out of time right now, but the only thing I would highlight is that since the last time I met him, he went from five kids to six kids. So I really want to congratulate him in that regards. And uh, in that, I will applaud you for that, my friend. Because those are the best assets. <laughs> Got it. Excellent. Where's the... This is the reason we need Mag to go up so much. I'll just go like this, yeah. This is good. I've got two computers. I just want to make sure that uh, you can change the slide. If it comes to worse, I think you can... Yeah, perfect. Okay. Excellent. Morning, everyone. Good to see you. So uh, before my speech, I'll just give a quick uh, introduction about our firm. So we're, we're generalists in the space. We don't have to own gold miners, which uh, means we obviously enjoy to be tortured a little bit here. Uh, but it's okay. We're long-term holders. Value investors, I mean, we basically look for really good undervalued companies and uh, think there's, there's value here. One thing we're trying to do, too, on an institutional scale is add more uh, managed accounts. Um, right now, we have about $200 bucks in the precious metal miners and the managed accounts. We have a great experienced team. We have uh, Coel Van Alphen, who just came to us from Tocqueville. She's fantastic. Tocqueville's great. And uh, Sean, the, the, the main PM, he's been here for 25 years, which uh, is pretty impressive. It's his only job. And you guys know the reasons to own gold, so I won't go into it. Um, huh. So uh, maybe everyone's seen the, the, the movie Mad Max. <clears throat> you know, at the, at the beginning of the year, I was in this big room of pretty sophisticated investors, and I made the case for owning gold. And I made all the arguments that you guys know that were on the last slide. And thereupon, a good friend of mine who works at a huge asset management firm accused me of being a prepper. Now, I'm pretty sure in German or in French, there isn't a word for prepper. So if you don't know, a prepper is someone who lives usually in the United States in the hills that has guns and gold and a cabin in the woods. They kind of look like these people here. So the guy said, listen, you're a prepper, you own gold. I said, look, actually, I am a prepper. I've got this huge family, I have a cabin, I've got guns, I've got gold, but you also have bad logic. Because if, making gold, if owning gold makes you a prepper, then therefore some of the most sophisticated investors in the world are also preppers. Why? Because central banks, as we all know, are buying gold at the fastest clip in over 50 years. So the guy got a little embarrassed, and that was the end of the conversation. I told him, too, that we know that central banks aren't preppers, which I think is an important point to make. If you own gold, you're not crazy. You're actually being responsible. And it's ironic that those that are creating fragility in the financial markets, namely central banks, are also the ones buying gold. Now, in our prior speeches at the Swiss Mining Conference, we discussed gold as the monetary future. We spoke about memory, imagination, and the miners. Prince Rupert's drop as a metaphor for the disruption of fragile financial markets. And finally, political disruption upending the status quo of these fragile financial markets, which I must say has happened pretty recently. Now, the consistent theme throughout all of these speeches has been that of the mirage of stability. When overpriced securities and a massive debt load are sustained by accommodative central bank monetary policy, at a time of disruption, eventually something has to snap, just like the Prince Rupert's drop. And like a seductive bird of paradise, it's a pretty cool bird, we're lulled into a delusion 
Gold, on the other hand, a non-financial market monetary asset, provides stability and serves its definition in times such as these. And as we've stated various times to our investors, it's not that we believe the end of the world is coming. We are not preppers. But instead, we believe that the current architecture of the financial system is not sustainable. While the famous Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's partner, thinks you're a jerk if you own gold, that's literally what he says, he thinks you're a jerk, we just think that you understand gold is a necessi necessary diversifying asset for our times. And as I said, once again, it's ironic that those responsible for the current fragility are also the largest buyers. Now, I presume most of you have seen this from the Dutch National Bank. You're not supposed to read from a slide, but it will. This was in October. This is unbelievable. They say a national bank for the Netherlands. Shares, bonds, and other securities are not without risk, and prices can go down. But a bar of gold retains its value even in times of crisis. That is why central banks, including DNB, have traditionally held considerable amounts of gold. Gold is the perfect piggy bank. It's the anchor of trust for the financial system. If the system collapses, the gold stock can serve as a basis to build it up. Again, gold bolsters confidence in the stability of the central bank's balance sheet. It's pretty unbelievable. It's quite an admission. Yeah. Sorry. It's the Big Mac of computers. So <clears throat> let's turn next to ETFs and passive investing. I'm going to tie these two themes in together. I call ETFs, by and large, the big ones, the new activists. Of course, in times gone by, an activist of the old type would build a position, not too big, usually in a specific company, company lobby for change via proxy, groups, moral suasion, and hopefully gain a board seat as he or she attempted to optimize the company and make it more profitable for the shareholders, including themselves. While this was sometimes painful and about 50% effective, usually hit the bottom line, it was great. Large index funds, on the other hand, are the new activists. But unlike the old activists, they're interested in entire sectors rather than just one company. This is a super important point. Passive funds are the index. So even if their proposals hurt the interests of minority shareholders and every company they own, they can still deliver their promised performance. Moreover, to the extent that they have an interest in boosting the prices of their holdings, this interest is best achieved by stifling competition amongst firms rather than improving each individual firm. This was a point that was detailed last year by some academics uh, in the Journal of Finance. This is a pretty famous journal article last year. The case they actually show is the mon monopolistic effects of indexation in the airline industry and guess what happens if you're not worried about activists, the old kind, and you're a manager of an airline company, you get pretty lazy. And guess what happens? We all get hurt as a result. Airline tickets have gone up. Moreover, to continue, given their financial market heft, ETFs can force change via phone call or letter rather than the traditional means of shareholder advocacy and activism. As John Coates from Harvard, posits in his problem of 12, it's likely that in the near future roughly 12 individuals will have practical power over the majority of U.S. public companies, end quote. So whatever cookie cutter ESG criteria these 12 posit will become gospel truth to the market. That's a lot of power. And public markets, in my opinion, were never meant to function this way. Finally, when we add factor-based investing into the mix, we have to seriously wonder if the end of stock picking is dead altogether. Are we therefore, as active managers, the real preppers, preparing for the end of our world? I don't think so. As this graph shows, the dispersion of the mining ETF is massive. This is the GDXJ. It's much more, twice as much, in fact, as the S&P, despite having far fewer companies. Thus, the application of active stock picking is at least the theoretically greater and factors, the classic Fama French factors, simply aren't applicable in this sector at all. So again, to point this out, this is quite unbelievable. If you get the worst performing stocks in the S&P, 
sort them from least to greatest. There are 500 stocks in the S&P, obviously, just about. And the dispersion of this index, the GDXJ, that's only one-fifth the size, is twice as much. It's pretty cool. And this is where I think we need to redefine what ESG is. Hold on. Uh -huh. You know, we're not talking about things which don't add to competitive advantage when we say ESG, and we're not saying it just to raise a bunch of money. But it's needed because the industry is technical and involves qualitative assessment, involves a non-homogenous process. Also, the motivations of governance and the managers are pretty darn important. It's not just your grade and tonnage. So therefore, in conclusion, when we couple the current tailwinds for gold, the miners' undervaluation, and the new activists' indexation of financial markets, which leads to the mirage that active managers are the new preppers, we get an incredible opportunity in precious metal miners. This is why we think it's good, at least for our firm now, to expand our managed accounts. Here's one of the companies we own, which George calls the son of mag. So I don't have to go through it, but there's Silvercrest. It's a pretty well-known company. So one final note, a little bit of encouragement. Don't be afraid to be called a prepper. Gold's one of the few assets that inversely correlates when needed most, and it's no one's liability. So the fact that those adherents of modern portfolio theory don't buy gold says more about their motivations and their weakness. The fact that they don't have a position therein is just a manifestation of the first human tendency in philosophy, which is to keep your job. They don't want to get fired. And it has nothing to do with the assets itself. And, the court, and of course, the, mo the miners are a cheap proxy for the ownership of gold and have yet to incorporate higher metals prices. This makes the long-term ownership of gold miners now more compelling than ever. Looking at the classic adoption curve, therefore, we are the innovators who see the future. We're being responsible. And when we cross the chasm, few will be left to cast dispersions on our investment acumen. That's it. If you have any questions, what happened to the green? Did I go over? Well, because we have computer problems, we have to nice. switch stuff. So, no, you're, you're perfect. I could have gone for 30 minutes, Eric. And I would have liked to have the time to allocate for that because that was an excellent presentation. Thanks, guys. <laughs> No, it worked well. Thanks, buddy. So I'm being very, very careful what I touch because this is. Okay, um, I have the pleasure of um, introducing our, our next speaker, Mr. Paul Harbridge, President and CEO of GT Gold Corp, ticker GTT on the TSX Venture. Paul is a geologist with over 20 years of experience, probably more than that, but in mining and in development. He most recently served as Senior Vice President of Exploration at Gold Corp. We had met in fall of 2016 at the Beaver Creek Show. And uh, with the uh, acquisition of Gold Corp by Newmont in April 2019, well, he decided to get into a new uh, opportunity here. Um, what I appreciate is that he, uh, as a geologist, realizes that the, uh, the devil's in the details. And I think that's something that Gold Corp, uh, unfortunately, in their um, track record, did not do it, apart from giving a lot of money to the CEOs and et cetera. So, sir, podium is yours. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in Geneva to be able to give you an update on GT Gold. I think what differentiates GT uh, from the rest of the junior market is that we've made a major new greenfields exploration discovery as opposed to working historical projects or just prospecting in the hope of finding something. Here's a um, cautionary statement, as we will be making forward-looking statements 
uh, in the presentation. This is a summary of the key points uh, which I'll be discussing this morning. We've completed the prospecting phase, which has resulted in the saddle discoveries. A high-grade, precious metal-rich vein system and a gold-rich copper porphyry with multi-million ounce gold and multi-billion pound copper potential. The discoveries have all the ingredients of a major mineralized system. Married together with great infrastructure and significant up exploration upside, as well as being in the tier one mining jurisdiction of British Columbia, Canada. The project lies within the prolific Golden Triangle, which has seen over 150 mines operating in the region since prospectors first arrived in the 19th century. The Red Chris mine, another gold rich copper porphyry, which began commercial production in 2015, is our nearest neighbor in terms of operating mines. We are blessed by excellent infrastructure. We've got the main north-south paved Highway 37, um, 10 kilometers from the project, as well as a high-voltage hydro power line, which offers the cheapest business power in Canada at four cents a kilowatt. You also note um, it's fairly um, sort of rounded mountains. We're on the eastern side of the main coastal belt. We, we receive less snowfall than a lot of the projects in this part of the world. And at the project scale, we're at about 1,200 meters elevation. And with the glacial action in the area, we've got a, it's basically a hanging valley. This is important because it will facilitate potential underground infrastructure, as you'll see when we talk about the deposit itself. There's also the deep water port of Stewart close by for shipping out concentrate. GT is just over three years old, and we've already made two significant discoveries. The initial, as I mentioned earlier, is this high-grade precious metal-rich vein system. Three kilometers to the east is the Saddle North target, which, is, which was poorly exposed, covered with uh, glacial debris, and was discovered via geophysics. In 2017, the first hole was, uh, showed the potential for gold and copper mineralization. And then in 2018, we put about 10,000 meters in 10 holes, and it's been really this year where we've put in a further 25,000 and really delineated the potential for this high-grade copper porphyry. This image shows the plan view of the drilling. As I mentioned, we've now got 35,000 meters into this target. We've confirmed a broad envelope of gold copper mineralization, 0.25% copper, 0.3 grams per tonne gold, which measures 700 meters in strike length, 600 meters true width, going down to 1,600 meters vertical. Um, it's still open. And within that, we've got a high-grade core, which is 1% copper and more than one gram gold that measures 400 meters in strike length, is approximately 200 meters in true thickness, and is, extends over 1,000 uh, meters. You'll note there's four section lines delineated on this map, which I'm going to show you in the, in the next slides. So that drilling has confirmed continuity of mineralization from surface, as I say, down to 1,600 meters depth, hole by hole by hole, and section to section. You can see in blue, that's the outline of the mineralized envelope, and the red is the, is the higher grade. And again, you can see the continuity of, of the high grade within that mineralized envelope. As I say, section to section. Um, this is an oblique section, so actually the mineralization is plunging out towards you as, as a cylinder of mineralization. But again, you can clearly see that core of high-grade mineralization. And here, here we have it in three dimensions. So basically, it's an elongate cylinder of mineralization. It's been really well-defined, really coherent. You can see that it's amenable to bulk mining, both in terms of you know, open pit potential and, and underground, and as I say, it is, it is open in a number of directions. We've taken an initial 100 kilogram uh, composite sample for across the main um, envelope of mineralization for metallurgical test work, and we've also taken a further 50 gram sample for the high grade, from the high grade core for metallurgical work as well. 
Well, it's early days. It's interesting to make some comparisons. As I say, this is a gold-rich copper porphyry. And what are the others that are similar? We've got um, Newcrest KDM mine, which is their flagship operation in New South Wales, Australia. That produces uh, just over a million ounces a year. And then a, a neighbor Redcrest mine, which Newcrest bought earlier this year, for, or they bought 70% from Imperial Metals for $800 million. What I want to point out here is that's over 30 years of exploration work. And at Redcrest, this is on and off over 40 years of exploration and drilling. And the other thing to point out is when you get these systems, you don't just get single, single porphyry, porphyries. You get multiple of them. And so you can see, you know, in, in two years, you know, we've gone from discovery hole to defining significant mineralization and we haven't drilled outside of that mineralized envelope, and we still have a lot of exploration runway here that, you know, it's within an overall more than three kilometer geophysical anomaly, which uh, remains to be f fully tested. We've had some recent analyst coverage coming out, initiating coverage, and um, they've taken our, you know, the uh, public data and have plotted it up in terms of both open pit and underground. You know, we sit very well with, with our peers, but I mean, the thing to point out here is you look at the jurisdiction that some of these uh, places are. And, you know, again, pointing out, you know, how uh, being in British Columbia, very safe uh, and secure, whereas when we see the troubles that are happening, uh, you know, in Papua New Guinea, in, uh, down in South America as well. Where we really stand out, though, is on the underground, and those, those high grades, both in gold and copper, really stand out against our, our peers and show the real value potential of this project as we go forward. So in terms of you know, exploration upsides, I said here's the precious metal-rich initial vein discovery. There's a value proposition here. It's uh, probably half a million to a million ounces. It's open pitable, generates some upfront cash flow to be able to then stage develop the bigger porphyry through both open pit and underground. And then, as I said, there's the exploration upside. You can see this uh, large geophysical anomaly, the drilling that we've completed to date. There's a hole drilled between the two zones of mineralization, hole 64, came back with significant gold and copper mineralization at the end of the hole within a porphyry and hasn't been followed up. The other way that really excites me as a target is Quash Pass. That's approximately eight kilometers from the saddle zone. And this is, it's a seven kilometer long soil anomaly, continuous soil anomaly, anomalous in copper, gold, and silver, as well as uh, a very significant geophysical anomaly. And you can identify these circular features in the geophysics. And our thesis is that we've got a number of these porphyries that are coming up. Um, and so we feel that we've got very significant exploration upside as well as what we've already defined to date. We've got a dual strategy. Firstly, it's about putting all of the technical data together into a coherent geological model. And the other thing that really struck me was the quality of data that's being collected by GT. We've got age dating. We've got hyperspectral work from core scan. Obviously, got the assay data. We've got four acid digest multi-element. We've got whole rock. We've got thin section. All our holes are orientated. And so we've got collectively all of this information that will be pulled together into that geological model, which will form the foundation for an initial resource estimate in June next year. So the model will be complete by uh, March. Uh, resource, resource preliminary, and we expect inferred. There may be a portion of it indicated by June, and then a preliminary economic analysis uh, about this time next year. The second part of the strategy is the ongoing exploration and having a separate team to start following up, integrating all the data layers from the summer field program into prioritizing targets for the 2020 field season. First Nations, uh, a key stakeholder for us. Uh, we have one band to, to work with, the Toltan. They're very supportive of uh, and, and my, of, uh, they're very business um, orientated, uh, long history of being involved in the mining industry. You know, we've got uh, approximately 30% of our workforce as First Nations. 
And out of our sort of just over $10 million budget, uh, you know, two and a half million has gone into the local economy through salaries, contracts, and support to our field programs. In addition, you know, we have a further um, support to, to local um, communities, um, but again, mindful that, you know, at the early stage of, of, of exploration, making sure that, um, you know, we're not over-promising and then under-delivering, but really building those um, strong relationships now as we start to advance the project. And you know, at the moment, we're fully funded. We expect to finish the year with approximately $10 million. We had a budget of $10 million. Um, that's more than enough to, to fund our program for next year. But as always in the junior market, you know, if the opportunity comes, we would look to you know, bolster our our treasury at some point in the future. Um, we've got a good balance of shareholding, both um, you know institution hall as well as you know Newmont Gold Corp came in earlier this year. You know, and I think that's um, you know one of the issues in the industry. You know, at the moment, people are very focused on debt reduction, uh, cleaning up the balance sheet, and um, and free cash flow. But the reality is, if you look at the majors, they have no pipeline of projects. And there's also a lack of good greenfields discoveries out there. And I think that's you know, where we really stand out. As I said, there's um, really positive um, analyst com coverage coming out on us at the moment. And um, you know, that's help helping to support the story that we're talking about. And so in terms of news flow, we've got the remainder of the, dr uh, of the uh, drill holes. That we've got approximately 11 holes, 8,000 metres of drilling to come by the end of the year. As I said, then it's into quarter one with the metallurgical results together with the geological model, the initial resource, ongoing exploration, and the PEA. And thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thank you, Paul. Um, I just, there would be time for a question, a quick question. Would there be anybody? Sir. How far are you from doing a drill in the Arctic Circle? Uh, well, we are not doing a drill yet. We are doing a pre-phase study and finally getting a permit. Yeah. So, really, we're at the advanced exploration stage. I said we, we're going to be taking it through to uh, preliminary economic analysis by sort of towards the end of next year. And then, you know, in my view, we're not going to go to pre-feasibility study because, you know, generally speaking, these large projects, junior, junior companies don't construct them. It's really, you know, f in the hands of the majors. And so it, it's our job to create the value, put this to, together technically, and then, you know, look to, look to sell it on to somebody who would de develop it. And then the problem is that you, you go for pre-feasibility, you imagine, you know, the, even the engineering costs on something like uh, a, an underground block cave for pre-feasibility study is going to be 40 or $50 million. The problem is we do that, and then, you know, a major comes along and says, no, 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 I wouldn't do it like that, I'd do it like this, and they'd redo it. To me, that's wasting shareholder money. We're better off going out and finding the next one and the next one. That's how we'll really create even more value. Excellent. <laughs> All right, well, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Mr. Mark Jarvis, President and CEO of Giga Metals Corp. Uh, Giga is a, a company focused on battery metals. Uh, I note that there's the Turner again nickel project up in northwestern BC. So with that, Mark, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, sir. Let's be careful. Those stairs are very narrow. And okay. This is to move forward. And a red dot. Okay. Thank and you. I'll tell you if there's a two-minute warning there. I'll screen it now. Okay, you screen it. Exactly. Hi, well, thanks very much for being here. Um, with 15 minutes, I don't have time to both discuss the nickel market and discuss our project. 
Um, and I find when I come to these conferences, I run into a lot of people that know a lot about gold or even about copper, but very few people that know much about nickel. So other than to say quickly that our project uh, is up in the same area of British Columbia as the last speaker, we're farther east and we're in the rolling foothills terrain rather than in the mountains. Um, and we're dealing with the same First Nations, the Taltan actually, who, who I agree are extremely business friendly. Um, and what we have is an extremely large deposit of low grade, open pitable sulfide nickel and cobalt. So that's as much as I'm gonna say about the project for now. The nickel market itself uh, is something that you should be paying attention to because it's going through a fundamental shift in supply and demand. Um, nickel has always traditionally traded with GDP uh, because it's part of the steel complex. It's, it's uh, a stainless steel is where 70% of nickel supply goes. So it would, you know, stainless steel goes with the GDP. There's a significant change happening right now that makes nickel a unique demand supply story that I would argue is going to be getting explosive over the next couple of years. So again, just quickly, 5.2 billion pounds of nickel and 312 million pounds of cobalt in the measured plus indicated category alone. That is giant. Uh, and, and that resource is defined by 240 drill holes averaging 400 meters. A lot of work has gone into this. Okay, so. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> uh, what's changed the nickel market is electric vehicles. And, 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 and the rise of electric vehicles means that there's going to be supply constraints on class one nickel, and I'll get into that more later. But I, you know, I would argue that electric vehicles have already reached the tipping point. And uh, this slide is from a presentation about tipping points. Uh, in the first uh, slide, this is Times Square in New York in 1900. And there's nothing but horses and buggies except for one automobile. The next slide is 13 years later in Times Square in New York, and it's all automobiles, and there's one horse and buggy hidden amongst them. So this concept of a new technology coming along and getting adopted and reaching a tipping point uh, is nothing new. Uh, in batteries, uh, nickel is what holds the electrons. Nickel has excellent electron density. And uh, so when you talk about batteries for electric vehicles and you talk about, oh, maybe there's other battery types that will come along and replace lithium ion batteries, well, the experts are telling me lithium ion is it for at least 20 years. And the serious money that's being spent on battery research by the big battery companies is all about trying to increase the amount of nickel in a lithium ion battery as a percentage. It's tricky. Um, you want to increase the amount of nickel in the battery so that your car will go farther on a single charge. The more electrons you pack into a space, the more volatile it is. And so cobalt is used to sort of calm that down. But everybody is moving towards 811, which is eight parts nickel, uh, one part cobalt, and one part manganese. Um, and so in a typical 300 kilogram battery pack, uh, uh, nickel would be about uh, 58 uh, kilograms out of the 300 kilograms. Nickel is, is the material that most people uh, in the electric vehicle manufacturing business and in the battery business are worried about going forward. They're not that worried about cobalt or lithium. Both of those things will get tight again, uh, but nickel is the main concern. And class one nickel, uh, which is 99.8% pure or better, uh, is in short supply and has been uh, not invested, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been very little investment in class one nickel. It's all been class two nickel. And so this shows you uh, uh, LME uh, warehouse stocks. This is all class one nickel. 
metal or briquettes. And we've gone from 450,000 tons of inventory at the LME four or five years ago um, in a market that today is about 2.3 million tons a year. So that's a huge overhang. And that's been drawn down steadily. Um, we have been uh, in a situation in this market where there is more class one being consumed than being produced for a number of years now. And we're just getting to a critical point. Uh, this is from Wood McKenzie. Uh, they figure that by 2025, we're going to need an incremental 300 to 400,000 tons per year of, of incremental class one nickel supply just for batteries. And they think that by 2040, you're going to need an incremental 2 million tons a year just for batteries alone. Um, and again, this is in a market that is currently 2.3 million tons a year. So just to get to where we need to be by 2025, that's like 10 enormous projects. So this, this uh, slide over here, uh, the inside of it uh, shows supply. This shows where the nickel comes from. And the outside of it shows usage. You can see that, that, that stainless steel is still 70% of the use. Class two nickel is ferro-nickel or nickel pig iron, which is a sort of low-grade ferro-nickel. Um, and it is, so it's nickel and iron together. And it's dug out from clays, they throw it in furnaces, and they put it straight into the uh, steel mills. Um, it's perfectly suitable for stainless steel. It's not suitable for any of the other class one uses, uh, including batteries. And by the way, batteries are now 6% of the nickel market Two years ago, they were 3%. We're not approaching a tipping point. We're past the tipping point. You get class from one nickel from two different sources, sulfide deposits, which is what we have, or high pressure, high temperature acid leach deposits, which process limonite. And uh, limonite is basically a clay. So you're getting nickel and cobalt out of clay. You're putting it in autoclaves under conditions of high pressure and temperature hitting it with a lot of sulfuric acid and managing to extract the nickel and the cobalt. It's tricky, it's expensive, um, and it's dirty, mostly. There's, there's, there's a lot of HPL projects that dump their highly acidic tailings in great quantities directly into the ocean. And one of the things that is becoming incredibly important just now, I, you know, and this is feedback I'm getting from LME week two, two weeks ago, is people are increasingly concerned with ethical supply of materials. And particularly in the electric vehicle business, this is being driven by consumers. In North America and Europe, if you're buying an electric vehicle, you're wealthy, you're educated, and you're environmentally responsible. And you're showing your view on the environment by the car that you drive. You don't want any supplies in that car that come from you know, child labor. You don't want anything in your car that's coming from dumping acid directly into the ocean. Um, so this whole concept of ethical supply is becoming increasingly important in the industry and it is being driven by consumers. So this is uh, an opportunity to talk about a bit of history. How much time do I have left? you got seven minutes. Seven minutes, fantastic. This was put together for me by Lyle Tritton, who's an engineer I hired from Sherritt, uh, 25 years in the business, just a brilliant engineer. In his career, he's looked at and done due diligence into every single large undeveloped nickel deposit in the world. And he put this table together for me. If you look at uh, the bottom line, it's capital intensity. This is how much capex you spend per ton of annual production. And you can see that HPAL, and this is HPAL to take to an intermediate product, so it's a valid comparison, is 75 to $90,000 per uh, annual ton of production in capex. We've expressed ours as a range because we're redoing our engineering. When we did our engineering report in December of 2011, uh, it was about $45,000 a ton. And then NPI, nickel pig iron, the range is 10 to $20,000 a ton. Nickel pig iron came along and destroyed the nickel business because nobody can compete with that. 
That is cheap. Um, however, it's not at all suitable for any class one uses. So that's what's now saving the nickel industry again. Um, so our story is we caught the wave of the last super cycle in commodities and we raised enough money to drill all the holes, to drill off our deposit, do metallurgical and engineering work, culminating in uh, uh, an engineering report dated December of 2011 when nickel prices were at $11 a pound. Nickel prices then went down to $4 a pound. And I looked at that and, you know, our big low-grade deposit makes fantastic economic sense at a certain nickel price. We'll never be the low-cost producer, but we will be a very large producer. And um, so I put the project on mothballs, waiting for the market to turn. Commodity markets always turn. I didn't foresee the arise of electric vehicles and the whole battery you know, revolution, but I just had faith that something would happen to turn the nickel market around, and something did happen. So uh, that's why, I mean, we stopped spending any money on this project. I stopped collecting a salary, and we just hung on to 100% of the asset, uh, and we hung on to our listing, and we're now getting active again. This is just about what I was just talking about. Uh, one aspect of this is that we have been funding research into CO2 sequestration into our tailings. If you take a silicate rock and expose it to the atmosphere, it will absorb CO2 and, and convert to a carbonate mineral rather than a silicate mineral. It's happening every day in nature all around us very slowly. Now you take those silicate rocks, grind them up to 80 microns, extract the sulfides as much as you can from them, now you've got a silicate residue at 80 microns, you spread that around, it's absorbing CO2 very quickly. And we're working with a professor named Greg Dippel at the University of British Columbia, who's developed a methodology over the last 16 years to measure the CO2 uptake in the silicate residue. So we want to produce battery metals for a clean future, and we're also going to be sequestering CO2 as we do it. There's a real possibility we could be a carbon neutral mine. So if you want a large, long-life, ethical source of nickel and cobalt, you have to talk to us. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, this is from Wood McKenzie. It's a bit of a busy slide, but um, I'm mostly looking at... Two minutes left. Okay. I'm mostly looking at their incentive price to develop large new projects. They say that the incentive price, and it's mostly HPEL projects, because there's a lot of limonite in the world, is $12 a pound to incentivize building large new nickel projects on average. And their definition of incentive price is a 15% pre-tax internal rate of return. That's a very low bar, uh, but it's sort of an acceptable thing. That's, that's, that's what uh, Woodmac explained to me for large long life projects. They'll take a lower IRR. Well, I looked at that and went, well, that's interesting. Because usually my, uh, my, you know, my personal uh, definition of incentive price is a 20% after-tax internal rate of return. But I took our model, and let me caution you, this is December 2011, it's out of date, it's a valid model, but we have not built in cost inflation or anything like that. So this is just indicative, I want to give you sort of a, you know, a rough sense. I took our model and I calculated backwards. Pre-tax IRR of 15% uh, at, a at a Canadian dollar at 76 cents and a long-term cobalt price of $20 a pound, which I think is a reasonable long-term price for cobalt. And I get 6.85 a pound as the nickel price I need to compete with the HPAL people who, ha who, who need $12 a pound. Now with cost inflation, let's call that roughly $8 a pound. And then for fun, I ran it at $12 a pound, and I get a 29% after-tax internal rate of return, and uh, you know, $2.8 billion of uh, depreciated net present value at a discount rate of 8%. So maybe that's a 24 or 23% um, uh, after-tax IRR. We're still very, very competitive with the HPL project. And the last thought I want to leave you with is leverage. 
when you have a very large uh, uh, resource that is marginal in terms of it won't be the low cost producer, it needs a certain price, it needs a lift in the price to make it economic, that's where you can make many, many multiples of your money if you're right about the underlying commodity. If you're wrong, it's risky. So if you like the nickel story and you want to be conservative, buy Norilsk, you'll do very well. If you want to be, uh, uh, take more risk for more upside, take a look at us. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. So I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Elder Olofsson, who is the founder and CEO of AEX Gold Inc., previously known as Alopex Gold. We're moving from British Columbia to now to beautiful Greenland. Um, Elder is an experienced geologist, um, lives in Reykjavik, Iceland, and I'll keep it short. Elder, the floor is yours. Right, okay, thank you. Hi everybody, thanks for that introduction Eric. I'm pleased to be here. This is my third time in this conference and what I wanted to do this time around, I want to give you a good heads up where we stand in our project, what we have been doing and what our future plans are in the next coming years. Um, so to give you a bit of a background, we are based here in South Greenland. Uh, this is um, in a gold belt which is called Nanortele gold belt. Uh, uh, these, this is a Nanortele gold belt. We have consolidated uh, three companies or, or uh, assets from three different companies into one company, into AEX Gold. Our uh, most advanced asset is the past producing mine Nalanak, which we will focus in starting production again next year through a bulk sample and then in the full production in, in two years time. Furthermore, we have all of our exploration licenses uh, here and around. The more advanced one are the yellow one called the Vaga licenses. And then we applied for new licenses here that have been explored and developed by other people. Uh, all of our licenses uh, uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, set up that they all have outcrops of quartz, rain, granite, diorite, sulfides on surface, high grade. I will go through that a little later. So our opportunity is we are high grade, our resource is at 18.7 gram per ton, so our all-in sustaining cost should be fairly low. We have significantly de-risked it since we acquired the asset in 2013 by doing exploration and development on infrastructure. We have strong cornerstone investors, both in institutional funds, sovereign funds and family offices that have be, been behind the project ever since we started it in a way that every single person has invested in every single round. The management is a large investors uh, themselves, including myself, which I will uh, explain in a bit, of, uh, a bit later. We have significant infrastructure in place. This includes harbor, uh, a 12 kilometer road. We have a processing plant. We have 11 kilometers of underground mining. This means that once we go back into production, we have to spend significantly less than you would find with other uh, developers. Um, we have uh, understood the structure of the deposit, where it is heading. We don't, uh, uh, and we have a, a, a fairly clear idea how, how that looks like. So we have a significant research expansion within us. We built our team since uh, 2013, and they are based. I'm based in uh, Reykjavik, but uh, all of our team, financial team and operational team, is uh, executive team is based in Montreal, Canada. Um, and we have always uh, managed to um, uh, get our targets and, and, and be uh, under budget. Um, we, are in the pos uh, we have the opportunity to produce hydro and wind on site that we can both use for our mine and for the local community that is a town that is uh, called Nanortalik. So we can produce uh, clean ethical gold on site and process that fully. Greenland, give you a quick uh, overview of Greenland. In Greenland, you have 50,000 people who live there. It's a tier one jurisdiction. It's under a Danish flag. 
Uh, they have uh, they built their mining laws based on both Scandinavian and Canadian laws. Um, they uh, uh, they are currently getting uh, subsidies from Denmark, and they see and mining as one of their new um, um, revenue stream to get further independence from Denmark. Okay, so they're really pro mining. Secondly, all land in Greenland is owned by the government, so uh, you don't have any land issues or anything like that. And thirdly, where we are operating, we're not in anyone's way. There, there is no one who lives there. Uh, the south coast is open, uh, open all year round, so there's no sea ice that clogs up there. This is more southerly than Iceland, so to give, give you an uh, idea where we are, it's, this is more southerly than, uh, than Iceland, where I live. So currently the guys are working on site, and we have some little amount of snow, but they're still drilling. Okay? So the Gulf Stream comes up here, heats up this area, there are big fisheries out here and here, so you would have the same Latidus, Helsinki, Oslo, and other areas there, like that. Um, um, our so current price is 41 cent. We got listed on 50 cent, so we're a little bit under, under our listing price at the moment. Uh, we have uh, not much volume at the moment. That's due to the fact that you have a large portion of the stock is held by these larger funds, which are supporting them every single time. There's no debt or anything like that. So far, we raised 15 million since we got listed. Uh, we just raised 5 million in, Ju uh, uh, in July. And that, uh, the largest uh, contribution there was the Danish Growth Fund and Greenland Venture Fund, which are growth funds, last sovereign funds of Denmark and, 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 uh, and Greenland. Um, we have, I own 12% myself, and Graham Stewart, our new chairman, he owns 2% himself. Uh, and we have, um, uh, our incentive is to make sure that uh, our capital is spent mostly into the ground in building the project rather than any kind of a too high salaries or anything like that. Cyrus Capital is our largest uh, shareholder on 20% uh, share and they're a $4 billion fund out of New York. Um, so our team, uh, my background is, is that I've been in geothermal, oil and gas and now mining. I founded my first company back in 2011 which is called Orca Energy. Uh, we built up district heating networks in China and in Southeast Asia. I, uh, together with Sinopec Group and, and, and City Capital and other funds, I exited that investment together with my people in 2012. I then founded uh, this opportunity, and I basically in every single round I spent my own capital in building this project up. Uh, we got uh, Ingrid Martin, which is our CFO, and Martin Mernard, which is our uh, Chief Operating Officer. They're both based in, in Montreal. It's very much important to us to do everything on a high standard in a way that uh, we think is uh, the best way to do it. Uh, behind them you have GE Mining, who is our advisor in, in Montreal, also to assist us on all, all front. Joan Plant is our corporate secretary. She was with our predecessor, who, uh, uh, and, and she ha is involved with all day-to-day -day dealing with uh, both the government and uh, licensing, etc., etc. If I didn't say it earlier, we're fully permitted also in the Nanlak mine, which is important as well to, to start production. We then have Graham Stewart, which is our chairman. He uh, uh, was the CEO of Faro Petroleum that just got sold in, uh, uh, or there was a hostile takeover in, 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 um, in February this year for 800 million. So we have people who have built up companies, developed them, and executed the sale on them, which is important. Furthermore, we have dif uh, different uh, skill set in our board. George Queen is a lawyer. Robert Menard is a, our, our, our mind builder who's been with Campior, Newmont, and others. And George Foley is our, our corporate director. So the development strategy for Nanlak is very simple. Uh, we have taken out this year more than 20,000 tons of uh, ore that we have uh, the opportunity to ship out early next year for, uh, uh, bulk, as a bulk sample for trial processing. Uh, we finished the road also in Nanlak and to build the bridge, so that, that is, uh, is quite clear mission. Uh, next, we are also doing a full audit on the processing plant, and we have the opportunity to take both remnant resources and the current uh, uh, tailings and reprocess that. So over the next two years, we will be looking to both produce from a bulk sample and to run the processing plant on, on the ground. The idea is then to develop into the new orsons that we have in front of us, to uh, then go into full production uh, after that. 
Uh, on the exploration properties, uh, we will be doing advanced geophysics, we will be doing some drilling to develop them further, and the idea that we can have multiple deposits like Nanlak or even bigger deposits. We have all of it. So this is the Nanlak mine. This is a road that comes from the harbor here all the way up here and into the mountain. The mine starts in 220 meters and goes all the way to 720. The, the deposit is like a piece of paper that goes through here and it's, all, uh, it's, it's basically continues all the way to the top and on the other side. We have 263,000 ounces as a resource, which is a modest resource, but we have uh, more than uh, 1.2 million ounces in an exploration target, which I'll explain in a minute. Historical production was uh, between 50 to 70,000 ounces a year at a diluted grade of 15.4 gram per ton, and by that time they were shipping, directly shipping out the ore to Newfoundland. So uh, there are significant upside in our, in our uh, internal models of, of doing actually a little bit better than that, even though this was a very profitable and good operation at, at that time. Um, so this is looking at the mine uh, you know, directly ahead. So you would have mine workings which are here, south block, target block, and mountain block. In all of these area here, you know, uh, you have a, a deposit in front of you, a vein in front of you, which they stopped mining because it was below 15 or 10 gram per ton in those days. This was in the day and age of $300 gold price. What happens in this mine is that over 50 meters, the vein pinches and swell. It drops in grade down to 10 or 15 gram, and then it goes up much higher. We have, uh, it's the same here in mountain block and in south block. What we have been doing in our first year, we did sampling here, and we found the vein continuing all the way through the mountain for one kilometer. So you can see the uh, phenomenal grades here. The second year, we started drilling here in the mountain, mountain uh, in, in the south block, and we've done three consecutive drilling seasons to ex understand the structure there. We are more concerned and focused on the structure than necessarily grade. This is this has a high nugget effect deposit, which means your grade is going to vary a lot. Our next stage is to start driving on this structure, which is very clear and, and straight, and then we are able to actually turn some of that uh, target into a resource. We, uh, uh, well, that, that's our hope. So this is, uh, they did a long haul stopping on this uh, deposit, which is uh, explained here. So you do tunnel here, 10, minute, 10, 10 meter below, you do another tunnel, and then you blast the material, and then you track it out. All of this mine infrastructure to get from 220 meters down here all the way to 720 is in place in the mine. And this is why all of this infrastructure is so important for us, because we don't have to build it and we can uh, utilize that to extend new ore zones. Um, these are our licenses in this kind of a belt. This is the same gold land that runs through uh, Sweden and partially Finland as well. So and we have taken up all of the licensing in this region. To give you an example, every single license here, they have, uh, you have Kangaluku that used to be owned by Gold Corp back in 98. They have 120 gram per ton over 1.2 meter, and that is 700 meter long. Uh, you have, in all of these different zones where you have veins or sulfurs at body of high grade on surface, what we haven't defined in this deposit is how large they are. Then we have to step out and drill them. But it's, it's all there. That's, that's the, the beauty about it. The most advanced one is called Amphibola Ridge, which I will show you right now, just to give you an example of how Greenland is perspective. This Amphibola Ridge, you have three veins, uh, which are similar to Nanlag, that goes through here. And they are running on, uh, you know, the highest sample taken from a quartz vein here is, is uh, 2,500 gram per ton. You have uh, more than two, uh, 30 meters of channel sample of 70 gram per ton. And actually, in between those veins, you have granite diorite, this is the uh, uh, altered granite diorite, and that's also mineralized. So in feminine zone, you have grab some of 12 gram per ton, Urizen zone, you have 14 gram per ton. So either we have veins, which would be more nanolux, which we actually can just build up a road and go here and, and start doing a bulk sample here, or even define it more into an into into underground mine, or potentially you have a mineralized structure on and off throughout this whole two kilometers, and that's what we want to test. Then this obviously will be much, much larger. But my point here is that this is surfacing. And this is something, you know, we're just scratching the surface. O over 20 kilometers, you have these high-grade veins and structures coming through. This is a kind of a structural shear zone that goes through all of South Greenland. And, and so it has a significant upside. 
Our most early stage uh, exploration target is Tartok, which is a little bit further away. This is our key and greenstone gold belt. Again, this was explored in the past and has some uh, phenomenal grades and, 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 and potential. So the opportunity here is that we can develop fairly quickly into positive cash flow already from what we have in, on site right now. We have the infrastructure, we have the team, uh, we have the people on ground that, is, uh, that, that can work in the mine and then used to work in the mine. Uh, there is a hydropower plant already in the region with a local power company. There is an international airport built by the American called the NASA Suwak. Uh, so you, we can increase our resources by step by step, but at the same time generate very good cash flow from a high-grade resource like that. So we believe that this opportunity um, has, has a lot of merit uh, in conjunction with other opportunities. At least we haven't gone down the route of what David Finch mentioned earlier to to merge with other companies because at the, this point in time we don't see many opportunities that, that have the same potential at the moment. But obviously we're married to the story, so. <laughs> but thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Perhaps some, uh, perhaps some full disclosure. I um, do cover AX Gold. So do you, if you do go into their website, you'll see uh, the analyst, Eric Lemire, and you'll have access to my February 2017 initiation report. Right, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Mr. Rob Brueggemann. Uh, he is an investor relations manager and I would say corporate development also for Tinka Resources, who are um, active in Peru. So we're going from beautiful Greenland to beautiful Peru. And so um, Rob uh, uh, has been involved with different facets of the industry, but I'll keep it very short. Um, he'll introduce the Aguaclica project. So Rob, if you want to come over here. Hi, everybody. I apologize for my voice. I came down with a cold at the beginning of the week, which is untimely. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about Tinka. And really, Tinka is about one major asset, which is the Ayahuelca project in central Peru. And Ayahuelca is uh, discovered in 2012. Originally, this was a silver deposit on the project. In 2012, they found zinc and through various drill campaigns now it's grown into one of the biggest undeveloped zinc resources within the junior so currently um, there's about seven billion pounds of zinc in the ground on this resource um, if you don't follow zinc zinc currently trades at about dollar 12 per pound so in terms of value um, at least in the ground, you're talking seven, eight billion dollars of value and also some potential or significant silver potential there as well. So, so far in the past four years, the current team has been focused on expanding this resource, which was a major discovery. Um, and then for the first time, we did an economic assessment that we put out in July of this year. It showed that this has the potential to be a top five zinc mine in Peru which is significant because Peru is the second biggest zinc producer in the world after China. Um, but yet the capex on the project is quite reasonable at $262 million. And that's because there's excellent infrastructure there. The after-tax NPV using an 8% discount rate was $363 million, And that gave us an IRR of 27%. So attractive economics on the project. Although as you'll see, we think we can even do even better. There's also the Kolkipukro silver zone, which has about 18 million ounces of silver. That was not part of the PEA, so that could be a separate project as well. Just a little bit on the company. Uh, so we trade on the TSX Venture, um, as well as the Lima Stock Exchange and the OTC. We have 265 million shares outstanding, and the current market cap is about $40 million. Uh, Cash-wise, we had 8 million 
in the middle of the year. Currently, that's about six million. And so without drilling, we can make that last for some time. Uh, we have very good institutional shareholder base, Sentient, which is a private equity group out of Australia. They own 24% of the stock. The IFC, which is a part of the World Bank, owns 11%. Then we have some other investors like JP Morgan um, and other European North American funds in there as well. Analyst coverage from three Canadian brokers at GMP, Canaccord, and Industrial Alliance. The team is headed, it's very much a geology, exploration geology focused team and very much focused on Peru. Uh, the majority of the team is actually based in Peru, but it's headed by Graham Carmen, who has a PhD in geology, um, has spent the majority of his career in Peru looking at various projects, but a lot of zinc projects. Um, and then before that was with Rio Tinto. The exploration team is headed by Alvaro Fernandez Vaca. He is Peruvian. Um, he's worked around the world, but he's, uh, he's based in Peru and heads a team there. I think it's worthwhile to touch on a little, little bit about zinc. Um, zinc was one of the favored metals in 2017 and the first part of 2018. Prices went up significantly, and that, that's because there was a supply shortage. Um, China is the, the biggest consumer of zinc, so they account for about 50% of all demand. And so given the current trade war between China and the US and some slowing of growth out of China, we have seen demand for zinc take a bit of a hit. And so prices have come down. Um, in the last about a year and a half, prices have declined from a high of $1.65 to about $1.13 currently. Um, but what you'll notice on the right-hand side of the slide is inventories continue to decline. So inventories have been dropping since 2013, and um, we continue to see that trend. So what we believe is even if demand doesn't pick up, and we do expect, we do expect demand to pick up, um, whether this trade war gets settled or not, but um, even if that doesn't, uh, there's just a lack of new supply in the pipeline, and so we think this project fits very well um, for production in the next few years. Yes, skip over a couple of these slides. So this shows the the resource growth, with the blue circles being the inferred resource, the red being indicated, which is a higher certainty, uh, just because of drill spacing. But what you can see is basically over the last four years, the resource has grown fourfold through drilling. In the process, the grades have also increased, and in large part, this because of a discovery at uh, a new zone in 2016. As a result of that drilling, we now control the biggest zinc resource within a junior. And so I think that's very significant, uh, both in terms of the value within the company, but also I think it makes it an attractive takeout candidate. That said, the valuation is very compelling. This was done when our share price was 25 cents. It's currently 15, so the, the metrics are even better. Um, but relative to other zinc development companies and zinc producers, it's, uh, the valuation is very low. As I mentioned, we did a PEA that we put out in July. So that envisioned an underground mine with a 5,000 ton per day plant, 21 year mine life, which is significant but quite reasonable capex of 262 million US. The pre-tax NPV was over 600 million, then after tax it was 363 million with a 27% IRR. Just put some numbers around that. If you look at the total cash flows over the life of mine, uh, pre-tax it's over $1.6 billion and after tax it's over a billion dollars. So this is a big mine. Within the PEA, this is a, um, a sensitivity chart. So it just shows if you adjust various factors, what happens to your NPV, with the base case being the black line, which is 363 million. But what we want to highlight here is if you increase the zinc grade, because obviously we can't control the price, but if you increase the zinc grade, 
um, let's say you increase it by 20%, the NPV actually goes up by 200 million. The reason that's significant is based on the drilling that we've done this year, we've hit some very high grade zinc zones. So we actually think the, the resource grade is gonna go up. And what we're currently thinking, given the price weakness in zinc, is we're looking at potentially optimizing the PEA based on the new drilling to see if we can take the, the PEA and make the numbers even more robust. In the process too, because of the nature of the deposit, the high grade tends to be in the thicker zones. And so potentially we can reduce the mining costs just by focusing on those zones as well. And obviously reducing the operating expense will also improve the economics. Let's give you a brief overview of the project. So we're, Peru is very much a mining country. You can see on the right hand side, it's second in the world in terms of zinc production, copper production, as well as silver production, and a significant producer of tin, lead, and gold. We're located in central Peru in the Andes. Um, it's basically a base metal belt there. So if we zoom in on that area, you can see we're surrounded by a number of mines. And because of that, the infrastructure is very good. We have road access to site, um, and there's a lot of mining expertise and all the services you require to build a mine. This, on the left-hand side, you can see the, the claim boundary that we have. We have about 170 square kilometers. But so far, we've really been focused on less than 10% of the project. And that's what hosts originally the silver deposit, which is called Colquipucro, as well as now the, the zinc deposit. And underneath the zinc is actually a separate deposit, and that's this pink hashed area. And that's a tin resource. Now the PEA we did only focus on the, the zinc, which does come with some silver as well. So it didn't take into account um, the separate silver resource, nor the tin. So this is the current resource prior to this year's drill program. So what you can see is in total, we have an indicated resource of 11.7 .7 million tons, another 45 million inferred. So a total of about almost 57 million tons. What we want to highlight here is we have four separate zones um, called Southwest, East, and Central, but the, the key zones really are South and West, which make up the indicated resource. And what's important to note is the grades. So 7.6% zinc in South Ayawilka, uh, the inferred portion is even higher. And then as you'll see this year, the drilling we did is even higher grade than that. And then West also is about 6.5% zinc. So we're looking at potentially optimizing the PEA to focus on these zones um, as opposed to Central and East, which are closer to 5%, to further improve the economics. The reason that's significant as well, so this is a, a long section through the deposit, and it's a carbonate replacement, so the carbonate being limestones, which is this blue rock here. So this is the deposit, it's about two and a half kilometers um, from end to end. But the best portion of the deposit is South Aowilka and then in behind this is West Aowilka. So these are the high grade zones and they're also very thick. So this is approximately 150 meters thick. So you get the best grade, the easiest to mine. From surface at the top, this is about 125 meters. So this is very, as an underground mine, it's very accessible. Just put a ramp in through the side of the hill you do bulk mining on this and extract it. In terms of infrastructure, um, we've got power lines right across the project. There's road access, as I mentioned. There's plenty of water as well. Um, and we've got very good community relations. So I think it, as a potential mine, it certainly checks all the boxes. So last thing I'll focus on is the uh, the drill results from this year's campaign. Um, as mentioned, we have a resource that's about 7% zinc, but what you'll notice here is one of the most recent holes we drilled, which is at South Aowilka. Collectively, there's about 80 meters that was intercepted at roughly 12% zinc. So this is the type of material that we wanna get after. 
<clears throat> and this is the reason why we're looking at optimizing the PEA. Um, these are very nice grades, very nice thickness. Um, again, close to surface, so easy to mine. Two minutes. Okay. So this is really what we're doing next. Um, we've done the PEA, but we're looking at optimizing that, making the numbers even better. Um, until the market improves, we're going to do some targeted drilling, some exploration. Then beyond that, uh, pre-feasibility study with infill drilling, feasibility study, and potentially production in 2023, which is market dependent. Just to touch on the silver deposit we have as well, um, as mentioned, it wasn't included in the PEA, but we have a, a separate deposit. It's about 18 million ounces in higher grade. It's right at surface. It's open pitable. So the higher grade material sits in the red colors here, surrounded by a lower grade halo. On its own right now, we don't think this is, it's not viable as a silver mine, but if you build a silver mine, certainly there's value within that. Um, really not reflected either in the PEA or in our share price. Uh, community relations, regardless of where you are, it's always very important. Um, where we are, we don't have any communities on site, um, but we do have three communities around us. It's community owned land. We're the biggest employer in the region, um, and we certainly put a lot of time and effort into community relations. Uh, and I think that's going to pay off. So we have, uh, we have a good social license. We're guided by the IFC as well, which is an 11% investor in the company. And uh, potentially there's, there's excellent opportunity for us to help the, the local communities. So just in closing, the biggest thing is there's scarcity value in this project. You don't often get a project that has size, grade, infrastructure, and is in a in an ideal location like Peru. So we have that. We have full ownership. We own 100%. There is a 1% NSR royalty, but we can buy it back for a million dollars. And we have a low valuation. So I think it's, it's a good time to buy Tinka. Um, zinc prices will come back, but even if they don't, we think this is one of the best development projects in the pipeline. And we still have cash. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Our next speaker will present Cabral Gold, symbol CBR on a Toronto Stock Exchange venture. We have the pleasure of welcoming Alan Carter, President and CEO, who has over 25 years of experience in mineral exploration and development. He spent several years with Rio Tinto in South America in the United Kingdom, and most recently as expert manager in Bolivia. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Eric said, my name is Alan Carter. I'm the president and CEO of a, uh, a gold company. Um, we have an asset in uh, Brazil that we're working on. I've been working down there a long time. In fact, most of my career has been in South America. I don't have a lot of time, so if there are any questions afterwards, please come and grab me. Obviously, we're out on the other side of the corridor. Okay, so in summary, um, as I said, we have around about a million ounces, 20% of which is, uh, uh, is indicated and the rest is inferred. Uh, we've made several drill discoveries this year. Uh, we're on a, currently on our second campaign. Earlier this year, we've uh, we tested a new zone called Mashishi, and the standout drill result from that campaign was 3.4 meters at 36.9 grams. There's another one similar, not quite as good, but still very good, Mora de Lua. Um, those two targets need follow-up drilling. Um, 
Prior to that, uh, we, have, we already had, prior to this year, a number of other areas where we have very good real results outside the million ounce resource. As I said, these are two new discoveries. Um, we've got, there's two other areas which I'll show you in a moment that, uh, where we've drilled 39 metres at 5 grams and 27 metres at 6.9 grams. And last week, uh, we started announcing the drill results from the current campaign. And uh, the best hole that we got of, five, of the first five holes, and that campaign is ongoing, uh, was uh, 7.6 metres at 18.5 grams. So a lot of high-grade mineralisation here, and that is really the focus for this company. Um, we do have a low-grade resource, but there is an awful lot of high-grade, as I'll show you. This project is very large. It's 36,000 hectares. It's district scale. Um, and uh, previously, we've been directly involved as a management team in five discoveries in Brazil. Um, and cumulatively, they would total five million ounces. One of those is in production. Two are going into production next year. And the fourth one um, is fully permitted. Capital structure, very briefly, 61.7 million shares issued, 92.7 fully diluted. This is the team. As Eric said, my background is in South America. I've got a PhD in gold. Um, we've got another guy here, Adrian MacArthur, who has a PhD in gold too. Um, and then uh, just, just about everybody here on the team has got some experience, considerable experience in Brazil in particular. Uh, word on the share structure. Um, so I mentioned we've got 61 million shares out. Um, we have just under $3 million now in cash. Um, so the enterprise value on that is around about uh, 3.5 million US. And as I said, we have a million ounce resource here. The largest shareholders, well, board and management now control about 24%. That figure's a little bit out of date. Um, I've bought uh, in the last sort of uh, few weeks about 600,000 shares. So um, I am the largest shareholder. And uh, in the la I think uh, one other thing, you won't be able to read this right at the bottom here, but uh, in the last financing we did in July, it was just over $3 million. I put in $300,000. The financing prior to that, which was just under $2 million, which was last year, I put in 200000 So I'm certainly putting my money where my mouth is. That's a big chunk of change for me. Um, uh, also on the shareholder re register here, we've got Dundee Goodman with about 12%, a Toronto-based group, a group in Australia called Phoenix with about 5%, uh, Cisco and Royal Bank of Canada. Okay, for those of you who are not too familiar with Brazil, and I do get asked this quite a lot, there are a lot of large companies working in Brazil, mining in Brazil. In fact, Kinross's largest mine is in Brazil. It's over 500,000 ounces a year. Um, Yamana is also very active here. Uh, London Mining, which bought one of Yamana's assets earlier this year, uh, is also now very active. They paid a billion dollars for this. So if you're wondering if this is a, a, a reasonable place to, to invest, you might just want to go chat with Lucas Lundin. He certainly thinks it is. Lee Gold, they've got three mines in operation here. Ross Beattie's up here with Equinox. Um, he's just put Arizona back into production. And Great Panther Silver also has uh, the Tucano asset here. And there are others. I won't run through them all. We are up in this belt here, which is a pretty special belt. And that map really doesn't do this, this belt justice because this, ladies and gentlemen, is the site of the world's largest gold rush in history. So we've all heard of the California gold rush of uh, 1848. This gold rush, which started in 1978, was 10 times larger. So I've been obsessed for the last sort of 12 years of my career with this area because there's so much gold come out of it and come out of the streams. There was 20 to 30 million ounces mined here during the gold rush. In fact, it was probably a lot larger. And um, uh, um, obviously that gold is all placer gold. It's coming out of the stream. So it's, been, it's gold that's been eroded from from hard rock sources. And as I said, so far we've found five of those sources. There are undoubtedly a lot more. Now, this one here, the, the, the key asset in this company is called Kuyu Kuyu. This is where we've got the million ounces. And this place was the site of the, the largest, it was the largest area of placer workings in the whole belt. It produced approximately 10% of the total. Okay, this uh, map is a very fairly complicated map. We've got a major north-south highway coming through here. Our neighbours are Anglo-American, El Dorado Gold. I was directly involved in the discovery of El Dorado's project through here. There are five uh, uh, gold projects in here, two of which are in production, uh, the largest of which is now owned by El Dorado. And as a team, we've been involved with three of those. 
Uh, Anglo-American, Nexa, the big zinc company is also exploring up here. Uh, Nexa and Anglo are mainly exploring for copper. And as I said, this area in the middle, Kuyu Kuyu, was the largest area of, of uh, placer gold production during the gold rush days. Okay, this is the, um, our project relative to, um, to uh, El Dorado's project, which is in blue. About 200,000 ounces came out of their area from the streams during the gold rush days. Um, there was 2 million ounces come out of the area of our area during the gold rush days. So it's got a much larger footprint, and it is a... Oh, sorry. It is... Di take that. It is district scale. Now, let's just go back one. So, the key... Th these three slides, beginning with this one, are probably the key slides in this presentation. Uh, all these yellow sort of uh, squiggly lines here are streams that were mined extensively during the gold rush. So I'm going to zoom into this area and have a bit of a closer look. Now, what I've done here is that the scale bar here on the bottom left is three kilometers, so you're looking at an area about nine kilometers across. All these areas which I've outlined in white were mined extensively. They're all stream beds. They're all the, the small miners back in the day were, were mining gold from the sand and gravel here. And the streams are draining from up here in the northwest down towards the south. In fact, the drainage comes down through here. Now, um, so the question was, there's two million ounces come out of the streams here. Where is it all coming from? The first deposit we found is in here. It's called Central. Um, it's a, right now, it's about half a million ounces. We think that's going to grow considerably as we move forward. And I'll explain why in a moment. So a lot of the gold coming down this stream is coming from this deposit. Then we found this one, Morera Gomez. It's five kilometers away. It's an east-west trending structure. Got a little bit of different orientation. And again, a lot of the gold coming down this stream is, being, is, is obviously being eroded from this deposit. But the bulk of the gold mined here is not coming from either of these two deposits. So we think we found with these two deposits probably about the source of 10 or 15% of the gold that was mined in the streams here. Obviously, there's a lot of gold, all this gold up in the northwest here, all the gold coming down these two streams, all this gold coming from this Mirabeau area in the south is not coming from these two deposits. Um, now, we've done a little bit of drilling, not a lot, but a little bit um, of reconnaissance drilling outside of these two areas. Um, uh, you can see some of the drill results. Again, you probably won't be able to read them so, from there, so I'll read them for you. 500 metres to the southeast here, we've got a drill hole that's running 27 metres at 6.9 grams. Again, it's outside the resource. 39 metres, three kilometres away over here, 39 metres at 5.1 grams, 47 metres at 1.8. Uh, this is the new discovery we made um, earlier this year, Mashishi. We're very excited about it. We think it could be at least another half a million ounces, um, 3.4 metres at 36.9 grams, um, 2.8 metres at 19 grams. There are they're not all on this map, actually. There's eight or nine now, I'm kind of losing count, where we've got economic drill intercepts, and most of them very high grade, outside of uh, these two deposits. Now, the host rock here is actually granite. It's very much like the sort of rocks you've got here in Switzerland. Uh, okay, well, it doesn't matter. Okay, the... Um, the uh, it's died. Um, so the rocks that um, uh, we've got in this part of the world are granitic rocks, and uh, uh, airborne magnetic work is very, very useful uh, in defining these gold deposits. And um, we've got a fantastic airborne survey, and if this was working, I could, uh, I could show you. It's got lots of great structures on it um, with lots of upside here. Um, so uh, I think the key points from my message, and it's, it's kind of a little bit tough given that this is the style. Key points of this message, I think, for you to take away in this is we have a track record in Brazil. We've been directly involved in five discoveries. There's 61 million shares outstanding on this company. The CEO, i.e. me, is the largest shareholder, and I've, 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 so far I think I've invested about 1.4 million of my own money in that. That's a huge chunk of my net worth. Um, we are uh, drilling, so there's a lots of news flow coming out on this. As I said, we had some very good results last year. Um, we're surrounded by major companies, and uh, how long have we got left, Eric? Let me tell you that. You've got three minutes. Three minutes. This is a mag map. Again, come see me uh, later if you, have any if you have any time or interest. Um, this is a typical cross-section through the deposits we've got. They're, 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 they have, all have high-grade cores. 
and that's what we're focused on, and they're surrounded by low-grade envelopes. The resource is actually on the, on the, on the low-grade envelope, and so now we're working very hard to, to, to drill off these high-grade centres to these things. A um, lot of native gold here. Uh, I've got a nice piece. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, it's packed now, but it's in my suitcase. But, um, you know, that's my thumb, so there's a thumb, some, that, that's quite common, actually. Again, this talks about these uh, high-grade intercepts that we've got outside the resource. Uh, we're currently drilling within one of the known deposits because there are three high-grade pods. Now, until this year, there was 180 historic drill holes drilled here between 2008 and 2012. 60 of those have drill intercepts above 10 grams a tonne, which is a very high proportion of, um, of drill holes with high grades, obviously. And you can see some of these high grades. Again, I won't run through them, but just to pick a few, a few out, 13 metres at 17 grams, 10 metres at 14. Uh, there's a narrow section there, half a metre at 154 grams a tonne. And as you folks all know, the average grade of the world's gold deposits, all the gold mines around the world, is one gram a tonne. Um, a metre at 85, etc., etc. And it's the same sort of scenario in uh, that, uh, the other deposit, which is this one. I've got a better map of that. So this is the first one that we found. This is the central zone. Again, there are three zones in here with really, really high grades. In fact, there's 34 drill holes here with plus 10 gram numbers in them. Um, and again, very high grades, two meters at 84 grams, uh, 10 meters at 17 grams, uh, half a meter at 52, 4.7 at 23 grams. There's a lot of high grade mineralization. So again, that's what we're focused on. Um, lots of regional potential. We've just been looking in this area in here. You can see there's a lot of high-grade numbers on surface. The blue dots are the drill holes, so obviously there's a lot of drilling in these two deposits. Um, this area up here to the northeast, very, very attractive. Why? Because these streams have a lot of coarse nuggets in them. And here's a picture. Um, this is some of the nuggets that we're getting out. That's a two-and-a-half-ounce uh, nugget. Again, they've been eroded from somewhere. We haven't yet found the source of this, th 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 these nuggets, for example. Um, so, um, so, so, you know, uh, there's a lot of work to do in this area. So I think I'll leave it at, at that, Eric. Well, Alan, it was a very dynamic presentation. <coughs> I appreciate it. Sorry about that. Shake your hand. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this computer, uh, oh, well, we'll see how this pans out. I think when there's a lot of arm waving, it uh, doesn't like it. So hopefully we won't have any more issues. All right, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our next speaker, Tim Warren, who's the president and CEO, as I said, Fiori Gold. Um, Tim is an experienced geologist, uh, professional geologist, actually, I should say, with more than 25 years of experience. Um, he's had several senior leadership roles. So, Tim, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you here on the stage. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as uh, Eric said, my name is Tim Warman. I'm the uh, CEO of Fiori Gold. Uh, Fiori Gold is a relatively new company. It's a, uh, a gold producer, a Nevada-based gold producer, that was formed in uh, September 2017. <clears throat> Pardon my voice. I'm fighting off the remains of a cold. Um, Fiori. Uh, acquired the assets of a bankrupt mining company that was called Midway Gold. Uh, Midway Gold uh, was uh, was active in the uh, in the uh, mid 2000s. Um, they uh, spent about a hundred million dollars building a mine in Nevada called the Pan Mine uh, in 2013 and 2014. Uh, they began gold production in uh, early 2015 in March, and they filed for bankruptcy in May of 2015. Uh, the history of why Midway went bankrupt is a, is a fairly complicated one, but uh, to, to make it brief, essentially Midway had a lot of debt 
a very complicated capital structure. And when they ran into some technical problems as they started up the pan mine, uh, they just simply couldn't get out from under that mountain of debt that was hanging over them, and they went bankrupt. So Midway's misfortune was our good fortune. That mine that, uh, that uh, Midway had built for $100 million in 2014, uh, we purchased it for $5 million from the bankruptcy sale in 2016 and set about correcting the problems that Midway had, the technical problems. We obviously had a lot uh, more flexibility. We have had no debt at the time and we continue to have no debt. So we turned around the pan mine, got it operating. It currently produces about 40,000 ounces a year. Uh, we've been operating it for two years as a run of mine operation, which means that we just blast the rock, put it in trucks, put it on the leach pad, and, uh, and leach it. Uh, we've since put in a crushing system, which we expect to give us higher recoveries, so that in the current fiscal year, which began in uh, October for us, uh, we expect to produce somewhere between 45 and 50,000 ounces. Pan is not a particularly big mine, but it's a profitable mine. We've generated operating cash flow from it. We've generated free cash flow from it. And the whole uh, thesis behind the company was that we would use Pan as a springboard to grow the company. And that's what we're doing. And the primary way we're doing that is reinvesting the cash flow from Pan into our Gold Rock property. Gold Rock is a property that's about eight miles away, about 12 kilometers away, right next door in Nevada. It's fully permitted at a federal level. And that permitting process is a long one in the United States. It took eight years to permit uh, the, the uh, Gold Rock property. And now our goal is to put that into production, which would take the company from uh, sort of 45 to 50,000 ounce producer up to a uh, producer with in excess of 100,000 ounces of gold production a year in Nevada. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about these. In the meantime, we would also uh, like to do some consolidation. There are a number of single asset uh, gold producers um, like ourselves uh, in the US, in some of the uh, surrounding areas, uh, as well as in Canada. And we'd like to merge those together because we think it makes a lot more sense uh, to have a uh, single company with multiple producing assets rather than a whole bunch of single asset companies, much more efficient and uh, much lower costs. As I said, uh, our assets are primarily in the, uh, in, the, in the United States. We have a couple of legacy exploration projects in uh, Chile that we're currently looking to, uh, to JV. The pan mine is a very typical Nevada open pit mine. Um, it's, uh, it's quite simple mining. You can see the drills there, uh, drilling holes that are going to be filled with explosives and blasted later on. Um, you can see from the, uh, the aerial view of the map uh, of, the, uh, of the mine that there are two pits, quite imaginatively named the North Pit in the north and the South Pit in the south. We mine from both those pits. We truck the ore to the leach pad, which you can see in the center. We put a cyanide solution on that, leaches the gold out. That cyanide solution then flows into our plant, the ADR plant there, where we strip the, go the gold out of the solution using uh, charcoal. Actually, it's, a, it's made from coconut shells. And, uh, and then we produce gold dore that we sell. The mine is primarily a gold producer. I think we produce something like 2% of our dore as uh, silver, but it's primarily just a gold mine. I won't go too much into this slide. It really talks about the things we did to de-risk the project, all the corrections we made, all the fixes we did to uh, get over the problems that Midway had when they started the mine and which ultimately led to their bankruptcy. But, but basically it involved uh, a, a lot of drilling to better understand the resource. It involved uh, some changes in the way we mine and stack material on the leach pad and just a lot of really operational fixes, I guess you could say, that, uh, that really turned the mine from a, uh, you know, something that put a, ba a company into bankruptcy to something that generates uh, cash flow today. Um, I will say as well that in addition to operating very efficiently, we're also a very safe mine. Pan has been the safest mine in Nevada for the last four years running, and we have not had a lost time injury uh, in that time. And safety is always a leading indicator of operational excellence. So we can talk a lot about what we did, but I think the proof is in the pudding here. You'll see gold production over the last several quarters. We've been averaging roughly 10,000 ounces a quarter. We had a bit of a fall off in gold production in our last quarter. That was primarily due to the transition from run of mine over to crushing. We had a few hiccups along the way. I thought it would take three or four weeks to do. It actually took us three or four months, uh, but we're now uh, have the crushing system fully up to speed, and we expect that gold production uh, to ramp back up again. All in sustaining costs. Uh, on a corporate basis are roughly uh, between $1,000 and $1,100 an ounce, um, and that includes all of our uh, corporate G&A. Uh, and, and at that kind of cost structure, 
um, we've been able to generate between sort of three and four million dollars a quarter in operating cash flow from Pan. One of the things that impacts our cash flow is the stripping ratio. So the more waste rock we have to move, uh, obviously the lower our cash flow. Um, in general, we're in a slightly higher period of, uh, of stripping right now. So you can see our, uh, our uh, uh, Operating uh, cash flow came down a bit in the last quarter, and we'll be in a slightly higher strip period for the next quarter or two before we drop back into a stripping ratio that's more typical of the life of mine. So with PAN running well, uh, the main focus there is extending the mine life. It currently has a four-year mine life. We've been doing a lot of drilling. Uh, we're currently drilling on the project now. Um, and our goal is really to add a sort of year or year and a half of mine life each year. So we'll spend roughly a million to a million and a half dollars a year on drilling to continue to extend that mine life. It's a very large property. There are lots of exploration targets there that were generated by the previous owners. You can see them in red there. And those targets have not yet been drilled. So all the drilling that's been done currently has been in and around the mine. Uh, in a previous program, we added about eight months to the mine life. Uh, and as I say, we're in a, in a, in a drilling program uh, presently that will continue to extend that mine life. So with PAN running well, our focus has turned to our growth project, which is Gold Rock. Gold Rock, as I said, is about eight miles away. There is a, there's a former uh, producing open pit mine on the site. It was a, quite a small mine operated in the 1990s uh, by Echo Bay. Uh, that mine was operating when gold was running at about $250 an ounce, and it was making money back then. Here you can see the uh, satellite view of the area. You can see Pan up in the northwest there, just south of Highway 50, which is the main east-west highway across this part of Nevada. Gold Rock down to the south. Gold Rock has a resource of about 400,000 ounces in all categories. Interestingly, it's about 60% higher grades than Pan. Uh, sits at about 0.8 uh, grams per ton, whereas Pan is about 0.5 grams per ton. These are relatively low grades, but because they're open pit, relatively shallow projects with heap leaching, um, they, they actually can generate uh, decent cash flow. Um, and we expect Gold Rock to be even better. Um, Gold Rock has a lot of exploration potential. That's one of the reasons why Kinross Gold came in as a shareholder. Uh, Kinross currently owns about 6% of us. We finished the permitting process for uh, Gold Rock in uh, September of 2018. Interestingly, that permitting process had begun uh, by Midway Gold, and Midway had done all of that permitting process without publishing any technical studies on the project at all other than resource estimates. So they hadn't published a feasibility study, hadn't published a preliminary economic assessment, none of this. So there are really no published economics around what Gold Rock could be or will be. And so to correct that, we've actually begun a, pre a preliminary economic assessment, or PEA, and that will be out. We hope to complete it by Christmas, so we'll have the results out early in the new year. And that will give a sense of what are the economics around this, what is the mine life, what kind of gold production can we expect to see out of it. In general, we expect Pan, or sorry, Gold Rock, to produce somewhere between 50 and 75,000 ounces of gold per year. That, in combination with the sort of 45 to 50,000 ounces coming out of uh, Pan, would create a mining complex in Nevada producing in excess of 100,000 ounces a year. And we think that we can bring Gold Rock into production fairly quickly and fairly efficiently because of its proximity to Pan. You can see that it's only about eight miles away. We'll be putting in a road connecting to the two, which will uh, take advantage of the existing access road into Pan. The power line for Pan runs about four kilometers from the front door of the Gold Rock property. You can see it coming in there from the left uh, as that yellow line. And we will uh, use a lot of the same operating team, the same management team, the same infrastructure. Um, we'll probably just build an open pit mine, uh, leach pads, and carbon columns down at the uh, Gold Rock site. And then we'll truck the loaded carbon, that's that coconut shell carbon containing the gold. We'll truck that up to Pan and use the existing refinery and re existing ADR plant at Pan uh, so that uh, we can share that infrastructure between the two. We'll also share the assay lab as well and as much of the other infrastructure uh, as we can. The goal is to have Pan and Gold Rock operating together by the end of 2022. I mentioned we've been doing a lot of uh, drilling uh, at Gold Rock over the last year. Uh, in uh, advance of the PEA, we obviously want to grow the resource ahead of this economic study. Uh, and the drilling has been very successful. We've hit grades and thicknesses that are very typical of what we see in the resource. And we're quite confident as we go forward that we'll have a larger resource uh, than we currently have on that. But uh, that will come out uh, early in the new year. One other project that we picked up in the Midway transaction called Golden Eagle. This is up in Washington State, up in the northwestern uh, part of the U.S. It's just south of the U.S. border, or sorry, the U.S.-Canada border, uh, near the town of Republic, Washington. Republic was a historical mining district, produced about 4.5 million ounces between 1850 and just recently. In fact, Kinross 
Again, that name crops up. Kinross is just shutting down the last two mines in the area because they've run uh, out of resources. Um, Golden Eagle currently has a, a, a resource of 1.74 million ounces at 1.89 grams per ton. Um, that was done back in 2009. It's a historical resource. It was done 2009 using a $750 gold price. If you rerun that same resource at 1250 gold, as we have done internally, you get about 2.2 million ounces of gold. The biggest problem with this project is that if you were to put an open pit around it to mine it, unfortunately, the edges of the pit extend into ground adjacent to us that's controlled by Hecla. Hecla is obviously a much larger company. Um, we've had many, many meetings with them. They've indicated that they are drilling off a sort of one and a half to two million ounce resource right next door on their side of the property. And so we've talked to them about merging the two properties, bringing them together. You could potentially create a four million ounce gold deposit in the Western US. Um, Hecla, unfortunately, is very, very slow to move. They are a 150 year old company and it's like dealing with a 150 year old man. Um, we are hopeful that we'll get some traction on this. In the meantime, it only costs us $10,000 a year to hold this property. It's uh, entirely ours, and so we can afford to wait, and hopefully Hecla will eventually come to the table. We have a couple of uh, exploration projects in Chile that I mentioned. They're great projects, but we're looking for a home for them because Chile's not really a focus anymore. Fairly simple share structure, 97 million shares outstanding. We have not issued new equity in over two and a half years. Uh, that's because we've been able to fund all of our growth programs, all of our drilling, all of our engineering studies on Gold Rock and our drilling at PAN and putting in a crushing circuit at PAN, all from cash flow from PAN, which was our thesis when we began. There are 32 million options in warrants, about 20 million of those are warrants. They're priced at $1.60, so they're well out of the money. We're currently trading around 40 cents Canadian. Um, we had at our last quarter, uh, $9.7 million US in cash. We had $22 million in working capital and a market capitalization of about $29 million. So you can see that the, the, the valuation in the market of the company is really supported entirely by PAN. We're getting no value for Gold Rock, no value for Golden Eagle. And I think with the publication of the PEA in the new year, that's going to change as the market starts to see what the economics are and what the potential is uh, around the Gold Rock project. Valuation slide. All junior mining CEOs are contractually obliged to say they're undervalued, so I'll say that now. Um, we are undervalued relative <laughs> to our peers. Um, and, and, and that's on a, you know, a lot of very typical metrics, EV per production ounce, EV per resource ounce. There are other companies in that universe that are producing less gold than we are and not profitably and have higher market cap. And so I think one of the things we've been focused on lately in the last kind of six months to a year is getting out and doing much more marketing and getting the story out there because I think we've been flying under the radar for a long time and focused on the technical aspects of the project. So I'll just wrap up with this slide. Uh, we do tend to try and under-promise and over-deliver. I hate explaining to people why we didn't achieve the promises we said we were going to do, so I like to keep our promises feasible and achievable. Uh, we said we were going to get the pan mine ramped up and generating cash flow. We did that. We said we were going to extend the mine life through drilling. We did that, and we're in the process of doing that again. We said we were going to get gold rock permitted, and we did that, and we would get a crusher installed at pan to increase gold recoveries, and we did that out of cash flow. Upcoming catalysts, the primary one is going to be continued exploration results uh, and met results from gold rock, and that will lead into the PEA, which will come early in the new year. Um, we'll have a PAN resource expansion. Uh, drilling results will be coming out. We're drilling at PAN now. Um, and then in the middle of next year, you'll see a new life of mine plan, a new reserve and resource update. In the meantime, I'm hoping we're going to get some traction on consolidation. There are a number of other single asset producers out there that would make a lot more sense bundled together in a single company. So that instead of four 50,000 ounce producers, you've got one 200,000 ounce producer. And that growth profile is, uh, is really our goal at the moment. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. This will be the lunch period. Uh, there could be a period of question if we wanted. Did anybody have any questions for Tim? Okay, perfect. Well, you can chat at lunch. You're totally right, man. To uh, the fact that this was. Yeah, I'll give you my. I'll give you the hand. And uh, have focused on the technical issues. Kudos to them. So, with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is it is the lunch break, and we'll reconvene. I believe it's at two twenty but uh, I don't have my papers with me. So 
Uh, I think we have an, an hour of, of, for lunch or an hour and a half. So please see you later. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
I have the pleasure of uh, introducing a company called Skina Resources Limited, SKE on a Toronto stock exchange. They are active in the Golden Triangle of British Columbia and Canada. I have the pleasure of welcoming, I believe, Mr. Walter Coles, who is the president and CEO, for being a mining executive for several companies. He was analyst at Cadence Investment Partners at UBS Investment Bank in New York. I believe he's a resident or uh, originally from the state of, great state of Virginia or West Virginia. I don't want to make any errors in that regards. So, sir, if you want to come up, the floor is yours. We've been having some issues this morning with the uh, the screen, so this whole area, just be very careful not touching the, uh, I guess, the podium. So to move forward, and the red button over here, okay. and it should be fine. But Perfect. I've got the code, so it should work out. Okay. okay. Stopwatch working here. There we go. Okay. Uh, I'll be very, you know, I'll put the light yellow to give you five minutes and then okay. don't worry, we've got some time, so don't sounds, stress with the time. Sounds good. But be inside the 15, I guess. Yeah, sure. But I have final words, so. Okay. I'm a good guy. I, I know this is near the end of the conference, so I'm sure you all have seen uh, lots of presentations. So uh, I'll try to be succinct and to the point with ours. So as, uh, as mentioned, um, our project is our projects are in the northern northwestern portion of British Columbia. We've got three uh, three projects. Uh, we acquired all of them from major mining companies. Our idea was not to try to do grassroots exploration, but try to get a hold of assets that already had either a lot of money spent on them or or some type of resource there uh, to begin with. Uh, this is a tough enough business. How do we how do we mitigate risk? That was our idea to try to manage that. The other uh, component of our strategy was not to pay for assets up front, but rather option them and then make sure there was some sort of economic viability to them before we would buy them. Uh, the GJ uh, project is a copper gold porphyry that we optioned from Tech. Um, Tech and NGX had, had spent around 26 million on that, that project. Uh, the SNP project is a past producing high grade uh, gold mine uh, pretty legendary mine. It produced an ounce per ton. And we optioned that from Barrick and then we acquired it for zero. Basically, we just had to take over the environmental liability, which was $3 million. Uh, the most, our last project, which is now our flagship project, is SK Creek. SK, we optioned from Barrick, a three year option. We have a, a year left on that option. Uh, we will definitely be exercising and purchasing this property. And you're going to see why as we get into the presentation. Got a pretty lean, uh, lean company. Uh, four other people on the board. Um, I'll just briefly talk about each of them. Craig Perry is chairman. Craig was co-founder of NextGen, very successful uh, uranium discovery. Uh, prior to that, Craig worked as a geologist for Rio Tinto. Uh, Don Siemens is our uh, chairman of the audit committee. He's an accountant, KPMG by training. Uh, most recently, he was on the board of Arizona Mines and Atlantic Gold, two very uh, uh, successful sales. Uh, Borden Putnam is, a, is an investment analyst. He's worked for several multi-billion dollar uh, funds uh, on the West Coast in the U.S. And lastly, Isaac Burstein is with Hochschild Mining. Hochschild has a, has a position in our company, and he's their VP of, of corporate development. Uh, on the management side, uh, my background, as mentioned, I worked in finance uh, prior to uh, jumping into the mining industry. I don't think I knew what I was really getting into. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, our CFO is the, um, his background is, is Pricewaterhouse accountant. Paul Geddes, VP of Exploration. His background is with Barkerville uh, Mines. He was head of exploration there. Um, Kelly Earl is here with me, is our VP of Communications, also a geologist, and lastly, uh, Justin Himmelright is our VP of, of Environment and Sustainability. You don't usually see small companies with this type of role, but our view is it's such an extremely important uh, aspect of de developing any kind of project in, in Canada or for, for that matter anywhere in the world. One of the reasons we love the Golden Triangle is because of the improvements in infrastructure that have occurred. 
Like this is an area in the far north. There's almost no population up here. And yet we have power lines we, between our SNP and Escape Creek project. In the last seven years, we have, we have three new hydroelectric facilities that have been built. They recently sold for two and a half billion dollars. Like imagine the luck to be in the middle of nowhere and we're basically seven kilometers from plugging into super cheap hydropower. Uh, our Escape Creek project, you can drive in and out all year long. A uh, huge advantage for any kind of project to have that kind of infrastructure there. So let's talk about Escape Creek. Legendary, legendary mine. And the reason is because it, when it was in operation, it was an underground mine that produced at a grade of two and a half ounces per ton of production. Like, have you ever heard of an underground mine or any mine to produce with that kind of? Uh, you have your cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, with that kind of grade, like, it, it really incredible. So our our idea for going after this was when it operated, the price of gold was between two hundred and fifty and four hundred dollars. So much lower gold price when this mine was in operation. Second thing, they didn't have the infrastructure. This was powered by diesel and propane. So it was a high cost mine in a low, in a low gold price environment. And then the last part of our strategy was to look at this as an, instead of looking at it again as an underground mine, to look at this as an, as an open pit mine. Because obviously you can use a much lower cutoff grade. And then the, the obvious uh, question was how much gold would be left? Well, it turned out there was four, uh, in the resource we put out six months ago, four million ounces at, at four, four and a half grams. So surprised us and definitely surprised Barrick as well. Here's the, uh, the uh, PEA that we just published on Thursday, so about a week ago. 300,000 ounces a year on, in a nine year mine life. So substantial amount of production. Um, even uh, more spectacular relative to the amount of production is the CapEx, only $233 million US to put this mine in, back into production. And again, we benefit from all that infrastructure. We don't have to build roads. We're very close to power lines. Um, it's also not high up in the Alpine. It's, it's at an elevation of about 1,000 meters. The uh, after-tax return, as you can see, is, is 51%. So that means every year this project kicks off after-tax cash flow equivalent to about half of the CapEx. So about a, it's, it's $147 million a year in cash flow that comes off of this, this project. All in sustainable costs, $757 US, and the after-tax NPV is $640 million. So very robust project economics. Just to give you a look at the, the sensitivities of this project to gold prices, you can see that at $1,200 gold, $1,200 US, we still have a 40% after-tax IRR and a payback of 1.6 years. And looking at the opposite side of the spectrum, at $1,500 gold, the IRR jumps up to 63% and payback is less than a year. So certainly have some uh, nice uh, upside leverage to gold and, and margin of safety on the downside. This is a long section, and it's a little bit difficult to tell, but the, uh, the shaded gray area is the pit on the, on the left side, and we have a small pit on the far right in an area we call the 22 zone. The average depth of this pit would be 180 meters. So this isn't a big, huge pit. It's, it's a pretty manageable shallow, uh, shallow deposit. Right now we have a sort of equal division between the indicated resource and the inferred resource on tons. They're both about 13 and a half million tons in each category. Um, but the grade on the indicated is 6.1 grams, while the grade on the inferred is 2.9 grams. And we, we believe that to be somewhat of a consequence of drill spacing. So the spacing on the indicated resource is 10 to 15 meters between drill holes, while on the inferred it's 50 to 70 meters. Our hope is that as we do the infill, and move that inferred over to indicated, we'll see some bump in, in grade there. It's a VMS deposit. It's, it's very continuous, very predictable, and that's part of our reasoning for believing that we'll see a bump in grade. This is a little video just to uh, 
sort of give you a visual idea of a lot of the things I've been talking about. Northwest BC, super beautiful, beautiful area. If you uh, want a fun thing to do in the summer, come for a site visit. You th see our three projects relative to many of the other mining projects in this area. It's prolific for mining. Uh, the local First Nations are the Taltan and the Nishka, both extremely supportive of mining. There's that power line going up to the uh, Red Crisp Mine. They're the three new uh, hydroelectric facilities between SK and SNP. Now we're going to zoom in. This is the tenure that we have. It's about, uh, I think it's about 7,000 hectares, give or take. And again, as I mentioned, we're not in this, the high alpine. We're sort of midway up. This is the uh, kind of terrain grizzly bears love, which makes for a little bit of excitement for our geologists in the summertime. So this is a, a drone flying over the ridge. And the deposit is basically in this ridge right here on the left. You can see a, a drill rig right there. Now we'll show you what the pit looks like. That's the main pit. There's the uh, historic area where they had the mill. The mill was uh, dismantled and sold back in 2008. They shut the mine down during the, the world financial crisis, which always makes you go, oh, there's probably opportunity then. Uh, two types of mineralization. There's a, a mudstone layer on the top that has higher grade, and then there's the rhyolite layer underneath. The other difference between the two is that the mudstone layer has a, a degree of impurities, while the rhyolite doesn't have any arsenic or mercury. About 70% of the deposit is in the rhyolite and about 30% in, uh, in the mudstone. Those gray areas are the historical workings. They were paste back filled with cement and river rock, so they shouldn't be an issue for us when we do the open pit. There's a resource down on that bottom left uh, that is an underground resource and that's not included in our mine plan. Yep, and you can see the the uh, second little pit right there, all rhyolite. And, and we think there's exploration opportunity between those two pits to sort of fill that in, probably with rhyolite. Yep. So again, that shows you the, the main pit and the waste dump. Now, one of the uh, exciting things here is... is um, the, the, uh, the deposition mechanism on the mineralization were feeder zones. So basically, this is a VMS deposit. There were vents on the bottom of the ocean floor. And as the hot fluids came up from the vents, hit the cold ocean water, they created that layer of, of mudstone. So that used to be the bottom of the ocean floor. Then you had a late stage, uh, like lava flow that covered it up. But uh, we think there's, there's excellent exploration opportunity following those feeders to depth. So that's what you see in these sort of highlighted areas is we think there's good exploration opportunity there in the feeder zones. The other uh, pretty interesting uh, uh, recent drill result that we put out was this 300 grams over two meters. And that's at a, at a mudstone layer that's about 20 million years earlier. So that, that hit right there used to be the ocean floor 220 million years ago. And then the, the main area that was mined before that SK contact mudstone, which is right in here, that was the ocean floor 20 million years later. So that's where they historically targeted was that area. So what's left is they didn't touch the rhyolite, which is right here and here, and they left remnants of the mudstone. So that's what we're going after. Uh, but our idea down here is to, is to fill in drill holes, especially where it comes up towards surface. And this is a potential it's not included in our, in our PEA at all, and it's potential upside to our PEA. So we'll come in here and, and drill this area and see if we can create some continuity to this. Other recent drill holes that we have in here, 27 grams over 9.4 meters, you know, 17 grams over 7.5 meters. So that's just that's the infill that we're doing right now. But pretty spectacular um, uh, intercepts. With four grams, this ranks very well globally in terms of being one of the highest open pit deposits in the world. You can see four grams, um, you know, where it stacks up in North America and, and globally. 
I once had an engineer say to me, good grades make for good miners. And that's why we have such strong economics, is four grams per ton open pit. This is where we, uh, lo looking at us from a valuation perspective, our market cap is $70 million right now. If you take our NPV and divide, uh, divide that into our, our, our market cap, we end up, we're right now at a 0.1 times NAV. And most development projects that are out there are trading at, you know, sort of a, a five to six times NAV. So we like to think that as we get out and sort of tell this story more, hopefully we can close that gap between a, a 0.1 times NAV and working our way up. You can see Silvercrest over here trading at one times NAV. So we think we've got a pretty strong project that can hopefully gravitate somewhere up this, this curve on valuation. Uh, just to emphasize again, our CapEx, that's not, it should say 233 million right there. Um, you can see that relative to the amount of ounces we produce, it's an excellent capital intensity ratio. Uh, we also think we'll be able to grow this number for, from right now 306,000 ounces a year. We think there's some opportunities to probably get this closer to 400,000 ounces a year. Now, we, there's a little bit of a give and take. The reason our capex is so low is because we're creating a concentrate. So we're not building out all the circuits to, to create Doré at site. And what that means is we're sending the concentrate to smelters, and smelters take their pound of flesh. So while we have excellent capital intensity, we're in the second quartile on the OPEX side. All in sustainable costs of 757 puts us right here, when you would almost think because of our grade we should be in first quartile, but that's the give and take. Um, we're very proud to be a founding member of the BC Regional Mining Alliance. This is very unique because it's a collaboration between the First Nations, the government, and industry. So right now there are uh, four companies in the, uh, in the Golden Triangle BC Mining Re Regional Alliance, along with the Nishka, the Taltan, and the government of BC. The premier of the province uh, gave us a million dollars to support this effort. And basically it, it's, it's a joint effort, all of us going around the world collectively with our First Nation partners and with the government to explain to people that British Columbia is definitely open for business as far as mining goes. We've got 115 million shares outstanding. Uh, shares are trading right now at around 62 cents. So that's where we get to the $70 million value. Uh, our only strategic is Hochschild Mining. I would imagine that over the next uh, couple months we might take another strategic investment in. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and time. So we're going to go from northwestern BC to the promise of Quebec, my home province. I have the great honor of presenting our next speaker, Jean-Marc Lulin, Dr. Jean-Marc Lulin, who is the president and CEO of Azimuth Exploration, EZX on the venture. Jean-Marc is a veteran uh, mining industry executive. He's been with Azimuth for since 2003, so it's been a while. Uh, but he has experience in Africa, experience in North America, um, so a very well-versed and traveled geologist. And he's very passionate about his company. Um, I'll keep it very simple, Jean-Marc. Um, you're going to come here and present us a story about Project Generator. Uh, that is more than perhaps than slightly positive. Uh, full disclosure, I am an analyst, independent analyst, and I do cover azimuth since 2008, so it's been a while. Uh, merci Eric. Uh, je présenterai en français, mais uh, of course you can uh, ask any question you may have in English on the slides are in English. Donc Azimut est un joueur clé dans la province du Québec. Comme vous savez, la province du Québec est une, une des plus grandes provinces au Canada. C'est 1,6 million de kilomètres carrés, soit à peu près trois fois la, la France. 
Et l'essentiel du, du Québec est, reste encore inexploré, même si le Québec est réputé pour ses mines. Seule une toute petite partie du Québec actuellement constitue le, le cœur minier du Québec. Mais euh, les immensités du Moyen Nord et du Grand Nord restent encore en, en très grande partie inexplorées, avec des cibles pour trouver de nouveaux districts miniers, de nouveaux camps miniers, comme ceux qui ont fait la gloire du, du Canada et, et du Québec. Donc je vous présenterai la conférence en trois parties, les faits saillants sur la société, les propriétés clés et les perspectives. Les faits saillants sur la société, ce qui marque vraiment Azimut, c'est sa capacité à traiter les données numériques. Depuis 2003, la société a comme concept clé d'optimiser le processus de l'exploration en, en, en utilisant au maximum les données numériques qui existent dans la base de données publique gouvernementale pour extraire de la meilleure façon possible les, les cibles, la détermination des cibles d'exploration à l'échelle du Québec. Donc vraiment notre capacité distinctive en tant que société d'exploration, c'est la capacité à traiter de grandes bases du numérique. À ce niveau-là, le Québec a été absolument visionnaire pour implanter un système d'information numérique à disposition des sociétés minières. Ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'ils ont commencé il y a un ou deux ans, ni même, euh, ni même dix ans, mais c'est un processus qui a, qui a commencé depuis très longtemps. Et aujourd'hui, le Québec est reconnu comme ayant une des meilleures bases de données numériques euh, à l'échelle mondiale appliquées à l'exploration minière. Nous, depuis très longtemps, en fait, c'est le cœur de la compagnie Azimut, c'est de tirer parti de cette base de données numériques pour réduire le risque initial de l'exploration en identifiant les meilleures cibles possibles à l'échelle de la province. Donc cette activité de traitement de données, ça nous a euh, permis de proposer ces cibles à des sociétés partenaires, à des, euh, à des grandes sociétés, la plupart du temps des majeurs. Depuis 15 ans, Azimut a signé 31 ententes de partenariat avec 17 compagnies différentes pour une valeur globale de 140 millions de dollars en travaux. Nous avons signé trois ententes stratégiques avec Rio Tinto, deux ententes avec Newmont Gold Corp, deux avec I Am Gold, deux avec Ecla Mining et deux ententes stratégiques dernièrement avec Sokem. Sokem qui est la société québécoise d'exploration minière, c'est l'émanation directe du gouvernement du Québec, c'est financé par le Conseil du Trésor du Québec et Sokem a une vocation de développer euh, la ressource minérale euh, sur le moyen et le long terme à l'échelle du Québec. Donc c'est les promoteurs naturels, gouvernementaux euh, de l'exploration minière. Et ils ont fait euh, une entente, donc deux ententes stratégiques avec Azimut euh, récemment. Cette activité globale de traitement de données et de développement du partenariat nous a permis depuis 2000, 2003 de découvrir plus de 400 nouveaux prospects minéralisés à l'échelle de la province dans des secteurs qui étaient peu ou pas explorés auparavant, et donc d'ouvrir de nouvelles régions au développement du potentiel minéral. Évidemment, l'idée là-dedans, c'est de trouver de très gros gisements, parce qu'en ouvrant une nouvelle région minière, on a besoin de trouver un gisement qui, de par sa taille, en lui-même, va justifier la création de nouvelles infrastructures. Donc l'objectif d'Azimut, comme celui de Sokem, comme de celui de ses partenaires majeurs, c'est de trouver euh, des gisements de classe mondiale. Euh, Azimut est le, le plus important détenteur de permis d'exploration à l'échelle du Québec. Et puis évidemment, ce qui va avec ça, c'est que Québec est reconnu mondialement comme une des meilleures juridictions euh, minières au, au, au monde. C'est un pays qui a une longue expérience minière, avec évidemment des hauts et des bas, mais c'est un pays où il y a eu des mines, il y a une expertise humaine considérable. Et en plus, il y a une excellente base de données numériques. Donc ce qui fait que nous, on s'est vraiment développé au Québec et on continue à, à le faire parce qu'on pense que c'est un endroit où on peut créer beaucoup de, beaucoup de valeur. La compagnie a été fondée en 1986. Et moi, je suis à peu près à 50% de son existence. Ce qui est un fait notable, qui est absolument euh, important à comprendre dans, dans, la, dans la façon dont on entend créer de la valeur, c'est la structure du capital action. Azimut a 57,4 millions d'actions émises, 
Mais le, le, depuis sa fondation, le capital action n'a jamais été consolidé. Donc on a une gestion extrêmement euh, stricte, extrêmement disciplinée du processus de dilution, à la différence d'un très grand nombre de, de, de compagnies euh, juniors d'exploration, euh, pas seulement au Canada, mais euh, dans, dans tous les pays avec le système junior. Souvent, la, la maladie mortelle des, des juniors, c'est le processus de dilution. Et nous, on a réussi à le, à le contrôler. Vous allez voir comment. Le, la, pour nous, le, la structure du capital d'action est, est, est un élément crucial dans le processus de création de valeur. Aujourd'hui, il y a 63% des, des actions qui sont essentiellement contrôlés par quelques actionnaires, 5% pour les, les, euh, les initiés, 30% pour les grands fonds institutionnels du Québec, puis 28% pour quelques family office, des, des, des gestions de fortune familiale. Euh, ce qui est important aussi, c'est que ce qui reste finalement, c'est 21 millions dans, dans la flotte, les actions libres dans le marché, et on utilise évidemment cet aspect-là pour créer un levier quand il va y avoir la découverte ou des découvertes de gisements majeurs, euh, le fait qu'il y ait une flotte réduite, c'est là où va se convertir la valeur d'un gisement euh, divisé par le nombre d'actions. On a très peu d'actions, en particulier très peu d'actions dans la flotte. Et ça, ça permet de créer une véritable valeur par action. La compagnie, actuellement, a, a 3 millions de dollars en, en cash. Euh, tout à l'heure, on a vu qu'on euh, porte une très grande importance au développement du partenariat. Historiquement, les partenaires ont dépensé 61 millions de dollars, peut-être aujourd'hui c'est 63, 64 millions de dollars, quand nous on dépense 11 millions de dollars. Donc il y a un effet de levier avec notre stratégie qui est très important, là encore qui est, qui est probablement un des meilleurs au Canada parmi les compagnies juniors. Donc pour, pour résumer, euh, on, on essaye de... de, de de concevoir, de mener notre activité en essayant de réduire fondamentalement deux des principaux facteurs de risque dans l'exploration, le risque technique à travers l'analyse la, la, des, des mégadonnées. On pense qu'on arrive à avoir vraiment un, un avantage compétitif au niveau de la sélection initiale des cibles. Euh, la compagnie est clairement focalisée sur quelques métaux, l'or et le cuivre, mais ça peut nous permettre euh, d'évaluer de, de, d'autres types de, de métaux aussi associés à ces gisements. On cherche des gisements majeurs. Maintenant, l'autre partie, c'est la gestion du risque d'affaires. La gestion du risque d'affaires, c'est à travers le développement du partenariat, où Azimut, évidemment, a, a eu beaucoup de succès, probablement un des meilleurs taux de succès dans l'industrie junior. Ça nous permet de réduire fondamentalement les besoins en financement, de minimiser, au, vraiment de minimiser la dilution par action. Donc là encore, c'est ce qui permet d'être un ascenseur pour la création de valeur par action. Parce qu'en cas de découverte, ben, moins il y a d'actions, plus le levier par action dans la valeur va être important. Puis euh, la sélection des partenaires aussi, c'est un élément très important. Euh, on cherche des partenaires qui ont une vision euh, à long terme, des partenaires solides. Et évidemment, on a eu la chance de développer euh, des ententes avec euh, le gouvernement du Québec. Donc le dernier deal en date, c'est un, un, une entente qui a été signée en 2019. C'est notre deuxième alliance stratégique avec le gouvernement du Québec. Ils vont investir sur six ans jusqu'à 40 millions de dollars. Euh, ça se répartit en deux phases. Une première phase, 16 millions de dollars en quatre ans pour acquérir 3, 50% d'intérêt dans trois projets majeurs. Euh, et euh, une seconde option, où ils pourraient investir un 8 millions de dollars additionnels sur chaque projet, pour un total de 24 millions, euh, pour avancer les projets jusqu'à une étude économique préliminaire. Donc c'est un très fort levier pour les 4 à 6 prochaines années que nous avons avec le gouvernement du Québec. Et notre société est opérateur du projet. Donc ça, ça donne euh, évidemment beaucoup de visibilité à notre société comme entreprise parce que notre partenaire, c'est le gouvernement du Québec. Et en général, le, le Québec n'a pas l'habitude de retourner sa veste. Un jour, ils sont pro Le lendemain, ils sont anti -mines. Le Québec, depuis 100 ans, est constamment pro -minier. Donc c'est très clair. Euh, c'est un, un état de droit. Euh, il y a de la transparence. C'est un des meilleurs ju euh, régimes juridiques. Donc on pense qu'on euh, a euh, un deal qui est gagnant avec, euh, avec le gouvernement. Et encore, le, le modèle économique est, est robuste. Hein. Euh, sur euh, la moyenne de, du, euh, euh, des dépenses fixes, euh, les GNA, c'est 700 000 dollars par année. 
Et c'est euh, en grande partie compensé par les revenus annuels de la compagnie. Les revenus, ça vient de trois sources. Euh, les, les paiements d'options, des fois des paiements en, en actions, mais également les, euh, les frais de, de gérance des projets pour lesquels nous sommes opérateurs. Donc euh, 800 000 dollars en moyenne depuis 15 ans, pour une junior, c'est pas mal, parce que ça couvre euh, les, la plus grande partie de nos dépenses euh, administratives et une partie de nos dépenses d'exploration. Là encore, euh, Azimut, sur une base comparative à l'échelle canadienne, a un des meilleurs leviers financiers, environ euh, 5 dollars dépensés par les partenaires pour 1 dollar dépensé par Azimut dans nos dépenses d'exploration, environ 85% de l'argent euh, d'exploration est financé et donné euh, par les partenaires. Euh, également, toute cette stratégie nous permet d'avoir un des meilleurs euh, des taux de dilution par par, euh, euh, du capital action parmi les plus faibles euh, dans les juniors euh, canadiennes. Donc on préserve euh, l'investissement de l'actionnaire à travers cette euh, stratégie. Donc euh, là encore, pour résumer, très simple, il y a quatre étapes dans notre travail. On fait du ciblage à travers l'analyse des mégadonnées. On va acquérir les meilleures, les meilleures cibles. On n'a jamais acheté à quiconque des, des cibles, c'est directement acquis du gouvernement. Donc on est tout souvent, là, dans l'immense majorité des cas, on est les premiers euh, sur une zone d'intérêt. Après, malheureusement, on a souvent beaucoup de, de, de compagnies opportunistes qui viennent se mettre à côté de nous. Mais c'est comme ça. Euh, troisième, euh, troisième étape, on développe le partenariat. Donc on transfère le risque d'affaires très vite euh, chez euh, nos partenaires. Et enfin, on fait de l'exploration. Donc euh, c'est notre portefeuille minier à l'échelle du Québec. On est principalement actif dans deux régions, la région de la baie de James qui est la partie centrale et dans le grand nord du Québec qu'on appelle le Nunavik qui est en fait euh, la patrie des, des Inuits, euh, des Esquimaux comme on disait avant et c'est l'Arctique québécois là où il n'y a plus, euh, plus d'arbres. Donc euh, deux régions avec euh, quatre projets principaux. Dans la région de la baie de James, le projet Elmer, qui est un projet d'or, qui appartient à 100% à Azimut, donc c'est autofinancé. Le projet Piqua, qui est en partenariat avec Sokem, qui est un projet de cuivre or de très grand intérêt. Enfin, les projets Onunavik, avec Rex et Rex Sud, sont des projets or cuivre, mais éventuellement d'autres métaux comme l'étain, le tungstène, les terres rares euh, et l'argent. Donc euh, Rex et Rex Sud, ces deux projets à eux seuls, représente chacun de ces deux projets représente potentiellement un nouveau district minier. Donc on parle de on parle de découvertes qui pourraient un avoir euh, avoir un impact au niveau du développement minier euh, au Québec pour les, les 50 prochaines années voire plus. On a vraiment une vision de développement du territoire qui s'articule sur la découverte de gisements majeurs. Donc euh, ça c'est une idée de nos euh, projets à la baie de James, avec euh, euh, tous ces projets en jaune sont à Azimut, souvent en partenariat avec Sokem. Comme vous voyez, même si on est au, dans le nord du Québec, c'est une région euh, qui, est, euh, qui bénéficie d'infrastructures majeures, des lignes électriques partout, des routes partout, des aéroports, euh, une grande expertise et aussi des, des ententes euh, extraordinaires avec euh, la, la nation CRI, donc les, les Indiens qui habitent cette région qui sont des partenaires pro-miniers, ils bénéficient directement des entreprises, de, de l'activité de nos entreprises. Donc euh, c'est un, un contexte qui est très, euh, très pro-minier, euh, au, au moins euh, dans toute cette région. Donc euh, rapidement, le projet euh, Elmer Duxbury, ça appartient à 100% à Azimut, ça a été acquis par euh, Jalonnement en 2016, c'est un projet qui fait 35 km de long, Dès que l'on est arrivé sur ce projet, en 2019, en juin 2019, on a très rapidement fait de la prospection, du décapage, on a rainuré en surface, de l'échantillonnage en surface, et très rapidement on a obtenu des résultats qui sont intéressants. 9,5 grammes sur 7 mètres, 9,5 grammes sur 5 mètres, 3,3 grammes, etc. Donc c'est des valeurs économiques en surface, la dimension est là, on a une zone prospective qui fait au moins 200 mètres de long et qui s'insère dans un corridor de 7 km de long avec plein d'indices à haute teneur et on passe aujourd'hui en phase de forage sur ce projet donc qui a été acquis il y a moins d'un an. Là, c'est une idée sur, sur le, la zone prospective, euh, les, les, trois, les trois, quatre indices minéralisés se répartissent sur une zone de 5 km, 
euh, c'est encore très peu exploré, ce sont des indices en surface. Nous, on arrive avec vraiment une technologie d'exploration, une vision de l'exploration. Je pense qu'on va être capable de générer très rapidement des résultats sur ce, sur ce projet. Un autre projet qui est fort intéressant, c'est Piqua. Il a été acquis en 2016, on est en partenariat avec Socem. Et dans les deux dernières années, 2018-2019, on a commencé à trouver euh, une zone d'intérêt de 20 km de long, euh, cuivre-or. Cette année, les travaux de prospection ont livré des résultats euh, spectaculaires, notamment un indice minéralisé qu'on appelle Copperfield. Euh, sur affleurement, on a 9,8% cuivre, 13,4 g par tonne d'or, 37,6 g par tonne d'argent. C'est un, un, un prospect minéralisé qui s'insère dans, dans un champ de blocs minéralisés transportés par les glaciers, mais peu transportés par les glaciers, où on a euh, identifié environ 120 blocs minéralisés sur 5,2 km, avec des teneurs, là encore, assez spectaculaires en cuivre, or, argent et molybdène. Euh, on est en train de recevoir les résultats et euh, on espère avoir une image complète de de ce champ de, de, de blocs erratiques là, dans, les, dans les prochaines semaines. Mais c'est très logique par rapport à l'image qu'on se fait de, de la cible qui avait été générée en, en 2016. Et on est très confiant sur la, la capacité à trouver quelque chose de significatif dans, dans ce secteur-là. En gros, ce, ce secteur, le modèle que l'on voit, c'est un système porphyrique à cuivre, or, argent, molybdène, mais déformé par, par une phase de déformation régionale. Donc ce n'est pas un porphyre comme en Colombie-Britannique ou comme au Chili ou comme au Pérou. En fait, c'est la même chose, sauf que ça a été repris dans une phase de déformation plus tard consécutif à sa mise en place. Mais en gros, c'est un potentiel pour un gisement de, de classe mondiale. Il y, a, il y a de la place. Donc ça, c'est une idée de ce qu'on voit au nord. C'est le, le trend, c'est ce qu'on appelle le Copperfield Trend, qui est une zone de 20 km de long qui nous semble vraiment très prospective, sur lequel on a des résultats encourageants par prospection. Maintenant, notre, notre bébé, on espère que ça va être un, un bébé qui va évoluer en, en, en monstre, parce que c'est ça qu'on cherche. On appelle le Rex Trend. Est-ce que vous voyez la, la ligne rouge ici C'est une zone anomalique en cuivre. Euh, dans les lacs, dans, la, dans les fonds de lacs, c'est une technique qu'on utilise beaucoup au Canada d'échantillonner systématiquement les, les fonds de lacs, la, les sédiments des fonds de lacs. Et cette zone euh, apparaît comme la plus grande anomalie en cuivre à l'échelle du Québec et probablement de l'est du Canada. C'est une zone euh, donc très anomalique en cuivre qui fait 300 km de long. Et euh, évidemment, euh, ce n'est pas juste dans les lacs, les anomalies. Euh, les travaux de prospection initiale d'Azimut pendant trois ans, euh, avant le, notre option euh, avec Sokem, on a trouvé environ 300 nouveaux indices minéralisés dans la roche, donc, euh, qui est étroitement corrélé spatialement au, euh, euh, à cette traînée, cette grande traînée régionale. Euh, vous voyez ça, on appelle, euh, disons en exploration minière, on va appeler ça une province géochimique. C'est vraiment quelque chose qui est complètement hors de la normale et qui montre que il euh, y a des anomalies majeures en, dans le socle rocheux qui est sous-jacente, sous qui sont sous-jacentes au lac. Et évidemment, ce qui nous intéresse, c'est de trouver des gisements majeurs dans le socle rocheux. Quand on voit ce genre d'anomalie, on pense qu'on peut avoir la présence de, euh, de gisements de, de classe mondiale en cuivre, mais avec des métaux associés et notamment avec l'or. Donc j'avance pas mal dans la présentation. Euh, très rapidement, évidemment, vous voyez, il y a beaucoup de valeurs qui sont associées euh, à cette propriété REX. C'est un projet qui fait, euh, sur un des blocs, c'est 35 km de long. En fait, on a, je ne présente pas un autre bloc, mais le, la longueur cumulative du projet, c'est 70 km. Euh, les résultats de prospection initiaux, sont, là encore, sont très encourageants, avec beaucoup de haute teneur. En or, en prospection, on a jusqu'à 580 grammes par tonne sur affleurement, 900 gra 915 grammes par tonne en argent, jusqu'à presque bah, plus que 13% en cuivre. Donc on parle de, de système de grande envergure et, euh, et euh, étendu, enfin, avec des hautes teneurs, et sur des grandes envergures, il y a plusieurs cibles majeures présente sur ce projet. C'est pour ça qu'on parle de, de potentiel de, de camp minier où on pense qu'il y a le potentiel de découvrir plus qu'une mine. Et c'est ce qu'il faut faire quand on explore dans le grand nord du Québec. Il faut partir avec quelque chose de, de très fort, de très puissant. 
la même chose pour le projet euh, Rex Sud. C'est un projet qui fait 65 km de long. Là, on parle encore de régions entières où la prospection initiale euh, faite euh, ces dernières années a livré des résultats initiaux, là encore très encourageants. On a euh, plus d'une soixantaine de kilomètres de zones euh, avec des prospects minéralisés, des zones minéralisées, donc qui méritent un suivi. Le, les travaux qu'on a fait cette année avec, euh, avec Sokem, avec un budget de, de 4 millions, ça nous a permis de hiérarchiser ces zones pour aller vers une phase de forage. Et donc euh, l'année 2020, sur ces deux projets que, que vous venez de voir, Rex et Rex Sud, on va forer euh, pour évaluer euh, les, les projets, puis essayer de convertir euh, vraiment les, les zones minéralisées avec des intersections minéralisées par forage. Donc le, le sommaire, c'est Azimut. Euh, et est un des pionniers dans l'industrie minière, pas juste au Québec, pas juste au Canada, mais à l'échelle mondiale, dans le traitement de données appliquées à l'exploration euh, minière. Tiens, ça c'est bizarre, mais c'est pas grave. Donc euh, on prévoit... Euh, attends, comment on fait Voilà. Donc, oui, oui, c'est presque fini. Donc Azimut est un, un pionnier dans dans l'analyse des mégadonnées appliquées à l'exploration minière. Euh, puis on n'est pas, euh, comme euh, certaines autres compagnies, on n'est pas du tout en phase expérimentale. Pour nous, c'est complètement inscrit dans les gènes, dans le code génétique de la compagnie. Et ce n'est pas seulement de la prédiction, c'est aussi un immense travail de validation depuis les 15 dernières années. Donc on sait ce qui fonctionne, on sait ce qui fonctionne moins bien, on sait ce qui ne fonctionne pas. Donc euh, on est passé à travers cette courbe d'apprentissage je pense qu'aujourd'hui, on a une, une approche analytique en exploration qui est euh, complètement fonctionnelle et qui est potentiellement exportable. Euh, encore une autre façon de diminuer le risque, c'est qu'on a plusieurs projets actifs simultanément. Souvent, dans les compagnies juniors, vous avez un ou deux projets. Mais si ces projets, malheureusement, ben, foirent, ce qui arrive assez souvent, finalement, euh, c'est qu'il n'y a plus rien. Donc euh, euh, nous, notre stratégie, c'est évidemment d'avoir plusieurs chevaux de course qui courent en même temps et vous, on, peut, on peut vous assurer qu'on a les outils pour sélectionner les meilleurs. On a une, dis une discipline financière stricte euh, où euh, le, le, vraiment le, le credo, c'est de minimiser au maximum la dilution. Et enfin, à travers les travaux qu'on a réalisés en 2019, on a un, un pipeline de nouvelles qui est très important et qui est en cours. Maintenant, la perspective pour, euh, pour 2020, le budget qui est attendu, c'est au minimum 6 millions de dollars en exploration, qui inclut un minimum de 4 millions euh, financés par les partenaires, et en particulier Sokem, puis un 12 000 mètres de, de forage carotté sur euh, quatre principaux projets, mais là on parle de minimum, c'est sûr que s'il y a des succès, les budgets vont être augmentés. Donc merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Une excellente présentation. Um, an excellent presentation, Jean-Marc. I gotta confess, I don't understand his French, but that's uh, my issue. Yes, exactly. So I hope uh, it was enjoyed. Um, so I have now the honor of present presenting our next conference speaker, Mr. Troy Wasser, the president and CEO of Ellie Gold Realities. So let me just get this control. So the focus of the company is royalties business in the beautiful state of Nevada. We all know Nevada. What they do is they aggregate uh, a diversified portfolio of promising projects and uh, developed a royalty uh, portfolio. Trey's been president for the company uh, for a few years and uh, is a specialist in finance and is here, as I say, to present Ellie Gold Royalties, ticker ELY on the Venture Exchange. If you want to come up on here, just be very careful, it's very sensitive. Move forward and the red button over here is your pointer. pointer. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Ely Gold Royalties uh, is, uh, as uh, Eric pointed out, uh, 
Uh, we have been building our portfolio for about three years, and uh, we have a different approach to the royalty space in that uh, we purchase royalties from third parties on producing properties. And we also create royalties, generate royalties, if you will, by uh, uh, purchasing and staking properties primarily in Nevada, but the Western United, throughout the Western United States. We sell those properties and retain a royalty. So uh, we have a, a revenue generated from those property sales, which we then apply to purchasing uh, other uh, royalties from third parties. A uh, little overview of the, of the company corporate structure. We have just under 100 million shares outstanding, stock trading around 40 cents, uh, fully diluted 127 million shares. So it gives us a fully diluted market cap of about $50 million. Uh, we currently have about $2 million in cash and uh, uh, just under a million dollars in securities and uh, about that same amount, 900,000, 950,000 in debt, uh, which is, was related to two of the royalty transactions that we did. Uh, 2019, some of our milestones uh, on the finance side is we uh, uh, got Rick Rule involved. He made, uh, invested in January of this year uh, and uh, um, put, Put, t took a 10% position with his warrants, he's just under uh, 20%. Uh, then in uh, May, Eric Sprott got involved with the company uh, and uh, took about a 5% position. Uh, fully diluted, uh, Eric has about an 8% position today. We operate like a royalty company in that uh, our overhead is very low. Uh, our burn rate is only about 400,000 uh, per quarter. And uh, uh, so with our property sales, we are, will generate over $3 million in revenue this year. Uh, you can see on the bottom, our chart uh, kind of reflects uh, really the big change for us uh, after, <coughs> uh, after a couple of years of, uh, of trading in a, in a narrow range. Uh, we, we broke out uh, in January. It's kind of related to when uh, Rick Rule got involved. We also made one of our first royalty purchases in, uh, in January. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, took a big jump also in uh, about the middle of the year when, when the market turned and also when Eric Sprott got involved. So uh, yeah, that, uh, but we, we still think we have a lot of upside in, uh, uh, for shareholders. Uh, <clears throat> We just recently announced uh, a line of credit, uh, it's a convertible note from Eric Sprott in the amount of $6 million. Uh, that's, that is, will allow us to uh, go out and purchase additional royalties and then control our financing uh, so that uh, we, can, we can go and raise equity uh, on, our t our, on better terms and, uh, uh, and timing. And, uh, and then pay down the, the note and then have it ready to draw on again uh, when we see another royalty opportunity for purchase. We only use, we only purchase royalties which are producing or very near term producing. And we generally buy those royalties from third parties. So we're not, we're not as a rule taking uh, co construction risk in uh, the building of a mine. We're not putting up the capital for building a mine and being subject to cost overruns or um, uh, uh, construction risk. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, royalty space. Uh, you know, the uh, royalty companies are, are an excellent way on the equity side to get leverage to the price of gold uh, compared to gold equities that uh, uh, in, in the exploration and development side. You know, we don't uh, employ a lot of geologists and, and run all of the expenses of exploration. We simply stake our properties. Uh, we will spend time consolidating and cleaning up claim packages as far as titles and, and uh, uh, putting the claim, fragmented claim packages back together. 
but uh, we don't have all the exploration expense. So in the royalty companies, you know, you, 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 although there is some construction risk that uh, goes with uh, uh, advancing uh, money for properties that some royalty com most royalty companies do, um, you don't have operating risk uh, uh, as far as cost over, uh, increases, and you get great diversification in a royalty portfolio because it, it, they will it, that it is spread the portfolio is spread across at different assets with different operators and uh, uh, and in different geography. This chart uh, is is. Uh, uh, interesting because it shows that the top three gold royalty companies, Franco Nevada, Royal Gold, and Wheat and Precious Metals, not only handily outperform gold over the last 10 years, gold would be the, uh, the line on the bottom of the graph, but uh, those three royalty companies have actually uh, also outperformed the Standard & Poor's Index. The, uh, the, the growth in a royalty company uh, is important to look at when you consider an investment into Ely Gold because we are at the emerging stage really. We've, we've been putting our portfolio together, as I said, for about three years. Just in the last year started purchasing, purchasing the producing royalties. And what happens as a royalty company grows in size, the valuation that the market puts on the royalty assets grows. So. You can see in the, uh, in the top group there, the Franco Nevada's Royal Golds, uh, they'll trade at 25, uh, even more times cash flow, and uh, two, two to two and a half times net asset value. Uh, the mid-tier companies, the Sandstorms, uh, a Cisco Royalties, uh, those will trade at a, slighter, a, a slight discount to that, more like uh, one and a half to two times net asset value, and maybe 15 to 20 times cash flow. Then you have a junior royalty space, which is uh, uh, companies like Metla, Abitibi Royalties. Uh, this group ge generally trades more on Blue Sky and on the future prospects of the portfolio, uh, more so than, uh, uh, than times uh, a cash flow or net asset multiple. And Ely Gold is at the, uh, just entering this, this uh, junior royalty space. And we've grown the portfolio to the point where we, when we're compared to our peers, in, uh, the, in the, this case, Metalla and Abbott Tibby Royalties, we compare, compare very favorably in the number of royalties, the number of producing royalties in our revenue stream, but yet we're trading still at, uh, at about uh, a fourth or fifth of their market caps. This uh, gives an idea of the breakdown of our revenue. Uh, again, uh, we're very active in our sale program. We'll sell 10 to 12 properties a year. Uh, so quite a bit of our revenue uh, each year comes uh, from transactions created during that year. So this, this slide shows that we'll do over a little over $3 million this year. Next year, we'll start with what we have on our books. Uh, about two and a half million, and with transactions during the year, we project to be about four million in revenue next year. Uh, the following year, we have some of our royalties uh, really kicking in and starting to produce. Uh, we also have accelerated payments coming on our uh, sale portfolio, uh, so we'll start with about four and a half million, and we're projecting about six million uh, in revenue in 2021. And you can see from this, the gray is the royalty revenue, the blue is the sale revenue, uh, and see that it's, uh, it's fairly well matched there, that we get uh, generate revenue about, about half and half from option uh, sale revenue and royalty revenue. Uh, this chart uh, shows really, uh, uh, again, mostly our stock down at the bottom when, and shows that uh, compared to some of the, the other royalty companies, beginning this year when our stock broke out, we traded along with the GDXJ for, uh, uh, for the last few years. But uh, as we started purchasing royalties, getting out and marketing the story, uh, we've started to trade much more like a, a royalty company than a, a junior exploration company. 
This uh, is a slide we're uh, very proud of. Our uh, <coughs> properties throughout Nevada, uh, we currently have over 70 projects in pl properties that are in play. Uh, the breakdown on that is 34 royalties, uh, 22 properties that are in the sale process, and uh, t about 25 properties that are available for sale. And as you can see from this slide, uh, if you can see it, it's, uh, we pretty much are doing business with all the major and mid-tier companies uh, that are operating in Nevada. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about uh, the four royalty purchases we've made this year. Uh, we, from a third party, picked up a three-quarter percent royalty on uh, the Isabella Pearl Mine that Gold Resource uh, began construction on last year. Uh, started producing this year. Uh, last month they declared commercial production. Uh, so that royalty ha stream has started for us. The uh, Lincoln Hill is a, a royalty we bought again from a third party. It's a 1% royalty on the uh, a deposit there that's at Coors Rochester Mine uh, where they're building a new leach pad and we are projecting uh, late 2022 early 2023 for revenue there. Uh, we also purchased a royalty on the Jarrett Canyon Mill. Uh, this is an asset owned by Eric Sprott, and that royalty increases with the price of gold. It uh, is, we get paid on a per ton basis on everything that goes through the mill. Uh, we, we were very attracted to this asset because that, uh, the mill there is now with the joint venture of Barrick and Newmont in Nevada. Uh, the Derrick Canyon Mill is the only roaster uh, outside of that partnership that can process the refractory ore that uh, is so common in Nevada. So what we, we purchased this, it's currently pay, uh, uh, paying us on a monthly basis, but those payments increase with the price of gold, uh, where it's almost at $2,000, $1,600 gold, the, the the payments go up 30% and then they go up another 75% at $2,000 gold. And we expect production, which it's the mill is rated at 4,000 tons a day, currently producing 2,500 tons a day, but uh, they, they are now taking in toll milling from other companies. So we expect that, to, uh, that royalty to just continue to increase. And the last one that we purchased this year uh, outside of Nevada was, is, uh, is on the Wallbridge Fenelon property. This has been a very exciting uh, package here, land package that Wallbridge has been exploring. Uh, they've also, uh, uh, oops, we lost our. Yeah, that's been happening all day. Okay. Um, anyway, I kind of know this story. The, um, the Wallbridge Fenelon, uh, that mine is, is, is built there. And, uh, and uh, uh, they're, they're now doing underground exploration. Uh, they announced some, uh, some results two weeks ago, 27 grams over 38 meters. They've applied for their permit there for four to 500 tons a day of production. And we expect, expect that to start uh, producing late next year. Talk a little bit more about our property generation. What we focus on in, in Nevada is uh, identifying properties that are at or near producing mines. Uh, this is very important for us in, in building the royalty portfolio. Our, most of our properties, because they are near producing mines, uh, they're being explored by the companies that are uh, producing at those mines, that are operating the mines, and for, to extend the mine life uh, and add reserves uh, and it can go into production much sooner. We don't have to wait for all the permitting and we don't have to have our property generate uh, a, a deposit big enough to, to build all the infrastructure of a mine because it's, uh, it's there and already built. So a few examples here at Gold Resource. I mentioned before that we had a three quarter percent uh, royalty on, uh, the, on the production there. But uh, when we got word that, that uh, well, we, we knew somebody was gonna buy that mine, so we had staked all the property around it. So all the exploration ground there, we sold to Gold Resource, and 
uh, and hold a 2.5% royalty. They're beginning to explore that mine to extend their, uh, that land to extend the mine life now. The, uh, <clears throat> we also sold them two satellite projects, Mina Gold and County Line, which are 10 miles away. Those they're starting to explore and uh, they are uh, past producing mines, so we know there's gold there. And they'll either drill those out and become uh, satellite mines and share infrastructure or they'll haul that ore the 10 miles over to Isabella Pearl. Fiori Gold's company that's here, their uh, key project now, they're producing at the Pan Mine and about 10 miles away is their Gold Rock project. We have two royalties there. Uh, McEwen Mining has uh, just completed in, in April declared commercial production at their Gold Bar facility in Nevada. Uh, we have three properties, uh, three separate properties there with royalties on and in, within their mine complex. Um, we have a property uh, in, the, in the complex at Turquoise Ridge. The, uh, 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 that's, that's part of the Newmont Barrick Joint Venture now. It's the highest producing mine in, uh, uh, <laughs> in Nevada. Uh, or excuse me, it's the highest grade producing mine in Nevada. The, uh, uh, a couple other ones that, uh, that aren't on the screen now at Premier Gold, uh, they have a, a joint venture with Barrick at uh, South Arturo. We have a claim package in the middle of their uh, land package there that with, uh, uh, with the royalty on it. And uh, they've started exploring that ground. Again, the, the key to the, all, of these, uh, uh, all of these assets is they do not need to, uh, any gold they find there is going to get processed, it, uh, whether it's 100,000 ounces or a million ounces. So our profile of our royalties, we, we're going to see royalties kicking in on, from the sale portfolio, these development royalties, uh, uh, over the next few years. Uh, Integra is another company that... Uh, uh, that we're involved with in Idaho. Uh, we had a state lease on some ground there at the old War Eagle mine that we uh, sold to them and retained a royalty. Uh, so, I'm, I can't go back here. Uh, just to sum up again, I think I, I, I mentioned already about this slide, about the properties that we have spread across Nevada. Uh, the the we're, we're able to locate and, uh, and, and stake these properties because our head geologist, my partner, Jerry Bachman, he's been doing this for over 35 years, staking properties and successfully built a royalty portfolio that uh, was sold to Frontier Gold and, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, purchased, Frontier was purchased by Newmont. Uh, to just mention one other thing about our our sale portfolio. Uh, to be clear, we're not we don't with our properties we don't do any joint ventures. We simply sell the projects, as as I mentioned, uh, generally over a four year time frame, uh, with escalating payments, uh, generates uh, you know continuing revenue for the company, and uh, and it's a it's a very scalable model. It, uh, we don't have any management time in these projects once they're sold, and every property we sell, we retain a royalty. Uh, I mentioned Jerry, uh, just, just to, uh, again, going back to the burn rate, uh, we operate very efficiently. Jerry and myself uh, are the only two full-time management employees. Uh, our chief, our CFO and uh, corporate secretary and QP are both part-time and operate our, uh, out of our Vancouver office, which, is, which we share with another company. We also have an office, uh, co our corporate office is in Reno. Uh, independent board members, Bill Sheriff, again a longtime Nevada prospector, and um, uh, Bill, Bill adds a lot to the, uh, uh, our search for properties and royalties. So just summing up, the upside for shareholders from this point, 
we, we feel we're very, still very undervalued compared to our peers and that every time we add another royalty and another, another sale to our portfolio, uh, we get a re-rating or get closer to being rated uh, more in line with our peers. We're, we're more aggressively growing our portfolio than, uh, than our peers too in, in, in that we are not only purchasing the royalties but generating them. And, uh, and important to, again to note that when we purchase a royalty, it's, something, it's one that's paying or near-term production and going to be paying and the exploration and development royalties we're generating out of the property portfolio. The, the royalty space in general is, is kind of seeing a renaissance as, as new investors are coming into the gold market and some old investors are looking at gold equities again. The royalty space is starting to be uh, more and more recognized as the best risk reward in gold equities. And of course, the last thing is the leverage to gold price is we, when gold prices go up, our revenues go up, all our revenue uh, projections uh, and the chart was based on $1,400 gold. And when, but when the price of gold goes up, the revenues go up, but our costs do not go up. And the last thing with that gold price is we're asked the question a lot of times of, well, with gold prices increasing, uh, are you running out of properties or are you, uh, you know, is it getting harder to find the royalties? And the, the, the answer is just the opposite. Uh, at, at the higher gold prices, some of the projects that uh, were maybe not economical at twelve to $1,300 gold are being dusted off and, and, and being considered for construction. And of course, we're out there now staking around these projects that we know at higher gold prices will get uh, developed. So that's it. Uh, that's, that's the presentation for Ely Gold. We uh, will be here for the rest of the afternoon. If, uh, if you want to stop by, we've got some printouts of this presentation. And of course, you can go to the website uh, and, and follow it. And also, if you stop by or you go to the... Uh, to the website and, and sign up. I do a, a podcast every six weeks with O&M Partners, so that's an opportunity to get updated. I generally do them in the morning so that European uh, investors can pick it up in the, in the evening. So, well, thank that, you very much, Rick. Sorry about that. Again, the technical problems all day. Three. Hopefully, this will be the last time. Six fifty-eight. Unfortunately, we were supposed to have uh, Galena Mining Limited, an Australian company, come and present, and it was Mr. Alexander Monier, the CEO. But our understanding is that uh, there was some personal uh, in this position that he had to uh, leave very in an urgency. So, unfortunately, but uh, we're going to continue with the last presentation. Blackstone Resources AG, and so we have the honor of, uh, of receiving Mr. Ulrich Ernest, the president and the CEO. Who's going to talk about Blackstone Resources, a very diversified um, company in the mining space with assets all over the world, and. Uh, um, all I'll ask you, Rick, is just not touch the, uh, the podium as much as possible. Because I think, yes, I do. It's right over here. Come up here. Point is this button over here. How to continue? And to advance. Advance is this one. Okay. Advance is this one, and the pointer is this one. All right. Great. Thanks. Good presentation. Mesdames et messieurs, moi, je suis suisse comme vous. Alors, de Zurich, naturellement. Je me de dire, c'est l'unique compagnie de Suisse. Vous avez vu des Canadiens et des autres compagnies comme ça, mais nous sommes Suisse. I will continue now in English. Welcome to my presentation. As I said before, this is a Swiss company. We are quoted at Swiss Stock Exchange uh, since last year, and we have quite a history already. 
I'm not selling you gold or silver or something like this. I'm selling you and presenting to you a vision. Vision investing in this kind of materials. We are like a portfolio. Portfolio manager, we like a fund. We, we do uh, investment in various situations which is all concerned with battery manufacturing or let's say investing in mines to lead, uh, to, to produce the metals in order to uh, uh, produce a battery after all. If you are interested, I go very shortly, very, very fast to the presentation. We can collect this kind of leaflet with all details at the end, when you move out, it's the last presentation. I hope for you it's the best. I hope for me it's the best. I will see. Anyway, you can have this, this uh, uh, catalog here. We have a short summary of a two-pager in English or in German. And this one you can collect if you like it. So thank you very much for attending my presentation here. Uh, what we have here is nobody talks about this one because it's the mining conference. We have a structural trend for the next 10 years here. We are in the middle of this trend. You don't realize it yet, uh, but it's here. Why? We're moving from the dirty areas, coal situation, burning fuels, burning gas, burning whatever, into a bright future, sustainable future, COT, a saving future. That means it's hopefully clean air sometimes when everybody realizes that it's important that we are there. What we do here, we show here the all car manufacturers, they realize how important is this trend. They have 87 new vehicles. All the, the yellow uh, uh, squares there are the new cars that are coming out between, between now and the next two or three years. 87 new electrical cars are coming out from all these suppliers. That means very clearly it's important, this trend. It's, we cannot hold it back. They will come. Here we see the car is a trend. Naturally, it's also about saving saving the wind energy here uh, in, the, in the battery situation. A lot of batteries are existing already in Switzerland already, also in California, whatever. It's all existing. This trend leads to a high demand of battery metals. Here we are back to the mining. Mining is uh, metal producing, is exploration, is producing, <coughs> is producing cash flow. We believe, very simple, that in the next 10 years we need 10 times as much metal as what we have today. That means we are in a shortage in very short time. That means also the prices are getting higher. We have different cycles of different metals. It's natural, it's normal. Cobalt is going up and down, nickel is going up and down. It's all what it is, but we are in this cycle area right now. Here just to show you where the batteries are produced for the time being and what is happening here. From today until 2021, have 11 fold the battery capacity rollout, mainly in China. The red, the, the one with the star is Chinese. Where is Germany? Nowhere. Where is France? Nowhere. So everything comes from, from uh, China right now. So what we have, what we approach is kind of portfolio here. At the right side, you find our investments here, cobalt, nickel, copper, manganese, battery technology, uh, all this nickel as well. At the left side is our cash cow, which belongs to our portfolio. We're producing gold in Peru. Now we're starting here. I touch, just touch a little bit what we have here. Uh, we have our lithium uh, brine uh, 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 licenses which we show here, the brine is the left side. The hard rock situation is something the, the Canadians like to do, which is not profitable for the time being. The Australians are doing it. Don't invest in these things. It's not possible, not profitable. It's going down or went down already 70%. The only profitable thing is the brine situation because the prices to produce is the lowest in the world. We heard it from Neolithium here. They confirmed it here. Very good company also, like ours. Anyway, we have here two exploration zones, which we own the land, we own the license. We produce, then in future, we get a 43101 in just one or two months. So we can really tell you afterwards, we communicate this, how much brine we have in these two concessions of ours. We intend to sell one of these for high price, hopefully to some of the users uh, for, for lithium. 
get some cash into the pocket in order to develop our other, other ventures. Um, now we're going to the next one, is our uh, investment in the first cobalt. We did first cobalt in Canada. Uh, first cobalt is very well known uh, so far. We see a couple of pictures. We got the participation because we delivered this refinery in exchange for shares and cash. That's why we have a participation in this refinery. And this refinery exactly sitting in the town Cobalt, which is there, um, uh, is now uh, going together with Glencore. Glencore has invested already $5 million uh, US dollars in this uh, refinery. They go to invest another $40 million. Uh, the next uh, couple of months in order to roll out 5,000 tons of pure cobalt concentrate from there. So they will sell it at the price, maybe uh, actual prices, it's about 150 to 200 million turnover for next year. Coming out all on this, and we are in, uh, uh, participated here. This picture shows how difficult it is to go from, from the cobalt into the battery. I'm not going into this further, we have no time unfortunately. Now we're going to our joint venture situation. At the left you see the nickel uh, mines. We are working in Indonesia. We have a joint venture with a nickel mine having about 100 billion tons of nickel ore. This nickel ore is presently 1.7%. It's not lower, it's very high grade nickel and it has also about 15 to 17% iron in there. We see some examples how the nickel is looking like. These are all piles up. Now we have just uh, achieved, or there was just a government stop of the, uh, exporting these things. We have about 500,000 tons there lying there, which we could export. We are very confident that next year uh, the, uh, the government grants us a license to export further this, uh, this uh, laterite nickel which we have there. Other ways that are possible, we can shift it to uh, internally to Indonesian uh, other companies and sell it there as well. So we will see what's bringing next year. If it's doing this, we will have uh, sales about uh, 60 million for next year. Uh, it's a cash cow for us, a minimum net profit of 6 million for next year. So we're all aiming for, uh, let's say, a cash for next year. For us, is cash, and let's say a cash flow is important for the, for the company. We have achieved cash flow in 2019 already, but now uh, it looks like that we, we double this figure from, uh, into the next year. So um, we have very good options here to, to, to go for. So this is myself there uh, before the manganese blocks, visible blocks in our Colombian operation. Uh, manganese can be black like what we see there on the right side, or it can be red or green. It's all manganese, just different formats. And we have about six million tons there, proven, uh, proven uh, reserves there. We can uh, start uh, taking it off. If we do so with an investment of three million, we can do a turnover of 36 million. Again, a profit three to four million net profit per year, if we decide to do so. These are the licenses. We're coming to our 25 licenses in Norway. We have a lot of possessions in Norway, uh, and it's uh, very famous for rare earths. Not everybody knows what rare earths is. Uh, these are all these uh, uh, metals here, which are used in mobiles, in cars, in batteries, whatever it is. So it's quite a large consumption. Uh, but again, the Chinese are dominating. Here we see 44 million tons in China, uh, Vietnam a bit, uh, Norway is not even on, on the map here for, for production. So we hold these licenses and call and hold it as reserves. Uh, we don't develop it ourselves here. We need partners for doing this. An investment of two, 300 million is needed for doing this. And if the time is right, we have to partner, we have the finances to do that. Until then, we hold it in the, in the ground in order to have another possibility for rare earths to uh, keep it alive here. Now we're coming to the uh, 
uh, refinery in uh, gold refinery in Peru. We started the pilot plant just a couple of months ago. It's uh, running with five to ten uh, tons a day for the time being. We're ramping up to 50 or 100 tons very shortly and hope to achieve a very good production level next year. Gives us also cash cow. We believe that we can do 20 to 50 million turnover next year. Gives us a lot of cash as well. So uh, adding all these ventures together, we will be in the range of 50, moderately saying 50 to 100 million for next year, with a net profit between 5 and 15 million. Uh, and the last one here, uh, we have seven legs. I'm trying to tell you we have seven legs of, uh, we have we're standing on. That's the technology leg we're standing on. We have a patent of making batteries. What is this? Uh, the Chinese are making the foil production with the batteries. They're putting foils together, various layers, and then they have a battery what they use for the cars and whatever appliance we need. We do the printing. We use the 3D printing. 3D printer is very well known, it's valid, uh, and it's working for the car industry already. And uh, we have the unique patent of multi-layer 3D printing. I show you the machine. That's the machine, a little bit small down here. That's what, what, what is existing already. This is a multi-layer 3D printing. All the details you can read in our booklets afterwards. It's too far to, to de explain you everything here. But that that's, is, is saving 70% capex, 70% material for the battery. That means at the end, we will be able to produce a cheaper battery and the kilowatt should be uh, around 80 to 100 US dollar uh, or Swiss francs a kilowatt. So if that is achieved, we are exactly there, which is interesting for the car industry to roll out the battery in big masses. That is needed. Tesla, for comparison, is between 200 and 230 as we speak today. So we have a little way to do, and uh, maybe also Tesla is developing a bit. Just uh, uh, Elon Musk declared two days ago they're going to make a battery manufacturer in Germany. We are in Germany, we have our own subsidiary there, we have our own patents there, we have our research team, which is the Fraunhofer Institute. We have a contract with them, they research for us to roll out this battery manufacturing in Germany. So that's the future, because we, we hear everything about the battery manufacturer. That's the future of the battery situation. This is a solid state battery. The batteries we use today has electrolytes in there. That means a liquid, and it's kind of dangerous. It can explode, it can burn. This battery has a bigger density, 50% bigger density than before. We have it tested. It's, it's working. It's workable. So uh, this is a solid-state battery, higher intensity, produced in our 3D plants, will save expenses. That's a, that's a vision we have. We must have a, a, a largely known battery which is working, which is produced cheaply then we have all this future and this vision be, to become true. That's where we are more or less here, lithium iron battery producing here today. That's where we go, the old, state, uh, old <laughs> all solid state battery basically. And that's the future. Now, outlook and summary, you find here on one graph here, of the whole situation of Blackstone where we are invested very simple chart with the important information. That's what you should keep in mind, the details you find before. So what I want to, to uh, show you here, nine good reasons why you should buy the Blackstone shares. That you are an investor. That, I think, is of, of your interest. OK, first of all, we invest in the right uh, materials. We invest in, in a handful, seven pillar, uh, uh, situation here, um, which are all being profitable, most probably next year. We must concentrate on various situations. We concentrate today on the gold refinery, which will be profitable and uh, providing cash flow next year. We uh, concentrate in nickel uh, uh, exports and nickel development for next year. And um, we wait what Glencore and uh, First Cobalt is doing. They will have a very nice turnover by the end of next year. 
And if you have more money to do, uh, we will invest in further specific situations, providing cash flow and turnover. That's what we want. We, want, we don't want to sit here and give a vision here and not produce something. We want to have results. We want to have cash flow. So we produced in 2019, the first half a year, 5.1 million Swiss francs net profit. We will have another 1 to 2 million more for this half a year. So the whole 2019, we have a net profit between 6 and 7 millions. If you go to the price earning ratio, we are here around 6 to 7 times or 14 cents to 16 cents per share. Today we have a price of one dollar, which is really battered down by the leaving shareholders. We have, uh, after the going public, we have about 20 shareholders, which are very old shareholders, invested uh, previously in the private equity situation for two or three Swiss francs. Everything which was higher than this, they sold it, they capitalized, they took the gains. Now I think these 20 shareholders are out. And it's a fantastic opportunity to buy the shares today. Buy it on the market. In Swiss Stock Exchange, Zurich 6 is very well known. And the BLS, Blackstone Resources, buy a couple of hundred thousand shares. We will have a, a great future. I think, personally, the price is right with three francs, maybe five francs. We will see, depending on what we deliver. What we do here for the asset management, the asset managers, we provide here some, some deals. Uh, it's a convertible placement, 5 to 10 million, uh, 4.25 convertible series, uh, interest payment for five years can be uh, changed or converted into Blackstone shares with a discount of 10% anytime after 2021, generally 2021. So this is something which we highly recommend to you. If you have an interest, give me a phone, give me a call. Uh, uh, we uh, can give you the term sheet for that, and it's something for your investors. Or on the other side, you buy it on the market. The left side, you buy it on the market, is one franc right now. Hopefully it goes up very fast to two or three francs. We will see. Uh, how much is, uh, interest is here from, from the people of investors under these circumstances, or when you uh, like to buy one million, pa one million uh, shares, basically, come to me, we have a placement of shares directly with the company, we provide this, and this opportunity is open for the next two weeks. So please have a look what you would like to do, how you would like to invest, let me know. Um, uh, you find me in the homepage, or is, uh, see it is in this booklet if you get it afterwards, or in a two-page summary, which is also in English. Everything is available. So I really say, invest in Blackstone shares. It's a good buy. You have a great up to upside. Very highly recommendable. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes uh, this afternoon's session. It actually concludes the Swiss Mining Investment Forum of November 2019. I hope everybody found it informative and uh, enjoyed this Friday afternoon. So with that, c'est fini. So bonne continuation, au revoir, and see you hopefully next year. Merci beaucoup. Merci les garçons à la technique.